click the bell icon to turn on notifications. We've made the accompanying exercise files for this tutorial available for free. Just click the link below in the video details to get these. Hi there, welcome to Excel 2019. My name is Cindy and I'm going to be your instructor and help walk you through this series of videos. I want to take a few moments and let you know a little bit about myself and what to expect as you walk through this course. I've actually been teaching Excel for quite a number of years now, over 15, and I teach everything from the basics all the way to advanced features. So hopefully we'll be able to get a lot of this information over to you quickly so that you can get started working on some of your projects. If you're brand new to Excel, make sure you watch these in order. If you try to watch them out of order, it may not make much sense to you. And go ahead and watch them again and again if you need to. I want you to have the concepts down before you move on to the next video. If you've been using Excel for a while, hopefully you'll get some tips, tricks, easier ways to do things. Well, let's go ahead and get started and we're gonna go into section two and talk about what's new in Excel 2019. Hey there, welcome back. We are still in module one where I'm giving you an overview or an intro to Excel. I wanna go ahead in section two here and just talk real quick about what's new in Excel 2019. There's some changes you'll wanna be aware of, especially if you've worked in older versions. The basics always work the same, but let's jump right in and I'll show you some of the new features. Let's start with one of the newest features in Excel, and that has to do with selecting. Now, selecting has always been around, but there's a little twist to it now. Before, if we wanted to select a range, we would go ahead and do that. We'd hold control and maybe get another range. We could click over here, we can click over here, wherever we want. But if we wanted to, for example, deselect this one, we'd have to click away from it and then start all over again. What they've done now is you have the ability to deselect some of the cells you've already selected without having to start over. So let's say again I just select this and I hold control and come over here and maybe I get this and maybe over here. And now I say I really don't want these selected. As long as I'm holding control I can click and drag through those and they are gone and the other cells are still selected. That's a really helpful little feature. The next feature I want to talk about is the new accessibility checker. For people who maybe can't see very well or disabled, sometimes they can't see when there are little things that might be wrong in their spreadsheet and Excel will try to help them out by letting them know where some of those things are and what to do about them. Let me show you how the accessibility checker works. For those people that are disabled or possibly visually impaired, sometimes if there are weird things going on in your screen, you may not be able to see it very well. Excel has this feature called the Accessibility Checker, which will help look for those things for you and then give you a real quick, one-click way to go ahead and fix those things. One of the things that you'll see in a moment is if you look at this word months, this is actually in a combination of cells A and B, they've merged them together. And someone that's visually impaired may not notice that right away. Let's go ahead and look at the Accessibility Checker. You will find that under the Review tab and then right here it says check accessibility. It'll pop up on the right hand side and it's found a couple of things. Let's click on the first one and you'll see it sees those merged cells we mentioned and it tells me which cells they're in. Now I could come over here and actually fix it, but notice that I can actually click the down arrow and then I can go ahead and unmerge it right from here. So that's one thing I can do. Now I would have to go back at this point and actually move it over here if I want it to look right. Now Excel also found something else. Notice it says default sheet names. It doesn't like the fact that sheet one is named sheet one. For someone who's visually impaired, they might not be able to read that very well because it's small. We can go down and rename this and I can do it right here and I can call it my sales report. And that way it'd be much easier for someone to actually see what's on that particular sheet. And that's how the accessibility checker works. Another feature that's new to Excel 2019 is the translate feature. The translate feature enables you to take selected text and translate it to a different language. 
whichever cell or range of cells I have selected, Excel will go ahead and translate it into another language for me. Let's say I'd like to know what the word months looks like in Spanish. As long as I have that cell selected, I can go up to the Review tab, choose the Translate option, and you'll see the translator appear on the right. The very first time you do this, it will take a minute to load the translator, but then after that, it pops up just like this. Now here's the word months I have selected, and down here I can pick the language I'd like to see months translated into. So you can see that if I wanted Spanish, for example, I can choose it right there. You can also do it in reverse. If you happen to have Spanish text out here somewhere, see how I can flip this and it tells me this word is the Spanish word and this is the English word. And that's pretty cool when you want to work with translations and see what words look like in another language. Another new feature that Excel has is a new function called concat. We used to have one called concatenate, and that would actually merge two cells together in the same cell, and that is still there, but it's going away. So I want to show you how this works because it'll be the same with a couple of additional new features. We used to have a feature called concatenate, and what concatenate would do was take two cells, like maybe Sarah Kling here, and merge them together in the same cell. There are times when you want to do that. Keep in mind, if you're going to sort and filter, you do want to keep these in separate columns, but let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to right click on column D and insert a new column there so that we can put our merge cells in. Now I'm going to start with the equal sign because I am writing a formula. I'm going to put CON, and that brings up all the functions that have CON in them. Now here's the old one, concatenate right here. You can see it has a yellow, what we call a yield sign. That means that that particular function is getting ready to go away soon. This new concat has actually replaced it. What I'm going to do is double click on concat to stick it in there. And the first thing it wants to know is what's the first piece of text I want to merge. That would be Sarah. I'm going to put my comma and then it wants to know what the second piece of text is, and that would be Kling in this case. And that's all I want. I'll go ahead and hit the Enter key, and there's Sarah Kling. It's merged those two pieces of information together. Now you'll notice there's no space in there. In order to get the space, I just double clicked so that we can edit our formula. You want to click after that comma and before the C, because you're going to add an open quote, a comma, a space, a close quote, and then a comma. That tells Excel there's another piece of data in there and the space in there is what I'm looking for. I'll go ahead and hit the Enter key and now you can see it's got the space. I can copy this down and have all of these. Now let me go ahead and delete this. The concat function also has an additional thing that it will do. Let's say that you want to take all of these, for example, and merge those into one cell. All we'd have to do is come over here and start with our equal sign. We'll put our concat in again. And now what we'll do is select all of these and hit the Enter key. And now you'll see that it's actually put those all in one cell. Now there's no way you can go back and put the spaces in unless you manually do it. But you'll see this goes on and on and on forever, especially if you had a long list like this. So that's what the concat feature will do for you. Those are just a few of the new features that are in Excel 2019. As we go through this series of videos, I'm going to point out some of the other new features and we'll see how to use those as well. Let's go ahead now and jump into Section 3 where I can give you a course overview and that way you know what to expect as you go through this course. Hey, this is Cindy. I just wanted to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be covering throughout this set of videos. We're going to start at the very beginning. I'm not going to assume you know anything. We're going to go over the screen itself, get you familiar with terminology, what are some of those pieces and parts, how those buttons work, and then we'll jump right in and start creating what we call an Excel workbook. Sometimes people will call these Excel sheets, and they're really not sheets because the sheets are actually in the workbook. The file itself is called the workbook. That's the terminology we're going to be using. We're going to go all the way through. I'm going to show you how to set up a workbook from scratch. We're going to talk about how to work with those different sheets. We'll go through all the formatting options. How do you print those borders? We're going to go all the way through and create some formulas as well. 
A formula is basically a mathematical calculation that you can have Excel do, and that's the beauty of working with any kind of spreadsheet or workbook is being able to do those mathematical calculations. Let's go ahead and just jump right in. I'm going to go ahead and start by giving you an overview of the Excel window first so you'll know exactly what we're doing as we move forward. Let's move over into Section 4. Welcome back. We are working in Module 1, and in this module, we are getting an introduction to Excel. We're all the way down to Section 4 now, where I want to give you an overview of the Excel window. It's going to be very helpful for you, especially when you get started, if you know where to look for things and some different terminology that we're going to use in a lot of these videos. Let's go ahead and flip over to Excel, and I will show you how to get started. Let's go ahead and start at the top left of your screen and we'll work our way down. The first thing I want to point out is this whole line right here, which is what we call the Quick Access Toolbar. We're kind of getting away from the term toolbar, but you'll notice that we have one left here in Microsoft Excel and it has a few of the common options that you're going to use on a regular basis. Get really familiar with the very first one, that left arrow, that is your undo. If you make a mistake, you're going to be able to undo that mistake. You have an arrow to the right of it, which if you click on it, will give you a drop-down list of all the things you've done. If you wanted to click at any point on that list, you could undo everything from that point up at the same time. There's also a redo. That's the arrow that points to the right. Redo allows you to bring back, one at a time, those things that you have undone. A couple of other ones just to be aware of. This one is your Save button. If you happen to be working in this file and you just want to hit the Save button, you can do that at any point. Also, there's a quick print option right there, which will allow you to just print your file. You'll notice there's a down arrow to the right, and this lets you customize your Quick Access Toolbar, because you may have some buttons here that I don't have and vice versa. You can see that if you click on one, it adds it here, or if you uncheck it, then it takes it away. One that I want you to add is the email button. If you happen to use Outlook for your email, you will love this little feature because what it allows you to do is go ahead and create a message right from here and attach this file. And we'll talk more about that in a later module. The next thing I want to point out is the fact that this whole bar all the way across is what we call your title bar. You'll notice that currently it says Book 1, and it lets me know I'm working in Excel. Book 1 is the name of a blank workbook. When you're working in Excel and you first turn it on or you click New, you're working in what we call a blank workbook. Sometimes people call Excel files worksheets. They're not worksheets, they're workbooks with sheets inside of them. You're going to see at the bottom of your screen a sheet one, that's the actual worksheet. And by clicking the plus sign, I can add as many worksheets as I would like at the bottom. But the file itself is called a workbook. Once you decide to save this file, you will give it your own name and it'll be reflected right here in the title bar. Now over on the right, you do have your minimize, restore, and close that will let you make the window smaller. Or if you wanted to close it, you'd be able to do that as well. The next thing I want to point out across the top are your tabs. You can see that you're currently on the Home tab because it looks white, but notice you can click any of these tabs to go ahead and see what's called the ribbon below it. When I click on Home, for example, this whole line across is called the ribbon. And on each ribbon you will find groups of buttons. This is called the clipboard grouping. Each group name is right here at the bottom. Most groups, not all, have a little arrow on the bottom right. You'll notice that each group has different options. You just click the buttons to get to the options, but what if there's an option here that falls under that group name and you don't see it here? That's when you click the arrow to get to those additional choices. You'll find that once you're in what we call a dialog box, you can go ahead and close it with the X at the top. If you click the File tab, that'll take you into what we call the Backstage View. We're going to look at this over in Section 6, but I just wanted to show you that if you happen to click there, hit the left arrow, and that'll take you back. Underneath your ribbon, 
you're going to see what we call the work area. This is where you're going to actually type your text or your numbers or your formulas. You're going to see that your work area is divided into columns which go up and down. Your columns are labeled with a letter at the top. You have 16,384 columns available to use. That's quite a few columns, so you're not going to run out of space there. Now your rows that go across, notice they're labeled with a number over on the left like this. You've got 1,048,576 rows. You are really not going to run out of room, I promise. And that's all on this first sheet, sheet one. If you add multiple sheets with this plus sign like I mentioned, each sheet will have the 16,384 columns, the 1,048,576 rows. The way each sheet is set up, you'll notice that the intersection of a column and a row is what we call a cell. And when you click there, that cell will have a green line around it. We call that your active cell. That's how you know which one you're going to be typing in. You'll notice that each cell here has a name. We refer to that name as a cell address. A cell's address will be the column you're clicked in and the row you're clicked in. For example, this one here would be C3. And you'll need to reference that when you start writing formulas, so get really familiar with that. You'll notice on the bottom right-hand corner of your active cell is a little box. We call that your fill handle. Your fill handle will do a couple of different things. It's going to let you copy whatever's in that cell, and it's also going to give you a list of some predefined items. And we'll go over some of these in a later section as well. Like I mentioned, each cell has a name. That name will be reflected right here in the name box. You can see when I click over here, this is D2, and it says D2 in this name box. And this name box does more than just tell you the name of the cell you're clicked in. You're going to see later that you can actually select groups of cells, which are called ranges, and give them names. The X will allow you to cancel your entry. The check mark will allow you to accept your entry. And then we're going to talk about functions later on in a later module. And that's where you're going to go when you want to start writing some of your formulas. Whatever's in your cell you're clicked on shows up in the formula bar up here. Your cells can hold three things. They can hold text, numbers, or formulas. And a formula is a mathematical calculation you write to get an answer. You're going to notice on the right hand side of your screen that you have a scroll bar so that if you need to scroll up and down you can. And you also have one at the very bottom of your screen in case you need to scroll left to right for some reason. You also have three buttons at the very bottom that are your views. And your views are just different ways to look at your file. You want to stay in your normal view most of the time, but you're also going to be using page layout from time to time and you're also going to use what we call the page break preview from time to time. I'm going back to normal, and the last thing I want to point out is your zoom at the very bottom right. You can zoom in to make this a little bit larger, or zoom back out to make it a little bit smaller, and that's just a view, that's all that is. Well, that's a quick overview of how the screen itself works. What I'd like to do now is take a few moments over in Section 5 and talk to you a little bit about how the mouse works because you're going to find that whatever the mouse looks like, it will do different things. Let's go ahead and move over to Section 5. We're still in Module 1 and we're all the way down now to Section 5. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the different features that the mouse has. It's going to be important in any program you work in to recognize the different ways the mouse changes what it looks like, but especially in Excel. Let's go ahead and flip over and I'll show you the four different ways your mouse will look in Excel. There are four different ways your mouse will look when you're working in Excel and let's start with this one. When you see a white cross like you see here, you're going to use that when you're trying to select one or more cells. If I click in any cell, that's called selecting a cell. That means that's the active cell now, the one you'll actually be typing in. If I need to select multiple cells, I'm going to place that white cross right in the middle of that cell and drag straight down or across, and that's called selecting a range. We'll talk about ranges a little bit later, but ranges are basically a group of adjacent cells. If you click away from those, you will deselect your range. 
The next thing your mouse will look like is these black crosshairs that you see right here. Now I got that by pointing to the little box in the bottom right hand corner of that active cell. This is called the fill handle. The fill handle actually will do two different things in your computer. The first thing is there are some lists that are pre-built in Excel. Those lists are days of the week, months of the year. If I type any day of the week in this cell, let's say I put Friday in here, and I drag this down, you'll see it will continue the list for me. I can also go to the right or left and it will do the same thing. I'm going to go ahead and delete those. If you have something in a cell that's not part of one of those predefined lists, and this could be numbers, text, anything, it will actually copy whatever's in that cell. Let's say I put the number 32 in there and I drag straight down. Notice it just copies 32. The reason it doesn't count is it doesn't know in what sequence you want to count. And we will talk about how to make it do that a little bit later. But for now, just know that the fill handle will copy whatever's in that cell. This is going to be one of your best friends in Excel. There will be times when you write formulas that you'll want to copy that formula and this will just do that for you. The next thing you'll notice is that if I point my mouse around the edges of my active cell, I get this white arrow with a little cross behind it. That's going to allow me to pick up whatever's in this cell. Let's say I had that 32 in there again. Notice I can just point around the edges and I can drag this information where I'd like it to be and just drop it off and it will move that information to that new cell. Those are the different ways that your mouse will actually work in Excel. What I'd like you to do is pay particular attention as we go along to this and you'll see that this will make life a lot easier for you in a lot of different situations. Let's go ahead now and move over to section six and I want to talk to you a little bit about how that backstage view works. I will see you in just a few minutes. All right, we're still in module one and I want to go ahead and wrap up this particular module with section six and talk to you a little bit about the backstage view. The backstage view is an area that you can go into where you've got a lot of different options like if you wanted to save this file or if you want to create a new one or even if you wanted to go and change some of the options in Excel you'd be able to do those things in the backstage view. Let's flip over to Excel and I will show you how to get to the backstage view and all the options. When you're looking at the tabs across the top, you'll notice the very first one says File. By clicking on File, that's going to take you into what we call the Backstage View. In the Backstage View, you'll notice it automatically defaults to the Open option. This is where you would go if you wanted to open an existing file. You will be able to look through these different places here or browse your computer for that particular file. You would see any workbooks you've already created here. You could actually double click and open one if you'd like or you can look through the folders and find a file that way. Back up above open is the new option. If you wanted to create a brand new workbook, you could come in here and choose the blank workbook, or you'd be able to look at some of the templates that are in Excel, and you'll see there are a lot of different calendars and budgets and different things like that. They're great ways to start, and that way you don't have to set the whole thing up from scratch. They're templates you can use by typing over the information there. You have some save options that we'll be talking about over in Module 3. You have the ability to print. You can actually share this file with some other people if you'd like. You can export this, you can publish this, or you can close this file. If you close the file, you're not closing Excel, just this particular file that you're working on. There's also some other options at the bottom, and I want you to notice the one that says Options, because that's where you're going to be able to go to change a lot of the options that are in Excel, and we'll be doing a lot of that in a later module. But right now, I just want you to know that if you click the File tab at the top, this throws you into what they call the Backstage View. To get out of it, just hit this arrow that points to the left, and you're back in your workbook. Well, that's going to wrap up Module 1, and that's giving you a quick lay of the land here. What I'd like to do is actually go ahead and get you started on creating some new workbooks. Let's go ahead and move over to Module 2, and we'll get started. Welcome to Module 2, and we're talking in Module 2 about how to create your workbooks specifically from scratch. 
I want to go ahead and in this particular section, which is section one, talk to you about how to type in text and numbers and get the basic layout of your spreadsheet ready to go. And that way you'll know how to set something up from scratch. Let's go ahead and flip over to Excel and I will show you how to get started. One of the things that people often say to me is I don't know how to actually get started with a new blank workbook. And it's really pretty simple. What you want to do is decide if you want column headings at the top. A column heading would just indicate what type of data is below that particular column. You can also have row headings. That means if you put something here, for example, it would tell you what's in the row across. You can have a combination of column headings and or row headings or just one or the other. That's totally up to you. It doesn't really matter which row you start on. You do have some area above row one that's called your header area. So don't feel like you have to start down in row three so you have some extra space there. I'm just going to start on row one. Your cells will actually hold three separate items. They will hold text, they will hold numbers, and they'll hold what we call formulas. And a formula is basically a mathematical calculation that tells Excel what to do to give you an answer. You can do super simple math, like if you want to add some numbers, or if you want to do some sophisticated analysis, things like that, you could do that as well. But let's start really easy and put in some column headings. I'd like my first column to say the word months, and because I'd now like to type in B1, I'm just going to hit the tab key on my keyboard, and you'll see tab always moves you to the right. Enter always moves you down. This column, I'm going to put in the word sales. Column C, I'll put in the word expenses, and in column D, I'll put in the word totals. You'll notice that after totals, I didn't hit any key on the keyboard. That's why you see my insertion point blinking there. And I want to show you that if you hit this little check mark, that's just another way to accept the entry. Let's say underneath the word months, I want to put some actual months of the year. I want to put January, February, and March, and we'll use the abbreviations. I'll just put in Jan. And if you remember back in Module 1, I talked to you a little bit about the fill handle. That's the little box on the bottom right-hand corner of your active cell. Remember, if you get the black crosshairs like this, that's called the fill handle, and you can hold your mouse and drag down until you want to stop. I want to stop when it says March out to the side, and you can see it's filled it in now. Let's say in A6, I want to put the word totals. You'll notice that when you type text in, the text lines up to the left side of each of the cells you've typed it in. That's where it lines up by default. You can change that, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Right now, I want to put some numbers in underneath my sales and expenses. I'll say that January's sales were 150. Then I'll say that February is 175, and we'll just say it was 225 for March. I'm going to click over in C2 and put the expenses in. I'm going to say it was 125, 150, and we'll say 210 here for March. And you can see I just hit the Enter key to go down in that particular case. You'll notice the numbers are considered generic. There's no dollar sign, no point zero zero, none of that. You're going to have to tell Excel what your numbers actually represent. And we'll get to that, but for now, just know that these are the numbers we're putting in. Now let's say I've got the word totals here, and I have the word totals here. And what I really meant to do up here was put in the word profits. Now I could hit delete on my keyboard to get rid of that, but I really don't have to. I can type the word profits right over it, and when I enter, I've got new text. Just be really careful that you're typing in the cell you mean to, because you can type over your text accidentally. The next thing I'd like to do is go ahead and add up these sales. So why don't we go ahead and flip over to Module 2, and I will show you how to write some super basic formulas in Excel. Now that we know how to actually set up our spreadsheet from scratch, we've actually typed in some numbers and some text. I want to show you how to go ahead and create some super basic formulas. A formula is a mathematical calculation you use to actually add up numbers or any kind of math you want to do with the numbers you've got. Let me go ahead and flip over to Excel and we're going to keep going with our spreadsheet and we'll add up those sales and those expenses. A couple things just to know about formulas. Formulas can be on the same sheet as the data 
in a few minutes we'll add up our sales and just put the answer right down here but you may have the data on this first sheet and want to put your answers over on another sheet you can certainly do that you can also put your formulas in a totally different file and we'll be doing some of that a little bit later as we go along so formulas can be on the same sheet as the data on a separate sheet or in a separate file the thing to remember is wherever you click the mouse that's where your formula is going to show up if I click right here that's where it's going to be if I click over here that's where it's going to be there are a couple of keys on the keyboard that you'll want to be aware of before we start working because these are going to help you when you're writing your formulas I'm gonna go ahead and pop up a picture of my keyboard so you can see it and I'll point to some of the keys for you first of all if you have a numeric keypad on the right like you see here you're gonna see this plus sign which is for addition the minus sign here is for subtraction you've got this little star which is your multiplication and this slash is division so they're all right together if you don't have your numeric keypad on the right you can find these same buttons right up here here's your plus you've got your subtraction your multiplication and then you're going to see your division is right down here you also need to be aware of these open and close parentheses above the nine and the zero we'll be using those and we're also going to be using the caret symbol which is above your six right here so just be aware of those when you're working because you're going to be using those to actually do the math the other thing is you'll notice there's an equal sign right here all formulas must start with an equal sign no exceptions if you don't have the equal sign it will not do the math for you all right let's go ahead and write some formulas I'm going to leave that up for a few minutes and I'm going to click over here in B6 I'd like to add my sales and I want the answer to be in B6 that's why I'm going to start there remember I told you that all formulas start with an equal sign you must type that in now what we're going to do is basically add the cells that we'd like to actually have Excel add for us now I could type in 150 plus 175 plus 225 and I would get the right answer the problem is that if I change the numbers in these cells the answer will update instead of actually typing the numbers you're going to use the cell addresses the first one the 150 is in B3 notice I can type it but I'm just gonna click here and that way it inserts it in the cell for me now I'm gonna type my plus sign because I have another one I'd like to add to this I'm gonna click in B3 and then I'm gonna hit plus again and then I'll click in B4 and that's all I have that I'm going to be adding if you happen to have a plus sign at the end like this then you're going to get an error message I'm going to hit the enter key because I'm finished with this formula and here's the little error message I just mentioned it basically says there was a typo I had that plus sign at the end and it thinks this would be the formula I do want it is so I'll just say yes and you'll notice now that it has moved me down to the cell below where I was and I have my answer back up in B6 now I'm gonna click back in B6 and let's go look at this formula I'm just gonna double click in it to get back into it and you can see it took out that plus sign at the end for me if you've written formulas a little differently then that's okay just kind of bear with us because we're building from the ground up so you'll know why you do what you do think about this too if you've got a thousand numbers you want to add do you want to go plus B2 plus B3 all the way to a thousand probably not so we'll learn some other ways to write formulas using what we call functions or words to tell it what to do for now I'm going to hit the enter key so that I have my answer there I can do the same thing over in column C I'll just start with the equal sign I'll click in C2 hit the plus sign on my keyboard C3 hit the plus sign on my keyboard and then C4 and once I'm finished I'm going to hit the enter key and you can see I've got the answer of 485 something I want you to be aware of 485 is not what's in that cell that's the result the formula that you see right up here is what's actually in the cell same thing over here you can see there's a formula in that particular cell let's say that I wanted to figure out my profits over here for January basically to do that I'm going to take my sales minus my expenses all formulas have to start with an equal sign 
I'm going to click on my sales for January and subtract my expenses and just hit the enter key and you can see that the answer is 25. I can go down the list and do the same thing with each one of these. I can take my February sales minus my expenses. I can hit the enter key and I have 25 and then I'll do one more. We'll say in this case that we take our sales for March and subtract our expenses for March and in this case we get 15. And if I wanted to figure out the answer down here, I can write the formula the same way I wrote it there. I'll go ahead and put my equal sign in. I'll add D2 plus D3 plus D4. And then I'll go ahead and hit the Enter key, and I have 65. That's going to be a quick way to go ahead and write some super basic formulas here so that you can add and subtract some really basic numbers. We're going to go ahead and go now over into Section 3, and I want to talk to you a little bit in Section 3 about what we call relative references. Hey, welcome back. We're in Module 2, and this is Section 3, Relative References. We just got through creating some super basic formulas, and one of the things I want to show you is that the formulas are the exact same when you look at the columns across, and they're the exact same when you look at the rows down. And I want to give you an idea of what a relative reference is and how you would make use of that when you're writing your formulas. Let's go ahead and take out the profits for February and March real quick. And I want to take out the totals for columns C and D as well. We'll put them back in. Now let's go ahead and look at our cell B6 and examine that formula. I'm going to double click in the middle of it so we can see it again. And if you notice, we're adding B2, B3, and B4. Now we don't have a total here in column C. I can type it, we've already figured out we can write it by hand, but I'd like to use the fill handle to copy this. Remember that the fill handle is on the bottom right hand corner of the active cell, and one of the things it will do is copy whatever's in the cell. And we've already determined that a formula is there, not 550. I'm going to drag all the way across to column D, and you'll see there it just gives me all of my totals. I could drag this as far as I needed to all the way across. It's a quick way, if you already have the first formula in, to go ahead and copy that formula to the other columns across. I can do the same thing up here if I want to go up and down. I can drag the fill handle and go down to row 4 in this case, and now I've got my answers filled in. Now let's talk about relative reference. Remember in this one, the formula was B2 plus B3 plus B4. If I go to column C, the formula is C2, C3, C4, and the same thing over with column D. What is the only difference in these three formulas? The column, that's it. Excel knows that when you copy a formula across like we did using the fill handle, to go ahead and change the column so that the answer is correct. If we look at the rows up here, let's look at D2 real quick, that formula said B2 minus C2. Well, the one below it's the exact same, it's just the row is different. See how it references row 3? And the one below it would reference row 4? Again, that's the relative reference. There will be times when you don't want Excel to do that, and we'll learn later how to create what's called an absolute reference. So just keep in mind that the relative reference is when the Excel changes the column or row to make sure the formula is correct so you get the correct answers. Let's go ahead and move over into Section 4, and I'm going to talk to you real quick about the order of operations. Hi, welcome back. We're in Module 2 and we are now down to Section 4 where I wanted to talk to you about the order of operations in math. And if you think back to middle school, maybe around 6th grade or so, our teacher taught us the order of operations in math, but most of us don't remember it. And now that we have to use it, well, we're going to have to relearn it. So let's go ahead and flip over to Excel and I'll show you what the order of operations actually is. 
Math of any kind will always follow the order of operations. Excel will look through your formula, and if it sees anything in parentheses like you see here, it will do what's in parentheses first. There's no exceptions to that. Then it will look for any exponents, and that would be if you had 4 to the second power, for example. Then it will look for any multiplication or division, and then addition or subtraction. I want to go ahead and give you a good example of why you need to write your formulas keeping this in mind because if you don't write them correctly your answers will be wrong and you won't even know it. I want to come over here to cell A8 and I'm going to go ahead and put in here April projections. What I'd like to do is predict what my April sales are going to be and also what my April expenses are going to be. There are a lot of ways to do this, but let's say that we want to take our first month and our last month and just divide by two. That's all we want to do. I'm going to go ahead and put my equal sign in here. I'm going to have it add my first month plus my last month, which in this case happens to be B2 plus B4. And then whatever that answer is, I want to divide it by two. And that's all I want to do. I'm going to hit the Enter key and see what we get. Now if you notice we got 262.5 and we can look at this very easily and tell that answer is not correct. But if you're working with a long list of numbers, it's not always that easy to eyeball it. Let's go ahead and examine what Excel did and we'll see why we got that incorrect answer. I'm going to double click and open the formula back up. My first question is, do you see any parentheses in this formula? No. Do you see any exponents? No. Do you see any multiplication? No. Do you see any division? Yes. The first thing Excel did was this part right here. It took B4, which is 225, and divided it by 2. The only thing left to do was add B2. I didn't want to do that. What I wanted to do was add B2 and B4 together to get an answer and divide that answer by 2. So if you notice what I've done is just enclose that B2 plus B4 in parentheses so that it would do that first. And now if I enter, notice I get a totally different answer. When I go back and look at this now, if I said, are there any parentheses? You can see there are, and it's going to add my first and last month together, get an answer, and divide it by 2. Let me go ahead and just do the expenses again just to show you one more time. I'm going to start with equals. I know that I want to add my first month and my last month together first, so I'll go ahead and close that in parentheses, and then I'm going to divide the whole thing by 2. And you can see in this case it's 167.5. Now I could practice one more, but I'm going to go ahead and use the fill handle and copy that across, and now you can see I have all of my answers. That gives you a quick overview of the order of operations in math. Remember that's probably the most important thing about formulas. Always think about, is it going to automatically do what I want first? If not, enclose it in parentheses. And by the way, if you see a formula that has multiple sets of parentheses, it's always going to work from left to right. It'll add whatever's in the first set, then it'll do whatever's in the second set all the way across. You can also have parentheses inside of parentheses, which would look something like this. That's called nested functions when you have something like that. It's going to do the inner ones first and then go back and do the outer ones all the way across. And you can have up to 10 levels of those. We'll see some of those as we move along as well. But that's your order of operations. Now that you know what that is, let's go ahead and finish up module two and move over to section five where I'm going to talk to you about working with ranges. We've made it all the way down to the end of Module 2 now. This has been the module about creating workbooks. This is Section 5, and I want to talk to you in this particular section about working with ranges. You're going to do a lot of different things with ranges. And a range is basically a group of adjacent cells that you might want to change the color in. It could be that you want to make them all dollars. It could be that you want to use ranges in your formulas. Let me go ahead and flip over to Excel and I'm going to show you how ranges work. Let me show you what a range looks like if you had it selected. This right here would be a range. 
It is a group of adjacent cells. You can do a lot of different things with a range. It could be that all of the numbers I have selected here, I'd like to maybe make these dollars, for example. It could be I'd like to center them. It could be I want to cut and move them somewhere else. There's a zillion different things you can do with a range. You'll notice that if you have a range and you hit the Enter key, you stay in the range. The white cell is just your active cell. You can also use the Tab key to go to the right instead of going up and down. What you want to avoid if you're trying to work with a range is don't use the arrow keys on your keyboard because notice it deselects the range or if you just happen to click your mouse somewhere that would deselect your range as well. Let me show you how to select a range. You're going to find the starting cell, put your mouse right in the middle of it, you want to make sure you have that white cross, and hold your mouse down and click and drag. Just make sure you let up at the ending cell. Now sometimes when you do that, especially if you have a lot of cells you're trying to select, you might be holding the mouse down and accidentally go way down the page or way up the page and it may not get you exactly what you want. So here's another way to select a range. Click in the cell you'd like to start with, hold the shift key on your keyboard, and click inside the cell you'd like to end with. That's a good way to always get exactly what you want. Now when you start writing formulas, you're going to have to use these ranges. If you saw this one written as an example, this would be cell B2 through C4. So it would look like this. It would say B2 colon and then C4. That's the range you would be working with in this particular case. You'd be maybe adding these up, for example. Let me go back and select that same range real quick. What if I asked you to quickly tell me what these numbers add up to be? You might be able to quickly add this in your head, but here's what I want to show you. When you start working with formulas and using ranges in formulas, you're going to have to have a word in front of this B2 colon C4 to tell it what to do, because right now it knows the range, but it doesn't know what to do with the range. If you have a range selected, and remember that can even be two cells as long as they're adjacent to each other, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, it tells me the sum equals 1,035. I don't know if you can see that down there or not. But that's an example of a function or a word that we're going to use in our formulas later to tell it what to do. If I wanted to right click on this word sum here, you're going to see there are six what they consider to be the most common. And I could click on any of these to turn them on or off. So if I frequently wanted to see any of them, I could have them show up down here at the bottom just as a quick look. Now notice if I deselect, you don't see that down there at all. Well, that's going to go ahead and wrap up our section on working with ranges. Let's go ahead now and move over into Module 3 because we need to talk about saving this work. We've done a lot to it and I'd hate to lose it. So let's go ahead and go over to Module 3 and talk about saving. For the next section, you'll want to download the course exercise files. Click the link below in the video description to get these. You can also scroll through the details to find timestamps for each section in this course. If you're enjoying this training, please leave us a comment. Now that we've completed Module 2, Creating Workbooks, I've got a quick exercise I'm going to have you do, and it's going to end up looking like this. I'll have the steps actually in a Word doc so that you can actually go through the steps one at a time. The first thing I'm going to have you do is start with a new blank workbook. Then I'm going to have you set it up this way, where you have the month sales expenses across the top this way in row 1 and column A is going to have the first few months of the year. I want you to plug in these same numbers. Now the only numbers I want you to plug in are these because these numbers, these, and these are formulas. What you'll end up doing over in D2 is you'll end up creating a formula that takes your sales minus your expenses to give you the profit. And then you can copy that formula down using your fill handle. Down on row 6, we're going to be creating a formula that adds all of your sales and then one for your expenses and your profits. 
And in row eight, you're going to figure out April's projected numbers using the order of operations that we talked about in section four. When you're done with that, just make sure you know how to select ranges. You can just practice with a few of them. And I'll put a few in there that you can use to practice with in your Word doc. And that's all I want you to do. Don't close it because we're going to use the same file over in module three, and then you'll be saving it there. Good luck. We're working our way down and we're all the way now on module three, which is where we're going to talk about saving your workbooks. Once you create that new file, you're going to want to go ahead and save it so that you don't lose any of that information. We also wrote some formulas and we really don't want to lose those. After we save our work, we can always hit the save button whenever we want to go ahead and update that and save all of our work. Let's go ahead and save that particular file we've been working on so that we can find it next time we want to use it. Anywhere in the computer that you're working on a file that you'd like to save, you're going to see there are two options. There's going to be a save and a save as. The very first time you're saving the file, it's going to take you to the Save As window so that you can name the file and also tell, in this case Excel, where you'd like to save that file. If I'd already saved it once and I make any changes to that file, I'll want to hit the Save option frequently to update my work. If I forget to do that and I go to Close Excel, it will ask me would I like to save my changes. Make sure you say yes because the first time you say no, you'll wish you had done that. Now my first clue that this has not been saved is notice the name of the file is book one. Chances are if I had saved it, I would have given it some name that would help me remember what's in this particular file. You'll notice that when you're looking at your toolbar here, you do have a save button right here, but you could also go through your file tab which takes you into the backstage view and you'll be able to save here and you'll have different formats you can save your file in as well. You'll notice on this list here's your save and your save as. I'm going to choose the save as option in this case. The first thing you'll notice is that it will show you any recent folders that you have been working in or any files and you'll see them listed here. This is our first one so we don't see anything listed here. The next choice we get is to save this to OneDrive. Now let me tell you what this is. You might have noticed that everything is going out to the cloud now and that basically means that instead of saving your work on a hard drive or somewhere on your computer or a flash drive, people are opting to save those out in the cloud, out on the internet somewhere so they can pull them up whenever they have access to the internet. Microsoft has something called OneDrive. It's free. You just sign up for it. You get a username and password and that way you can save your files there and if you go on vacation somewhere around the world you can log into the internet and then be able to pull up your files. It's just Microsoft's version is all it is. If you've ever used Google Docs it's very similar. It's just Microsoft's version. It's called OneDrive. You can choose to save this to your PC which we're going to do. You could add a place, which has to do with adding a network, but let's talk about browse for a moment. This is where you're going to save most things. You're going to use the browse option. Browse allows you to look in your computer and find a place you'd like to save your file. If you decide, for example, that you'd like to save it in documents, then you can go ahead and give it a name. Now you'll want to leave that .xlsx that you see there. I'm going to call this one my sales report. And as long as I know where I've saved it, then I'll be able to look for it and find it very easily the next time. I'm going to hit save. And now you'll see that my title bar has changed to reflect my sales report. Remember, if I make any change to this, even just a space, Excel is going to ask me if I'd like to save it when I go to close it. So make sure that you actually do that. Now, after I've already made some changes to this. If I wanted to hit the save button up here frequently, I can certainly do that or go back to file and choose save that way. Either way is going to work fine. It doesn't ask you a thing. It just automatically saves your work for you. Let me go back to file for a moment 
and I want you to notice that you're going to have some other options when you're saving. You're going to be able to go down and actually share this. You're going to be able to export this. And I want to talk to you about some of those options, but we're going to do it over in the second part of this particular section, which is where we talk about file extensions and some other things you can do when you're saving your files. All right, let's go ahead and wrap up module three. We've been talking about saving our workbooks in this module. This is section two where I want to get into a couple things. I want to talk to you about file extensions, how to share, export, and also publish your files. We already talked about saving your file. If I hit the file tab, that'll take me into the backstage view. And I went down to save as, and I want to go ahead and browse, and I'll browse in documents because that's where we just were. And here's the file that we just saved, my sales report. Notice at the end of it, it has an extension, .xlsx. This tells the computer this is a Microsoft Excel file, and to open it in any program that's compatible with Excel. I want you to notice that you do have other types that you can save your file as, and you may need these from time to time. For example, you might need the one that says CSV, comma delimited. Just so you'll know what this is, if you've ever seen a file that just looks like a line of text and it says name, comma, and then it says address, comma, and then the data is underneath and it's set up that way. That's what they call a CSV file. Uh, sometimes when you export data, you'll need to save it in that format in order to be able to import it into other programs. Another one that you'll want to be familiar with is a PDF. If you ever want to save this file so that no one can actually make changes to it, you can save it in a PDF format. Now let me go ahead and close this because I want to show you that if you look over here, you've also got the option to share this. I can actually share this with other people that might be on my particular SharePoint server. If the SharePoint server has been set up at your company, then there are other people that might be working on the same file and you can go ahead and share this with them and give them permission to do different things with the file. I can also email this directly to someone if I'd like. I can export this. Notice here again is the PDF option that I mentioned a few moments ago. You can actually create your PDF over here. You'll end up with the Excel file and the PDF file, both with the same name. I can also change the file type if I'd like. And this goes back to some of those we saw in the drop-down list just a few moments ago, like that CSV file that we mentioned. And the last one is to publish this. Microsoft has this feature called Power BI, and basically what that is, is it's a place where end users can go in and create their own reports, they can create dashboards, and they don't need to rely on the IT department to help them set all this stuff up. So if you want to collaborate on a meeting, for example, this would give you some interactive visualizations, and it's got some self-service business capabilities and things like that in there so that you can set it up all by yourself and maybe have a meeting with someone on the other side of the world. It's pretty cool how that works. It's called Power BI. Well, that's going to wrap up Module 3 where we've been talking about saving and some of these other options that you can do with your file. Why don't we go ahead now and move over into Module 4 and we're going to talk in this module a lot about working with larger workbooks and how we can search the file for different things and just basically manage a really large workbook. I will see you over in Module 4. Module 3 was all about saving workbooks. What I'd like you to do is make sure that you still have your exercise open from Module 2 and then we're going to go ahead and save this. Just go to your file tab and come down and do a save as. Make sure when you save it that you create a folder on your desktop and then I want you to give it a name. Call it My Sales Report. You also want to make sure that you have the correct file extension. It should be .xlsx. Go ahead and look over some of the other options we talked about. We talked about sharing a little bit. We talked about the export and publish options. And just make sure you're familiar with those so that when you need to use them, you know where to go to find them. 
Once you're done, let's go ahead and head over to Module 4 and we'll talk about navigating workbooks. Welcome back. We have made it all the way down now to Module 4 and in this particular module I want to talk to you about navigating through your different workbooks. You'll need to know how to open files and when you get them open how do you work with some of those larger files and some other options I want to go through with you. This is Section 1 and in this particular section I want to go ahead and talk to you about how to open your files in Excel. And if you're familiar with opening files in other programs it's going to be very similar. Let's go ahead and flip over to Excel and talk about opening a file. We're currently working in the file called My Sales Report that we actually created. You do not have to close one file to open another. You can open as many files as you want at the same time and flip back and forth. However, I do suggest that if you are finished with one that you go ahead and close it just so you don't have all these files open. Here's how you're going to open a new file. If you go to the File tab at the top, that's going to throw you into the Backstage view, and you'll notice the third option down says Open. If you remember when we were saving a file, we talked about all these different places that you could save a file, and opening is really the opposite of saving. You're going to tell Excel where to look and then which file you'd like to open. Over here, you're going to see a list of all the files that you've recently opened, if you wanted to open one of these again, you just double click on it here from this list. I wanted to show you also the little pen that you see over here to the right. If you want to actually pin this to the list, you can just click the little pen and notice it moved it up under these pinned options and those are files that will kind of stay at the top of the list for you for easy reference. Those would be ones you'd use often. But In this case, let's go ahead and browse. And I'd like to look in Libraries and in this folder called Documents where I have this Excel folder. And I'm going to open that up and I'll see all the files that are in that folder. I want to go ahead and open a particular file called Loan Workbook. You can either click once and then get onto the bottom and hit Open right here, or you can double click on the file to open it. Now I'm going to go ahead and zoom in down at the bottom so that we can see this a little bit better. This is a file that actually will tell you a little bit of information about the loan that you have created. You can see the monthly payment is $400.40 and over here you've got the principal, the interest rate, and the term in months. Any of these can be changed. If you notice over in F4 where the monthly payment is, there is a formula there that basically says if I change any of these three numbers, go ahead and change my monthly payment. What if I want to borrow $20,000 instead of eighteen? dollars and then let's say the interest rate was 5.7%. You can see how each time I made a change that it affected my monthly payment. If I look at the bottom of this file, there are a couple of sheets here. We're on a sheet called Terms of Loan. Anytime you'd like to flip to a second sheet, you just click the Sheet tab at the bottom, and now you'll see this one breaks out every month of the loan, principal, interest, all the way across. Now let me zoom in on this one a little bit as well. It's kind of small there. You can see here is your beginning balance. Here's the interest, the principal, and the remaining balance on this particular loan. What I wanted you to notice in this exercise is that this 20,000 is the same number, if I flip back to the terms of loan, that we had put in right here. Now someone could have typed that on each sheet and it would be correct. What they did is they went to the detail sheet for the five-year loan and they put a formula right here. And in this particular case, if I double click and open it up, you can see that this formula basically says have this cell match the cell D3 on the sheet called Terms of Loan. And I want to show you how they did that because it's really fairly easy. Anytime you want a cell to match another cell, this is all you have to do. Remember wherever you click, that's where the answer is going to be and I want to hit the equal sign because I'm writing a formula. I want this cell to equal on the sheet terms of loan and notice as soon as I clicked there it put that in your formula for you and then I want it to equal D3. Notice that's in the formula. That's all you do. Hit the enter key and that's done and now they're linked. Let me try that one more time and show you how that works. I'm just going to delete this. I'm going to start with the equal sign 
I'm going to flip to the terms of loan because that's the sheet that has the cell on it I want to equal. And then I'm going to click in the cell that I want it to equal, which is D3. And that's it. I'm going to hit the Enter key on the keyboard. That takes me back to the cell I was originally clicked in. And if I double click there, there's that formula that has the name of the sheet and the name of the cell. When you're looking at a formula and you see an exclamation point like you see in this one, that just tells Excel to change from a sheet tab to a cell. That's all that is. I want to go ahead now and show you a little bit about how to work with some of these larger files like you see here. Why don't we go ahead and flip over to Section 2 and we'll talk a little bit about working with larger files. Welcome back. We are working in Module 4 and this is the module where I'm talking to you a little bit about how to navigate through your different workbooks. This is Section 2 and I want to talk to you in this section a little bit about how to work with the larger files that you have. A lot of your files will be pretty small and you'll be able to find what you're looking for pretty quickly, but you will have some that have lots and lots of data in them and you need to know how to navigate and find different things you might be looking for in that particular file. Let's go ahead and flip over to Excel and I'll show you how to work with those larger files. You'll notice in this exercise that I can't see all of the information on the initial screen. I need a way to actually go up and down and see the rest of the information. The easiest way to do this is to use the scroll bar that's on the right hand side of your screen. All you have to do is click on it and then you'll be able to scroll up or down to see the data that you couldn't see initially. Some of you may have a wheel on your mouse and if you do use that wheel and just scroll it up or down that way. If you want to scroll left or right, you have a scroll bar at the bottom here and that's going to let you go left or right and see data you couldn't see in the opposite direction there. The next way you're going to be able to move around is to use some of the keys on your keyboard that will take you to the top or bottom of your data. I want you to look for the home key and the end key. Look over in your numeric keypad. If you look at the number 7, you'll see home underneath. And if you look at the number one, you'll see end underneath. If you're going to use those, you want to turn off the number lock so they become the home and end buttons. Other than that, they mean the number one and the number seven. If you notice, I'm actually at the top of my screen already. I'm in A1, so I'd like to go to the bottom of this little table of data. If I hold down Control on my keyboard and hit the end key, notice I'll go to the bottom of that table of data there. Control end always takes you to the end and control home always takes you to the top. If you use the home and end key without the control key, home isn't going to take you anywhere because it means the beginning of the line you're clicked on. End will take you to the end of the line you're clicked on. So just know that you have those keys available if you want to actually use those. Another way to navigate is to actually type in the name box right here, the name of the cell that you'd like to go to. Now obviously you'd have to know that, but let's say I type in here column IV and I want to go to row 65,536. And I'm going to hit the enter key and now look where it's taken me, all the way down here. I'd like now to go back to the very top, so all I have to do here is type in A1 and hit the enter key and now I'm back to the very top. Anywhere you happen to be down in your workbook, if you want to go to the top again, you just hit A1 and hit the enter key and then you'll be back at the top there. Some other things you can do to search throughout your workbook is under your home tab right here, if you go all the way to the end, you're going to see an option that says find and select. This is going to allow you to find certain words or maybe some numbers that might be in your workbook that you just can't seem to find if you scroll. Let's say I'm looking for the number 60. I'm going to choose find from this drop down. I'm going to make sure I have the number 60 in here and I'm going to choose find next. You'll notice it found the number 60 for me right there. If that's not the instance I'm looking for, I'm just going to hit find next again and it will go find the next one. It's always based on where your mouse is clicked. If it can't find an exact match for you, it will let you know and give you a little message saying that it can't find anything. Now I want you to notice there's also some options here. If you want to look specifically within the whole workbook, for example, instead of just the sheet you're on, you could change that. 
It could be that you want to search by rows or columns, or you can have it look in formulas, values, or comments. Values is basically the number that results from the formula, and we haven't talked about comments yet, but you have the ability to actually make a comment that shows up on each particular cell here. The other thing is, if you're searching for 60 and it doesn't find it, but yet you happen to see it with your own eyes, try checking this box, Match Entire Cell Contents, and see if that helps you find it a little bit easier. You also have a Replace tab here. That would let you type in specific text or some numbers if you wanted, and then replace it with something else that you specify here, and you would just hit Find Next and then find the particular instance you want, or you can say replace all of them or just replace them one at a time. I'm going to go ahead and hit close here and go back up to the top. That's pretty much how you're going to work with your larger files. Let's go ahead now and talk about some of the options that you have when you're working with these larger files, like the freeze panes option, for example. If you wanted to have these headings stay at the top so that you could scroll anywhere you want down in this file and still see the headings, you could use freeze panes. I will see you over in section three shortly. We are still working in module four, and this is section three, and this section is called freeze panes. There is an option in Excel that will let you freeze columns or rows so that you can keep those on the screen and then scroll down or across wherever you'd like and still see the headings on the columns at the top or if you have row headings on the left, you can see them that way too. Let me show you how the freeze panes option works in Excel. You'll notice in this exercise, if I scroll down, then what happens is I don't see my headings anymore. So if I asked you which column was the interest paid, you really wouldn't know unless you scroll back up and you could see. We have the ability to actually freeze rows one through seven so they stay on the screen all the time. And then I can take rows eight and down below and scroll up anywhere I need to be. Here's how the freeze panes option works. I'm going to click in A8. Now the reason I'm clicking here is because when you turn on the freeze panes option, it's going to freeze any rows that are above where you clicked. And since I want one through seven to click, I'm gonna click in eight. It's also going to freeze any columns to the left in case you were trying to scroll left or right. We don't need that in this particular case, so we'll just click in A8 and just freeze rows one through seven. All you have to do is go to the tab at the top that says view, and you'll see an option here that says freeze panes. Now when you click on it, you might get this drop down list. All you want is the top option because if you notice this one is just freezing the top row, but we want rows one through seven. And this one is just freezing the first column. So if you just click here, it's rows above and columns to the left that freeze. Now you should see a little small faint line under row seven right there. That tells you what's above it is frozen. Notice now I can scroll with my mouse anywhere I'd like, up or down, and rows one through seven stay right there so I can see my headings. Isn't that cool? Now this line is not gonna print, just so you'll know. If you want to take the freeze panes option off, you don't have to be clicked anywhere special. You just go back to freeze panes, and now it says unfreeze panes. Now let's try it where we freeze both up and down and left to right. Let's say I click in C8. That means it's going to freeze 1 through 7 and also A and B. Now let's go back up and turn on the freeze panes option again. I'm going to choose freeze panes and now you'll see that same gray line under row 7 all the way across but also you'll see it to the right of column B there. Notice I can go up and down so I know what my column headings are but if I needed to go left to right I could also go across and notice A and B stay. See that? So you can pretty much freeze this and see any two parts of the screen that you'd like and then scroll wherever. That's a quick way to freeze panes. Let me go ahead and turn that off. We'll unfreeze these. And the next little option I want to talk to you about is called the split screen option. Let's go ahead and flip over to section four and I'll show you how the split screen option works. We've been working in module four where we've been talking a lot about navigating through your different workbooks and we've looked at a couple of options like the freeze panes we saw over in section three. Let's go ahead and look now at the option called split screen. 
What split screen basically does is allows you to see something in one part of your file and then something in another part that you normally wouldn't be able to see without scrolling back and forth. Let me go ahead and show you how to use the split screen option. This example is a great exercise because let's say I want to do something like this. Row 9 happens to be the first month of my loan. And if you notice, this cell right here shows the interest I paid, which is $95. I'd like to see how much interest I paid the last month of the loan, so I'll just scroll down. And it's down in row 68, and it's $1.81. But now I can't see the first month of my loan. I've got to scroll back up to see that. Well, if I split the screen, it will allow me to see both at the same time. I'm going to start by clicking in cell A8 because I'm going to put the splitter right above row 8 here. All I have to do is go up here where it says split. Notice I'm still on the view tab. I'm going to click on split and now you'll see your splitter. It looks like this gray line right here. Now notice that I can put my mouse on the splitter and move it up or down. That splitter can just be wherever you want it to be. But what I really want you to pay attention to is the fact that you now have two sets of scroll bars. I've got a scroll bar above my splitter and I've got a scroll bar below the splitter. So I can really be in any two sections I'd like at the same time. I'm going to scroll down a little bit so I can see the last month of my loan and voila, look, here's month one and here's month 60 in this particular case. If you want to turn the splitter off, you can do one of two things. You can either go up and hit split again or you can drag the splitter to the top of the screen. That'll turn it off as well. Now let's say I started by clicking in C8. This is going to put the splitter above row 8, but also to the left of column C. Let me go back up and hit split again. And now you can see the splitter is up and down right here and then across this way. So this means I can do something very similar. I can look at row 1 and scroll down on the second part and look at row 68 in this case, which is month 60. I can also go left to right. If there's some reason that I don't want to see maybe the first couple of columns there, I can scroll to the right like this and notice that column A and B stayed right where they were. So really you've got a lot of flexibility as far as looking at any two areas of the screen that you would like when you're working in Excel. All I have to do to turn these off is just go back and hit split up at the top and we are good to go. Just make a note that if you save your file with the splitter on or with the freeze panes option on, it will stay that way so that when you open the file the next time, you're ready to go. That's really all I want to tell you about navigating through your workbooks. This is going to wrap up module four. Why don't we go ahead and go over to module five where we're going to talk about a lot of the page setup and the print options. Now that you've gone through module four and you learned how to navigate your workbooks, let's go ahead and just make sure you're okay with actually navigating through workbooks on your own. I want you to start off by opening a file called Loan Workbook. And once you get it open, I want you to just pay attention to the fact that you have two sheets at the bottom. You have a sheet called Terms of Loan and also one called the Detail Sheet for the five-year loan. The sheet Terms of Loan is where you're going to be able to list your principal amount, your interest rate, and your term in months, and that will change the monthly payment if you change any of this. Over on the detail sheet for the five-year loan, what we're looking at here is each month of the loan in a list broken out by beginning principal balance, you've got the interest paid, the principal paid, and the remaining principal amount. Once you've looked through this, I want you to take a few minutes and navigate. Navigate all the way to the bottom of this. The last column and last row that information is in is an F70. And then you can navigate back to the top. Just get really familiar with navigating, whether you use a scroll bar, whether you use your keyboard. It doesn't really matter as long as you know how to get around. Once you've done that, what we want to do is make this cell right here, which is C9, equal on the sheet terms of loan, whatever's in D3. You're going to have to write a formula to do that. Remember that the formula starts on the detail sheet right here in C9 because that's where you want the answer to appear. You're going to write a formula that links C9 back to terms of loan D3. 
If you forget how to do that, go back and watch section 2 again. That's where we had written the formula to link these two sheets. Once you're finished with that, go back to the detail sheet for the five-year loan. And I want you to freeze rows 1 through 7 at the top so that you can scroll down and see all the months of your loan without your headers disappearing. You can go ahead and take the freeze off once you've done that. Then I want you to go ahead and click in cell A8 and put your split option on. Remember the split option is the one that will allow you to see two parts of your screen at once. I want you to be able to see the first month of your loan, which is row 9, and the last month of your loan at the same time on your screen. Once you've been able to do that, you can go ahead and take the split off. And then if you want to close the file, feel free to do so. That's going to wrap up Module 4, Navigating Workbooks. Once you're done, go ahead and move over to Module 5, and we're going to talk about the page setup and the print options in Excel. We are now in Module 5, and in this particular module, we're going to talk a lot about what we call the page setup and print options. There are a lot of options that you're going to want to do with your page. For example, you might want a header and footer. Those actually appear in the margin areas of your workbook. You're also going to want to maybe make some comments, maybe go ahead and print this out and you want it to fit on the page and look nice, and that's all the stuff we're going to talk about in this particular module. This is section one, and we're going to go ahead and get started with what we call headers and footers. You're going to see that headers appear in the top margin of your worksheet. Footers appear in the bottom margin of your worksheet. You can put things in your header or footer like dates, if you want to put file names, maybe your name, anything you want you can put in there. You can't tell right now if you have a header or footer set up because you can't see the margins. If you go down to the bottom where your views are, the middle view is called page layout. And if you click on page layout, then you can actually see what the entire page is going to look like when you actually print it. You can now see that there is a header set up here, and if you look at the bottom of the page, there's a footer set up here as well. And typically what Excel will do is it will actually pull the file name and put it in the center of the header, and it will pull the actual page number and put it in the center of the footer. You can change any of this that you want. You can go in and type whatever you want on the left section, the center section, or the right section. And the same thing down with your footer. Something to note, when you type something in a header or footer, it's going to be on every page. You'll notice this is page one, and it's got the name of the file there, and if I scroll down, I'll see page one in the footer. And if I look at page two, it's got the exact same header, and it'll have the same footer, except the page number will change, and that's because there's a little coding that you can set up to have it do that. If you had a third, fourth, or fifth page, and you add those, then you would have the same exact thing. Now, there's a different way to go in and look at these headers or footers, and I'm going to flip back to the normal view for a moment. That's the first view at the bottom. And one thing you'll notice is when you've been into that page layout view and you come out, you'll see a page break right here. That's just automatic. If you go up to your Insert tab and go all the way to the right, you're going to see right over here it says Header and Footer. Now when you click on it, at first it looks like you're back in the same view. But what I want you to notice is that you now have some options for your header and footer right here that you didn't have just clicking on the page layout view. Notice you're in a contextual tab, and that's a tab that appears only when you need it. And in this case, it's header and footer tools. Notice if I click down in the page, I don't have that tab anymore. But if I click back in the header or footer, it'll pop back up. So don't think it's gone if you happen to be clicked in the middle of the page and it's gone. There are some things here I want to point out to you. First thing I want to point out is that you have some options up here to put in page numbers, the number of pages, the date, the time, file name. You can kind of see all those options right there. Let's put in a few things in our header. Let's go ahead and take out this center section. We'll just delete it totally. And then let's put over here the actual current date. You can type a date, which is fine, and that means it will always have that date. But if you use this one here where it says current date, that means that today it will have today's date, tomorrow the file will have that date, the next date will have that date. So it's a way of changing the date and always keeping it in sync with whatever day it happens to be. 
Now I put a little space in there and I also want to put in the current time. And you can see it's just some encoding that tells it what to do here. Now I'm going to hit the tab key to go to the center and I'll hit tab once more. I could just click over there if I wanted to. Let's say over here that what we want to do is go ahead and put in our name. Now let's go down and look and notice if the second page has that same information and you can see that it does right here. Now let's talk about the footer a little bit. I'll click down here where it says page one. I can certainly leave that there, but let me go back up and pull up the header and footer tools again. And I want you to notice that I can go ahead and say page one, and if I want to, I can put a space and say of, and then have it put in the number of pages. And that way it'll say page one of one or page one of two, however many pages there happens to be. I'm going to go ahead and click over here and look at it. And now you'll see it, it says page one of two and page two says page two of two. All right, let me go ahead and click back in the header footer again and pull up my header and footer tools. Let's go all the way back to the left where it says header right here. These are just some pre-designed headers that I could pick from if I really didn't want to customize this myself. Let's say, for example, that I wanted to put over here the name of the file and also the page number. So you can see what it did right there is the file name and the page number. It overwrote what I manually typed in. Now the other thing you can do is in the footer section you can do the same thing. You can have something like prepared by the date and the page number. Now if you notice now it's got prepared by and then it's got the date and it's also got the page number here and that's going to be the same on page two. Remember, if you type it, then it's going to be on every page like that. If you actually go in and use some of the coding for page numbers and time and so forth, then it will update those page numbers and the time. Notice I can also put a picture in here if I wanted to. And I can also navigate a little bit. If I don't want to click on the footer, I can say go to footer and it will actually take me to the footer of the page. Now one thing that you're going to find when you go to print multiple pages, some people think that it's not professional for page one to say page one on the bottom. So you can actually take that off. You'll see right here it says different first page. And all that does is when you check the box, page one is not going to have a header or footer, but all the other pages will. See how page two has the header and the footer? Let me go back. The other thing is you can have different odd and even. If you want all the odd pages to say the same thing and all the even pages to say the same thing, you can set that up as well. And you can also align your page margins with the actual margins of the page if you wanted to do that. So there's a lot of different things you can do with headers and footers here. If you want to get out of it, you just go ahead and click inside your spreadsheet somewhere and then go back to the bottom to the first button, which is normal. And then that's how you work with your headers and footers. Let's go ahead now and go over into section two and we'll talk about print titles and how those work. Welcome back. We're working in module five and this particular module we're looking at all the page setup and the print options that are in Excel. We've already gone through headers and footers in section one. Now we're in section two where I want to talk to you a little bit about print titles. You're going to have spreadsheets you want to print that have multiple pages. The first page may have the titles of your column headings, but then your other pages don't have any headings. You can actually set Excel up so that those headings print on every page. Let me show you how to set up your print titles. When we look at this exercise, you'll notice that rows four through seven actually have your column headings at the top. But if you look at the second page, you're going to see there are no column headings. Let me go back down to the page layout view for just a moment so you can see what I'm talking about. Here's page one with our column headings. But notice page two does not have any. So if you printed this out, you really wouldn't know which each of the columns represented. I want to show you how to get it to print those four rows at the top of every page that prints out. Let me go back to the normal view. And let's go ahead and go over to the tab that says page layout. Now we're going to be talking about all these different options here in this module, but right now I want to go over to where it says print titles. 
what you want to do is where it says rows to repeat at top you want to click there and then come back in your spreadsheet here and select rows 4, 5, 6, and 7. You're going to do that by clicking on the actual row heading itself over here and you can see that it put that right here for you. Let's go ahead and print preview from here and see what it looks like. Now this is taking us into the print option that we're going to talk about later, but I want you to notice here's page 1 with the headings. And to see page 2, you'll go all the way down to the bottom where you see the arrow that says next page, and then here's page 2. See the headings? And if you added additional pages, they would just have the headings automatically. To get out of this, I'm going to go back and hit the back arrow there, and that takes me back into my normal view. You can also print columns on every page. If you had a really long document from left to right that we're going to print, and the way you would do that is you'd go back to print titles. But this time you would say columns to repeat at left, and then you would select those columns that you wanted to be on every page that prints out. But more likely you're going to use the rows to repeat option. That's really all there is to working with your print titles. Let's go ahead now and go over into Section 3, and we will talk about working with comments. We are working our way down through Module 5. We've talked about headers and footers already. We've talked about working with print titles. Now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about working with the comment feature that Excel has. You have the ability to click on any cell and actually put a comment in and it's not going to be part of the actual spreadsheet that prints out, it's just going to be a comment that you can see on the screen. I want to go ahead and show you how to set some of those up, and then if you want to print those out, you could do that as well. You can have a comment on any cell that you'd like. All you have to do is select that cell and then insert your comment. Let's say that this is the interest paid and this is month 11 on the loan, and we'd like to make a comment at this particular cell that says, to ask the bank about a reduction in the interest rate. All I have to do is right click and you'll see insert comment on the list. Now you'll notice that I can type anything I want in here and it has the name of the person who is logged into the computer. If you don't want that there you can always just delete it. But I'm going to go ahead and put in here see about a rate reduction. And I'll say this may change the rest of the interest paid cells. Now if I click away from the comment, you're going to see that the comment disappears, but there's a red indicator in the top right corner of that cell. If I just move the mouse over it, I don't even have to click, you'll see that particular comment appears. When I move away from it, it disappears. If I want to edit that comment, I'm going to select that same cell, right click and then you'll see it says edit comment and that will take me back in so I can make some changes. The other thing while I'm in here is you'll notice that you've got these squares around the edges. If you need to put your mouse on one of these and make the comment box a little bit bigger or you need to make it smaller or change the size of it in some way, you can certainly do that just by dragging those different what we call sizing handles. I can also right click on that cell and actually delete the comment if I don't want it anymore. Now let's go ahead and go up to our tabs across the top and I want to click on the tab that says review. These are where the comment options are going this way and there's your edit comment. We've seen how to do that. Here's a way to delete. But let's talk about these two real quick. You have the ability, if you've got multiple comments, to actually just move from one comment to another just by hitting the Next or Previous buttons. You can also show or hide your comments. And you can see when I click on that, then the comment appears and it stays there instead of moving away when I click away from the cell. I can also show all the comments, so if I have multiple comments, I would just see them all over the page here. A couple things that you're going to want to do. You may want to actually print these comments and I want to show you how to actually do that. If you go back to the page layout tab and we were talking about the page setup options earlier, notice that if you go right here to this little arrow, 
that this is going to take us into page setup and earlier we were in here under the sheet tab what I want to show you is under that same tab you have this comments option right here and it currently says none if I choose the down arrow I can choose to put these at the end of the sheet or my other option was as displayed on sheet let me show you what end of sheet looks like and I'll print preview and what you're going to see is that if you go down to the last page you actually have a third page now. See how there's three pages? And what it does is on that last page, it tells you the cell number and then it just shows you what the comment says. Now let me go back and I'm going to show you the other option. I'm back under the page layout tab, page setup. I'm going to hit the arrow on the right there, go over to the sheet tab. This time instead of at the end of the sheet, I'll say as displayed on sheet and then print preview that. And now if you go down and look, you'll see where the comment happens to be, that's where you're going to see it. And it's going to actually print just like this. Now let me hit the back button and show you one more thing. You'll notice that you can't see the numbers that are underneath this. All you have to do is click in there, and instead of using the sizing handles this time, get just on the border of your object there and just drag it somewhere off to the side. And that way you can see all the numbers that were underneath and it does have this arrow that points to the cell that that particular comment refers to. That's going to be how your comments work. That's a pretty nice feature that Excel has where you can make comments about individual cells. Let's go ahead now and go over to section 4 and we're going to look at all those different page setup options and get you familiar with them. We are working our way down through Module 5 where we've been talking about all the page setup and print options that Excel has. We've talked now about headers and footers a little bit. We've talked about your print titles, your comments, but there are so many other page setup options there that I just want to take a few moments and look through some of those and get you familiar with what's there so you'll know where to go if you want to do some of these different things. Let's go ahead and head over to Excel and let's look through those page setup options. You want to make sure you're on the page layout tab and then we're going to be looking at all of these options here. Let's start with margins. Here are some pre-designed margins that you can pick from and you can see that every page has six margins. There is a top, bottom, left and right, and header and footer. Notice your header and footer margins are always less than your top and bottom. If they were more, they would actually appear in the printed part of your page and you don't want that. If you don't like any of these that they have pre-set up for you, all you have to do is come to the very bottom where it says custom margins and click there and that'll take you into this page setup that we ran earlier. Now remember the way to get directly here, you can actually go here to where it says page setup with the little arrow and it'll take you into this one. Here's where you can change your top, bottom, left, and right margins again. And something else that will be of interest to you is this center on page option. If you have a small spreadsheet you're working with and you print it out, it's always going to print in the top left. To make it a little bit nicer, you can center it on the page horizontally. And sometimes you may want to center something both horizontally and vertically. You can just choose both or none. I'm going to go ahead and click OK and that's how the margins option works. The next one I want to show you is orientation. When you print as you would normally think of printing something, that's what we call portrait. If you turn the paper sideways, that's what we call landscape, and sometimes you need that when you have a lot of columns left to right that you want to get on a page. The next thing is where it says size. You can always change the paper size. Normally you have 8.5 by 11 inch piece of paper, but then there's legal and there's envelopes and you can see these other sizes that you might want to use. The next one is called the print area. If you have a certain area that you're going to want to be printing and you don't want it to print the rest of it, you can set the print area. And basically what would happen here is you would go through and actually select just by dragging down like this the area that you think you might want to print and then that's how you would set the print area. You can also go back and clear the print area and then that way when you get ready to print you'll be able to tell it that you want to print a page or something specific that way. 
Breaks is where you're going to put in page breaks or remove page breaks. Now normally what Excel will do is it knows how much will fit on a page and it will insert a break for you. But if you want the break somewhere else, you can certainly do that yourself. Right now you can see that it breaks here at row 52 right at the bottom. You want to put manual ones above above the ones the computer generated because you can't put more on a page physically. You can put less but you can't put more. I would actually select one of the rows above the one the computer put in and then I could go to breaks and say insert a page break and then that will actually put a page break there for me and you can see it there and it got rid of the other one. And do you notice this one is a straight line where the other one was a green dotted line? That's how you know the difference between the ones you put in and the ones the computer put in. If you want to delete one, then go ahead and just select the row above and below, and you can go back to the breaks and say remove page break. And so there's lots of ways to put in page breaks or remove page breaks that way. Now let's talk about backgrounds for a second. This is really neat. You have the ability to take a picture that you might have already in your computer somewhere or you can do a Bing search or you might have one saved in your personal OneDrive. Let's say we do a search and we look for money. What will happen is that it's going to go out to Bing and it's actually going to look for any pictures that you have permission to use and then you're going to go ahead and choose one and you're going to say insert. And now you'll see the background of your whole entire spreadsheet here is that picture of money. Now this makes it really hard to read, but that is an option and it does not print by the way. It's only for viewing on the screen. Notice you can now delete your background if you wanted to do that. Now let me scroll back up to the top. We already talked about your print titles. So let's move over here to where it says width, height, and scale. And this is where you're going to be able to go ahead and shrink the width of your printout. If you want it to fit, for example, two pages, you can actually change the width of it, you can change the height, or you can change the scaling. Now width and height are automatic, but you can go in and say you want to set it to one page, two pages, or whatever you want to set it to. Now scaling, it's actually going to look at your page at 100% and let's just say one column wouldn't print on that page for example. It would actually shrink it so that you could get everything on one page. That's called scale to fit. Let's go back over here to page setup because I want to go down here to this arrow and see if there's any options that we didn't have buttons for. On the page tab, here's our portrait and landscape that we talked about. There's your scaling we just mentioned. Sometimes if one column prints on another page, you might try the fit to option to see if it would make everything fit one page across and one page tall. You can change your paper size here. We already talked about margins and we talked about header and footer and we talked about a couple things under the sheet tab. I did want to mention that you have the ability to print your grid lines right here. Sometimes people ask me how do you print these lines around each of the cells and those are your grid lines but what you really want to do is print borders not grid lines. Grid lines will print all of them that are on the page. You can also choose to print this black and white what they call draft quality or print the row and column headings which would be this ABC or this 1, 2, 3 over here. You can also tell it how you'd like to print the page order. If you have five pages, maybe you want to go down first and then across or across and then back down, whatever works for you. And that's going to be your page setup options right there. So you can see there's quite a few options there as far as your page setup. Well, let's go ahead and go over to section five now and I'll show you how to go ahead and have everything fit on one page if these options we talked about up here don't work for you. Hey, we're still working in module five and in this module we are talking about your page setup and print options in Excel. We're all the way down now to section five and I want to talk to you in this section about how to make everything print on one page because what happens often is you will set up your workbook and you'll go to print it and one column prints on a second page. Let's talk about how you make it all fit and look really nice when you print it out. 
I've got this exercise open that has several columns of information. If you notice, it has the name of the salesperson over in column A, and then it has figures for January through August, and the last column, column J, are the totals here. I want to look at it and see what it looks like if we go ahead and print it. I'm just going to go to the bottom and go to the page layout view, which is the middle view there, and you'll see that page one actually prints from the column that says name all the way over to the column that says July. But look how it chopped off August and totals and it's going to print it over on the second page. That's just not going to work for me. Let's look at some options that we can do to get everything to fit on one page for us. Let me go back down to the normal view and let's see what we've got. The first thought is that you may want to turn the paper from portrait to landscape. If I go back to the page layout tab here at the top, then I can change the orientation to landscape. But I will tell you that we don't have enough columns to make it actually look right. If I choose landscape, let's go look at it now. I'm going to go down and do the page layout. And you can see that I really have a lot of space left over here. And I could do a lot of things to take up that space, but this isn't really what I wanted in this particular case. Let me go back to normal and we're going to change it back to portrait because that's what I want. The second option is I can go up and adjust this scaling right here. Right now it's set at 100%. I could go down and make it maybe 75% or 80%. The problem is that I don't know exactly which one's going to work if that's going to be too small or too large. Let me show you what we can do and it will actually adjust the scaling for us and get it set up perfectly. Here's what we're going to do. Let's go down to the bottom where our views are and let's use the last view, which is your page break preview. I'm just going to click on that. And in this particular view, you're going to see the page break right here. Also notice there's a page break right down here underneath the words Canadian division. All you have to do is actually drag this dotted line, even with the edge of the page, and you've actually just changed the scaling right here and if you notice it made it 90%. Now I wouldn't know that automatically so it knew that for me and it went ahead and adjusted it. If you notice the page break this down at the bottom here is going to break up that Canadian division. Now I could drag this one all the way down to the bottom and fit everything on one page but I can tell you just from working with this exercise so many times it's too small. In this case, I think I'll just drag it back up above the Canadian division like that, and at least all of Canada will print together on the same page. And that's the easiest way to change your page breaks. Now, obviously, if you have a lot of columns left to write, that orientation might be the best bet for you, and then this may not work as good as it does right now. But when you've only got that situation with a couple of columns, then it works great. I'm going to go back to the normal view. And now we've got two pages and it's going to print perfectly. What I'd like to do now is talk to you a little bit about printing. So let's go ahead and head over to section six and I will talk to you over there real quick about printing your workbooks. Okay, welcome back. We're in module five and we're going to wrap it up with section six where we'll talk a little bit about printing your workbooks. When you go to print your workbook, you're not always going to want to print everything that's in the workbook. Sometimes you want to print just one sheet. Sometimes you want to print just a particular section on that sheet. I want to go through and show you all the options that you have when you're printing your workbooks. When you get ready to print anything, you can go up and use the print that happens to be here on your icon bar, but if you really want all the choices, I suggest you go through the file tab and go into the backstage view and print that way. When you click on the file tab, you're going to see an option that says print about halfway down right here. And you're going to have lots of options when you're printing. The first thing I want to point out is this is where your print preview is. And you'll be able to go back and forth between the pages down at the very bottom. It'll say page one of two in this case. And you can use the arrows to go back and forth to see how it's going to print. If you remember all those page setup options, that we looked at in section four, you can get to those in here as well. First of all, if I happen to click page setup right here, this screen will look familiar because we went through all of these options. 
A lot of these are in the page setup, but let me go back through those with you. First of all, here's your custom scaling. This is where we just went through in section five and talked about getting it on one page and we adjusted the scaling to do that. You can set your custom margins here. We saw this earlier. And if we didn't like any of these, we could go to the custom margins and change it that way. The next thing is the paper size. Probably you want eight and a half by 11, but if you wanted to change it, then here's that option. You can turn the paper from portrait to landscape here. Now here's something you haven't seen yet, collated. Collated basically means that if you wanted 10 copies of this, it would print page one, two, one, two, one, two, 10 times. If it's uncollated, it's gonna print all of page one, then it'll print all of page two. Here you can print one-sided, or if you have a printer that you can print on both sides, you can go ahead and flip the pages and you can print on both sides that way. Currently, it's going to print the active sheet. That would be sheet one that we've been working on. And if we want to print specific pages only, we can specify that right here. So let's say for whatever reason, you just want to print page two, you would set it up like this. But if you don't do that, it's going to print all the pages on that active sheet. If I drop the list down here, I can also print the entire workbook. That means that any sheets that actually had printing on them, it would actually print. I could also print a selection. That would be, let's say I just want to print Australia and I had selected it before I came in here, then I'd be able to print just the selection. The next thing is the printer that you're going to be printing to, and you have all these choices available. This would be how many copies of this would you like. And then when you're ready, you would actually hit the print and this would print right out the exact way that you want it. That's how printing is going to work. All of that has to do with your page setup and print options. We're gonna wrap up module five now and let's move over to module six where we're gonna talk a lot about adding some rows some columns and cells into some of your existing workbooks. I will see you over in module six. We've actually gone through module five now. We've been talking about the page setup and print options. I have a lot of things I want you to do in this exercise. Again, I'm gonna have these in the Word doc, all the instructions, but here's what I want you to do. Go ahead and open that file we've been working with called Loan Workbook. And I want you to go to the sheet called the detail sheet for the five-year loan. We're going to look and see if there are any headers or footers. And the way we're going to do that is remember at the very bottom, your second button is your page layout view. And if you click here, you can see that you just have the generic ones that come in Excel. What I want you to do is take the one that's in here out, you're gonna add the date on the top right, and then go down to the footer, and I'm gonna have you in the footer in the center where it says page one currently, put your name there. Once you've done that and you see it looks right, go ahead and flip back to normal view, which is the first view at the bottom. The next thing I'm gonna have you do is add a comment. You're gonna put a comment right here in C9, and I've listed the comment, which is, this is the beginning balance of this loan, over in the Word doc with the instructions. The next thing you're gonna do is change your margins to one inch for the left and right. I'm going to have you center this on the page vertically, and then set rows four through seven as print titles, so that every time you print a page, the titles for rows four through seven will print. You're gonna go ahead and print the entire workbook and then go ahead and save and close the file. Great job, you've done a lot. Let's go ahead and move over to module six when you're done and we'll talk about working with rows, columns, and cells. We are working now in module six and in this particular module, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about how to work with rows, columns, and cells in your workbook. This is section one, and in this section, I wanna to talk to you about adding and deleting rows and columns, and also how to add or delete cells. You don't necessarily need to add columns or rows to have more in your spreadsheet. What you need to do is add columns or rows in the middle of a table. Let me show you how all this is going to work. 
Let's take a quick look at the exercise before we start working with our rows and columns. This is a company called Books and Beyond. You can see that this is the Northeast region on this side, and this is the Mideast region on this side. For each region, it looks like they're tracking the salespeople for that region. It looks like they're tracking their figures for January through April. And then over here are your totals. And even though this one doesn't say totals here, that's what column G represents. If you look down at the bottom, it looks like they're actually writing formulas to add up all of their sales for each month. They've also got one for the average right here and the high right here. And in a later module, we're going to go through and actually write those formulas. But for now, let's talk about making this look a little bit nicer. Let's say that I'd like to put two blank rows at the very top of this. Now remember, I don't have to do that because we do have a margin area at the top. But just for the exercise, let's make it look a little bit nicer. The way you're going to insert rows is you're going to start off by selecting the number of rows you'd like to insert. You're going to select them by clicking on the row heading, which is the number itself, all the way on the left. You'll see your mouse turns to this black arrow that points to the right, and you just click. If you try to do this, that is not a row. That's X amount of cells. So make sure you click on the row heading itself. Now, I said I wanted to put two rows in here, so I'm going to drag down so I get rows 1 and 2 selected like this. Now, the way you're going to insert these rows is you're going to go to the Home tab, and if you go all the way over here where you see the cells, you'll see this Insert option. When you click the down arrow, you're going to have several choices as to what you'd like to insert, but one of these is to insert sheet rows. I'm going to click on that. And now you'll see there are two blank rows at the very top. The new rows always go above the one or ones you have selected. Columns always go to the left of the one or ones you have selected. Let's say that you like column G to represent May, and you want to push these over into column H. Notice when I select the G at the top, that's how I select the entire column. Again, to select multiple columns, I could drag across like this, but I just want one in this case. Again, I'm going back to that Insert option, and this time I'm going to insert sheet columns. And you can see it pushed everything over to the right, and I have a blank column. Now, for both of these, inserting rows and or columns, I could have right-clicked in the highlighted area and chosen Insert this way. If you want to delete a row or column, hitting delete on the keyboard is not going to do it. That deletes the contents of those cells you have selected. To actually get rid of the row or column, you're going to have to choose delete. Now again, I can right click and choose delete, which is the easiest way to do it. But notice there's also a delete right next to insert up here. And you can tell Excel that you'd like to delete sheet columns in this case or if you had rows selected, you would have an option to delete those rows. Now you know how to insert rows, you know how to insert columns, let's talk a little bit about inserting cells. Let's say that I'd like to put a new salesperson in the northeastern region, and I'd like to put them on row 8 where I see Baker right now. Basically, I want to push everything from Baker down one. I'm going to select row 8, and I'm going to right-click in the highlighted area and choose Insert. And now you'll see that I have a space to put in my new salesperson. But if you look closely, notice there's also a blank row over here. And I didn't want to do that because I only want to put the new person over in the Northeast region. This is an example of where you want to insert cells and not an entire row because a row goes across all the columns. I'm going to go ahead and select row 8, and I'm going to right-click and delete it. And here's how you select cells and then insert them. I'm going to click on Baker, hold the Shift key, and click on 900 here. So that is the range B8 through G8. Now if I right-click in the selected area and choose Insert, it's going to ask me, what would you like to do with the cells you have selected? I want to shift them down and I'll click OK, and now you can see everything pretty much moved down one row. But look how it didn't affect this table over here. That's how you're going to put in individual cells. Now if I want to type someone in here, I can go ahead and put that new person in. 
This will be Mr. Newberry. He's going to have 150, 200, 125, and 275. And then if we want to get his total, we can actually use the fill handle and copy it from the one above it, and that way we've got his answer. That's a quick overview of how to work with adding and deleting rows, columns, and cells. Now that you know how to add, delete, columns, rows, and cells, let's talk a little bit about changing the column row widths. Let's go ahead and move over to section two and I'll show you how that's done. Okay, we're in module six and we're all the way down now to section two. I wanna to talk to you a little bit in this section about how to change your column width and your row width. What's going to happen is if you don't have enough space in a particular column for numbers, for example, you're going to end up seeing these little pound symbols. And if you don't have enough space as far as the rows go, then you might cut off some of the text that's in a particular cell. Let me go ahead and show you a little bit about how to change your column and row widths. Let's talk first of all about text. A good example in this exercise, if you look in column A, row 3, this text says Books and Beyond Northeastern Region. You'll notice it's all in A3, none of it's in B3 because when you click here you'll see there's nothing in the formula bar. Text will spill over to the next cell provided it is empty, like in this particular case. Numbers will not do that. Now if I happen to type something in B3, for example, notice how it chops off whatever is over in A3. Now I can make the column a little bit wider so that I can see everything there. And I can do that just by putting my mouse between the headers at the top. See how if you put your mouse between the A and the B there, you get the double black arrow. And then you can actually drag this as far as you need it to go in order to see everything that's in that particular column. Now you'll notice in this particular case, it made column A really wide, so that's really not going to work for me in this case, but that's how you would do that. I'm going to go ahead and delete that 5, and I'm going to move this back over a little bit. Something else you can do is if you know that you need a column to be a little bit wider, instead of dragging that left or right, you can actually double click that line that separates column A and B. And what that will do is look down the entire column, find the widest piece of information to make your column just that wide. Because a lot of times you might make it wide and it looks great and then you get further down and you need it to be even wider. Sometimes it'll make a column smaller. For example, if I look here at February and I come up and get the line that separates the D and the E, notice it made it a little bit smaller. See that? So you can always work with your column widths that way. Now let me go back and just make that smaller again because it's way too wide. The other thing I want you to notice is that numbers will not spill over. Let's say I take, for example, March and I happen to make it a little smaller like this. You'll see that eventually you're going to see these little pound symbols like this. And sometimes you'll only see one in that column because maybe that one cell only is the one that wasn't wide enough. But anytime you see these, that means that the column is not wide enough. Even if the one to the right of it's empty like this, it's still not going to spill over. Only text will spill over. I'm going to undo that. All you'd have to do is go ahead and make your column a little bit wider like we talked about. I'd probably get up on the line that separates column E and F, double click, and now you'll see that it's wide enough. That's pretty much all you need to know about changing your column and row widths. Well, that's going to wrap up Module 6. Why don't we go ahead now and move over to Module 7, and I want to talk to you a little bit about how to move your data around. We're going to do our cut, copy, and paste, and I'll also show you how to copy some formulas. Let's move over now to Module 7. Module 6 was all about inserting rows, columns, and cells. You're going to start by opening an exercise called Eastern Regions Report. I'm going to have you adding rows in here. You'll be adding a couple rows at the top. I'm going to have you add some columns. And I'm going to have you add some cells in here. Once you get those rows and columns in, I'm going to have you delete them just to make sure you know how to delete a row or column. 
You're also going to insert a range of cells so that you can actually put the new salesperson in the Northeast region right up here. You'll have some figures you'll plug in for the new salesperson whose name is Newberry. And at the end, when you get over to column G, you'll be actually creating a formula to figure out Mr. Newberry's totals. When you get done with that, if you're comfortable, go ahead and save it and close the file and you are done with rows, columns, and cells. Why don't you go ahead now and head over to module seven where we're going to talk all about moving your data. We are all the way down now to module seven and this is the module where I wanna to talk to you a little bit about moving your data around. This is section one and I wanna go through cut, copy, and paste with you. Cut, copy, and paste is a basic that you have to know for any program you're working in. It basically is a way for you to take your data from one place and put it in another place. Sometimes you actually want to move the data. Other times you just want to make a copy of it somewhere else. Let's go ahead and run through cut, copy, and paste, and then you'll be an expert in knowing how to move your data. In this exercise, we have Books and Beyond. The Northeast region is on the left. The Mideast region is on the right. I'd like to do a few things to make the exercise look a little bit nicer. One of them being, I'd like to take the information here and line it up with the edge of the table in column K, and maybe the same thing over here. I'll take what's in A3 and move it up to B2. The easiest way to do this is go ahead and select whatever you'd like to move. And you'll notice that if I put my mouse around the edges of this cell, which is the active cell, I'll get a white arrow. All I have to do now is hold the mouse down and drag it to the cell I'd like to drop it off in and let go. Pretty easy to do that. Let me do it over here. I'm going to select J3, point around the edges till I get the white arrow, and click and drag over to K2 and drop it off. And now you can see it looks a little bit nicer like this. Now we just call that moving. That's not cut, copy, and paste. What I'd like to talk to you about now is how to actually cut this Mideast region and we'll place it down below the Northeast region. If you cut something, you're actually removing it from where it is and you're going to put it somewhere else. If you copy, you're making a copy of that information somewhere else. That's the difference. Now before I show you the four steps, we're going to be working with what we call the clipboard. And I want to show you how to turn the clipboard on. If you go over to your home tab, and you'll see a clipboard grouping, and there's an arrow on the bottom right that you just click on to turn it on. And this is called the clipboard right here. The way the clipboard works is every time you cut or copy something, it will show up on this clipboard so that you can paste it in somewhere else. There is one clipboard for the whole computer, not one per program. So what that means is if I cut or copy something here, I'll be able to paste it into Word if I like, or into a web page I'm creating, wherever I'd like to put it in my computer. The clipboard is only wiped if you close all of Microsoft Office. You can close just Excel, but if you had Word still open, for example, then it would still be there. But once you close Word, that would close all of Microsoft Office, and then everything on the clipboard would be gone. There are four steps to cut, copy, and paste. Number one, you're going to select whatever it is you'd like to cut or copy. Number two, you're going to choose the cut or copy options. Number three, you're going to click the mouse wherever you'd like to put the data. You do not have to put it in Excel, even though we're going to do that. Like I said, you can put it anywhere in your computer. And then the last thing is you're just going to paste. Let me give you an example of how that's going to work. Following the four steps, the first thing I want to do is select my entire Mideast region. In this case, it's going to be K2, and I'm going to follow this down and end it over in P16. K2, hold Shift, and click P16. That selects everything between those two points. Number two is I'm going to cut or copy. There's a couple ways you can do this. You can either come up here to where you see cut or copy, or you can just right click your mouse anywhere and you'll be able to choose cut or copy this way. I'm going to cut because I want to remove it. 
And you can see it looks like it's still here. It won't disappear until I actually paste it in. Number three says click your mouse where you'd like to put this. Now I'm going to click down here in B18. I could click over in Word and put it in or somewhere else like I said. Now when I go to paste this you can do it one of two ways. You can right click and choose paste right here or you can actually come over here and click on it from the clipboard. Either one's going to work. I'll go ahead and choose paste right here and now you'll see it's moved it. It's no longer on the right and it's down below. Just so you will know, if you happen to paste by clicking over here, it leaves the original and you have to go back and delete it if you don't want it. When you're working with a clipboard, if there's something specific on the clipboard that you don't want anymore, you can actually click the down arrow and delete that one piece of information. But like I said, it's going to be deleted when you close all of Microsoft Office. Your clipboard only holds 24 items. Once you cut or copy that 25th item, it's going to pop up and say, would you like me to replace the first one? Just know that. You do not have to turn the clipboard on to actually do what we just did. We just turned it on so we could see what's there. I want to show you how this works between programs as well. I'm going to go ahead and open up Microsoft Word for a moment and you'll see the clipboard there and I'll show you how it works. This is a blank document in Microsoft Word. Do you remember the clipboard we turned on in Excel a few moments ago? If you notice, this is the exact same grouping right here, and I can hit this arrow to turn the clipboard on. And look, there's the data we just cut from Excel. All I have to do is click on it, and I've now pasted that into Word. Let me give you one more example. I'm going to go over to the Internet and grab a picture real quick. Let's say I found this picture of this dog that I like. If I right click, you'll notice that it says copy image. Now just be aware that when you're on the internet, you want to be super careful about copying images because some of them may be subject to copyright. But the point is, I want to show you how to copy from anywhere in the computer. I'm going to choose copy image, and I'm going to flip back to Excel and see if it's on the clipboard. There it is. So if I want to put this dog over here, for example, all I have to do is go ahead and choose it and you'll see there he is. Now it's a whole other subject when we start talking about sizing images and all of that but the point is you see how to cut or copy from anywhere in your computer. Let's go ahead and wrap this section up and I want to talk to you a little bit in section 2 about copying formulas. Hey, welcome back. We're in Module 7, and we're talking in this module about how to move your data around. We've already done Section 1, where we went to the basics of cut, copy, and paste. I want to go ahead now into Section 2 and talk to you a little bit more about cut, copy, and paste, some additional options, and how they apply to formulas. Let's jump right in, and I will show you how to copy your formulas. In this exercise, if we look down at row 12, we have a formula here in cell C12. I'm going to double click to show it to you. And we haven't really talked a lot about formulas, but this one basically says add everything between C6 and C10. If I wanted to add this column, I would be saying add everything from D6 through D10. So basically it's pretty much the same except the column's different. You have the ability in Excel to copy your formulas using what's called the fill handle. The easiest thing to do is if the first formula is correct, click on it and drag the fill handle across this way and that will actually copy that formula to the cells across. When I look at these, you'll notice this one says D6 through D10. This one will say E6 through E10 and all the way across. And I could do the same thing for these as well and for this last one. And that's a really quick way to copy your formulas. A little term that I want you to get familiar with for later, in each of these, when we copied across, Excel changed the column in the formula for us. There is a term for that. It is called relative reference. Excel will change the column or row relatively so that the answer stays correct. Let me show you up and down what I mean. When we look at G6, for example, this one is saying add across, and it says add C6 through F6. The one below it says C7 through F7, so this one changed the row automatically. When you go down and use the fill handle, the row will change automatically for you. 
You're going to learn later that you don't always want it to do that, but that term that I want you to remember is called relative reference. Now let me go back to this for a second. I'll just delete this one. I could, if I wanted to, have just right clicked on this one, chosen copy, and I could right click on this blank one and then choose paste. That would certainly work, but I'd have several to do that with and it would just be very time consuming to do that. Now I did want to show you that there are several other options when you're pasting. Let me go ahead and select this whole table and I'm going to copy this. Now if I just come over here and right click, these are actually all of your paste options right here. And you can see a preview as I move across them, but I want to go through them real quick so you'll know what they mean. This first one is the regular paste that you'll use most of the time. The second one will paste the values, okay? I'm going to click on that and just show you what I mean. Now at first glance, this looks just like this. But here's what I want you to notice. When I click here, there's no formula. It's just the value that was in that cell over here. Same thing all the way across with all of these. And that's what paste values means. Let me go back and copy this again. And I'll just slide to the right for a minute and show you a few other things here. Let's say I right click this time and look at the third one. That's called formulas, which is basically what the first one did in this case because we had formulas there we were copying. Now let's talk about transpose what this does. If you notice, the original had the months going across and the names going down this way. Transpose just flips that. Notice now the months go up and down and the names go across. So anytime you'd like to flip your column or row headings like that, use the transpose option. There were a couple more there, so let me go back and select this again for you. I'm going to right click and copy. Now when I look at this and I right click, this one says copy the formatting. The formatting is the bold and italics and the colors, all of that. So that would not actually copy the numbers or text, just the formatting. And you'll see later on as we go through here how this would apply. And then we'll talk about paste links a little bit later as well. I just want you to be familiar with all those options so that when you see them, you would know which one that you might want to choose. Well, that's going to go ahead and wrap up Module 7. We've talked about moving your data around. Let's go ahead and really get into some of these formulas over in Module 8. I want to go ahead and start in Section 1 and give you an overview of how formulas work. We've been working in Module 7, and in this module, we've talked about how to move your data, and we did that a couple different ways. We actually used the Move feature, where we were able to actually point around the edges of our active cell and move data. We did Cut, Copy, and Paste, and I want you to go ahead and go through here and do a quick little exercise just to make sure you're okay with all of this. The first thing I'm going to have you do is open a file called Eastern Regions Report 2. It should look just like this when you get it open. I'm going to actually have you move this information up here so it lines up with the table nice and neat. You'll move this information over here. And then once you get done, we're actually going to take the Mideast region, which is on the right, and put it below the Northeast region. Remember when you do cut and paste and you go to do the paste portion, just click in B18. You don't have to select the whole exact same size range. It'll fill down and across for you when you do that. Once you get that done, then you'll have a little bit of a nicer looking file and I want you to go ahead and save it for me. And then we'll move over into module eight and talk about formulas and functions. We are ready to start talking about formulas and functions. We're all the way down to Module 8 now. This is Section 1, and in this section, I want to give you a quick overview of formulas and basically how they work. A formula is basically a mathematical calculation that tells Excel what to do. You can do simple things like add a column of numbers to really sophisticated things like statistics and things you would never even imagine. Excel is very, very powerful when it comes to formulas. Let's get a quick overview of how formulas work and then we'll jump right in and start creating some formulas using functions. 
What you need to remember when you're writing formulas is that wherever you click the mouse, that's where the answer is going to appear. Formulas can be on the same sheet as the data, they can be on a separate sheet as the data, or they can be in a totally different file. And we'll be doing all of this as we go through these videos. But just to give you a quick overview and review, let's say that I wanted to add my numbers for January. I'm going to click in C12 next to total because that's where I want the answer to be and I'm going to put in the equal sign. Remember that all formulas must start with an equal sign, no exceptions. I'm going to click on C6. I'm going to hit the plus sign. C7 plus C8 plus C9 plus C10. And when you're finished writing your formula, you just hit the Enter key and you will have your answer just like that. Now think about this. Even though I was able to click on each cell and tell Excel that I'd like to add another number, if I have a thousand numbers to add, do you think I want to count all the way to a thousand? That's just going to take me all day long to do that. We're going to have other ways we can write formulas using functions. A function is going to be a word we use in our formula to tell it what to do. Another example of a super basic one where we're adding is let's say we go over here to column G and I want to add up all of the figures for this line. I'm going to start with equals. I'm going to click on the 110 which is in C6 plus because I have another one. Then I have D6 plus because I have another. E6 plus and then F6 and I'll enter. And now I've got that one. That's going to give you a quick overview of how basic formulas are written. I really want to take you now over into the second part of this and let's talk about how to use functions because that's really going to make your life a lot easier when you have a word that tells it what to do in your formula. Welcome back. We're working in Module 8 and we're talking about formulas and functions in this particular module. We did a real quick overview of formulas in Section 1. Now that we're in Section 2, I want to actually talk to you a little bit about creating formulas using functions. A function is basically a word that tells it what to do in your formula and I'm going to go through all of these with you and show you how this works. Let's flip over to Excel and we'll write some more formulas. We already added up January. We did this manually by clicking inside of each of the cells we wanted to add, but that was the long way to do it. I'm going to go ahead and hit delete here and talk to you a little bit about using functions in your formulas. A function is a word that you use in your formula to tell it what to do. There are over 200 functions built into Excel. The most common of the 200 is the word sum, S-U-M, which basically means to add. Typically, if I ask students if they've ever written a formula before, they'll say yes, and they'll say someone showed them how to do this. Notice that I'm under the Home tab, and there's this Auto Sum button right here. You're also going to find that same button under the tab that says Formulas. I'd probably use it under the Formulas tab. You'll see it right here, because we'll also be looking at some of these other options that have to do with formulas as well. I'm going to click the Auto Sum button and notice that it put a formula in for me. And do you notice it didn't put the answer in? It put the formula in and it's just sitting there because it wants to make sure this is exactly what I want. Now notice it's assuming I want to add everything above where I was clicked. Notice it also included row 11 which has nothing in it. That won't affect anything as far as the answer goes in this case, but if I did add a number in C11, it would become part of my answer. If this is what I want, I just hit the Enter key. If it's not, let's say I didn't want 11 in there, I would just drag through what I do want, just like this, and then hit the Enter key. And now you can see I have the exact same number I had earlier, except I didn't have to manually tell it to add each one of these. So if you notice the way the formula reads now, it says I want to add the range C6 through C10. And that's the easiest way if you want to add a range of numbers that are all together. Now let me show you what happens when you go over to the next one because I need February as well. If I come up and hit Auto Sum again, you'll see that again it assumes that I want to add everything above this. I'm going to go ahead and just hit the Enter key and now I've got 965. 
Now watch what happens when I do the third one here. I'm going to hit Auto Sum, and notice it assumes I want to add everything to the left of where I'm clicked. I don't. I'm trying to add everything above it. So I'll just click and drag the range I do want to add, and then hit the Enter key. Now if it were me doing this, I would have done the first one and just used the fill handle and dragged across to copy my formula, but I did want to show you some other ways to write this formula. I also wanted to show you this little green mark that you see right here and what that actually means. If you know how Grammar Check works in Microsoft Word, it's very similar. It's letting me know that the formula I have here may be wrong. And the reason it says that is because it's looking at the one to the left of it and it knows it's different. When you have an error, if you notice if you look where this exclamation point is, it tells me the formula in this cell differs from the formulas in this area of the spreadsheet. This one over here was 6 through 10. When I look at this one, it's 6 through 11. It's not hurting a thing, my answer is still correct, but if I wanted to fix it, I could go ahead and pick one of the choices from this drop-down list. The one I'd probably choose is to copy the formula from the left. There you go, the answer is the same, but now it includes 6 through 10. The last way I wanted to show you this is, if you, before you ever write your formula, select everything you'd like to add and the blank one for the answer, then you can go up to Auto Sum and it will just give you the answer because it doesn't have to guess what it is you're trying to add. I could also do the same thing from left to right. If I wanted to go ahead and select all of these as an example, I've got all the cells I'd like to add and the blank ones over here for the answer. I can hit Auto Sum and there I have the answer as well. Now I've got one more down here. There's several ways I can do this. I can actually copy this formula using my fill handle, or I could have hit auto sum and added everything above. And that's actually a really good way to check and see if this total answer is correct, to do it each way. And if you get the same answer, then you know it's the right answer. Now let's go down and talk about averages. The word that you want to use here is the word average. If I type equals, the entire word average, and then my open parenthesis, I can drag through my range, and then I can hit the enter key, and I've done it the exact same way. The word high means when I'm looking at this range of numbers, what's the highest number? The word I'm going to use for that is the word max. I'm going to type equals, the word max, open my parenthesis, and then I can drag through the range, and I should get 220. Now let's talk a little bit about these functions and where they come from. Let me go ahead and just select this range again, because I wanted to show you that if you have a range selected, you can look down at the bottom here and see the six most common functions and the answers. And these aren't going to put the answer anywhere, it's just for you to know. I happen to have the average turned on, there's a count. Count counts the number of cells you have selected. The numerical count will count the ones with numbers in them. Min means what's the lowest number in my range. And if you had max there, it would mean what's the highest number in the range. And of course, sum means add. If I right click on any of these, you'll see right here in this area are the six most common. The ones I've checked are the ones that you're seeing down there at the bottom. So if I don't want one of these, I can just uncheck it. And you'll see now I've only got a couple of them down there. But those are the six most common functions right here. And you can't change that. Average, you're going to add all the numbers and divide by the number of cells you have selected. And I told you about the rest of these so you know what those mean. Now remember a range can be two cells as long as they're adjacent. If they're not adjacent, you're not going to see anything down here. If I just click randomly somewhere, you'll see there's nothing down here to look at. Now let me go back to C12 and I'm just going to hit delete here. I want to take you through your ribbon to show you where all of these functions happen to live. You can use this little fx here, which is insert function, 
or you can come up here where it says insert function and use it that way. I did tell you that there are over 200 built-in functions in Excel and I wanted to show you that they're all right here in this list. Now when you start looking at this list you'll notice that currently I'm looking at a category called most recently used. These will be the last ones that were used in my computer. This makes it easy if you have several that you use on a regular basis you can come right back and just click on them from here. But notice if I drop this list down I can look at all of the functions and they're in alphabetical order. From there I can take that list and look at just the ones that have to do with financial, just the ones that have to do with math and trig, statistics, you can kind of see the list here. Let me go ahead and click on all and just show you how you can look through this list to determine what each one of these actually does. When you're clicked on a particular function it will tell you down here what that function does or the definition. This one for example will return the inverse hyperbolic cosine of a number. And some of these may be way over your head because these can be very, very sophisticated. But looking down this list, let's talk about a few of these that you're going to use. Here's average, for example, and you know what that one means. Some of these that say if at the end, this means do the average if certain criteria is met. You'll see that there's a lot of them that have to do with what we call chi beta probabilities. You're going to see that there's some that have to do with ceilings, some of these have to do with columns. Here's one that you might use from time to time, concatenate. If you happen to have two columns of information that you want to put together in one column, and an example I see all the time is someone will have the last name in a column and the first name in another column, and they want to actually join them all together in their own column, you would use concatenate to do that. Let's go ahead and stop the video right here and I'm going to have you go over into the second part of this and we will continue looking at these different functions. Okay, welcome back. We're in module 8 and we're talking about formulas and functions in this particular module. We've already gone through section 1 where we got an overview of how formulas work and we started working on section 2 where I'm showing you how to create formulas using functions. We were in the middle of looking at those functions so let's go ahead and continue so we can see some of the other functions that are in Excel. The last one we looked at was concatenate, which allows you to join two different columns of information together in one. So let's keep going. When you go down the list, another one that's going to be really popular is the count function. If you have a series of numbers and you know you should have 100 numbers and you select them all and it says you have 99, then you know you're missing someone. Here's one that counts all the blank cells. Here's one that will do a count if it meets certain criteria that you put in. Going down the list, we've got a couple more. Let's say, for example, you want to work with some date and time functions. You've got a couple right there. You've got some other functions going down. And let's keep on going until we see if an if statement is going to be something you're going to do on a regular basis. We'll be actually running one of these in a later module. But basically, you have it checked to see if something you've typed in is true. If it is true, you have it do one thing. If it's false, you have it do something else. Going down the list, there's a few more that are going to be really popular. And let's just kind of get on down here to where we see sum. There was max. I just passed max on the list. That finds the highest number in your range. Remember that min, M-I-N, will find the lowest number in your range. Let's say we've looked down the list and we come across the word sum, S-U-M, and we decide that this is the one we want because it adds all the numbers in a range of cells. I'm just going to hit OK. And now this is the part called function arguments. The arguments portion is basically the range portion or where the numbers are you want to do something with. Notice it assumed a C6 through 11. I can leave it there or I can change that last one there to a 10 because I do want C6 through 10. Notice it shows me all the values in those cells and it gives me the result right down here. I'm going to come back in a minute and tell you about number two. But for now, I'm going to click OK and there's the exact same formula we wrote using the auto sum or we could have written it by hand. 
The reason you have that number two field was because what if you're going to add two different ranges? Let's say for whatever example over here, I'd like to add January and March. What I would do is I would go to Insert Function. I would find Sum from the bottom of the list here. Notice if I click here, I can hit S and I'll go to the S's. I'm going to find Sum. When I click OK, it's going to assume the range, and I said I wanted January, so that's my first range. Now I'm going to click where it says number 2, and I'm going to drag through March. And that's why you have multiple fields. I could even add a third range if I wanted, and it would keep on going. But that's what that extra field there is for. Let me go ahead and cancel out of that. I'm going to go ahead and use my fill handle and copy across to get my averages and my fill handle for the highs to copy across to get those. I wanted to briefly tell you about these buttons right here. They may look familiar. This is your function library. If you remember when I took you into the insert function button, there were several different categories I told you that you could pick from. You've got financial, date and time, math and trig, and you'll see a lot of these right here. It's just a quick way if I don't want to come all the way back into this insert function window and I'm looking for a particular function that I know happens to be under financial, for example, I can just grab it right from the drop down here. Now one more thing that I wanted to point out. When we were looking at this exercise, we had done all of these formulas right here, but if you notice, we have no formulas down here at the bottom. And I don't have to go down here and actually write new formulas. I can actually copy these and paste them down here. All I have to do is right-click and copy, go down to the bottom where it says Total, and then right-click and Paste. And the reason this works is because of that relative reference we talked about earlier. It knows to change the column or row relatively so that the answer is correct. When you do this, always check one answer. If one's right, they're all right. If one's wrong, they're all wrong. And when I look at this particular one, it does refer to 22 through 26, so that is correct. That's going to give you a quick overview of how to use your functions when you're writing formulas. We've got one more section in this particular module we need to look at, and I want to look at section three, which is the absolute values, and show you how those work. I'll see you over in section three. We are working in module eight, and we've been talking a lot in this module about different formulas and some of the different functions in Excel. We've had a quick overview of formulas. We've gone through and looked at a ton of different functions, and now I wanna to talk to you about something called absolute values. I've mentioned to you a couple of times the term relative reference, and that's where Excel will automatically change the column or row so the answer is correct. I did mention to you that you're not always going to want to do that, and this is an instance where you would want to create an absolute value. Let me flip over and I'll show you what an absolute value is and why you'd want to use it. This exercise is very similar to the one we've been working in. This is that same company, Books and Beyond, and they have an Australian division of the company and a European division of the company, and they're tracking pretty much the same information as far as the salesperson and their figures for all their quarters and their totals. But now we see something new. It looks like they'd like to give them a commission as well. And they're going to give them a commission rate of 15% that you see up here. What I want to do is first of all go back and review relative reference so you can see what that is and then we'll write a formula to figure out the commission. Remember that relative reference basically means that when you write a formula, Excel will automatically know to change the row if you go up and down or the column if you go across. So all of these formulas right here would be the exact same except that the row right here would be different. When we look at our columns, all of these across this way will be the same except that the column will be different. There are some times when you don't want to do that, and this is a prime example. Let's go ahead and click over here in H8, and I want to figure out Mr. Long's commission. Remember, it's going to be a 15% commission based on his total. And the easiest way to do this is just hit the equal sign on your keyboard. We're going to take 
G8, which is Mr. Long's total, and we're going to multiply it times G3, which is the commission rate. I'm going to go ahead and hit the Enter key, and you'll see his commission is 176.25. And let me just make a comment here. A lot of times people think that you have to have a word or a function in every formula, and that is not the way it is. Think about this one. All I want to do is take one cell times another. There's not really a word for that, and I wouldn't need one anyway because there's no range here. So don't get caught up on that. Make your formulas as easy as possible. But let me show you what's going to happen in this case if I use my fill handle and just copy this down. Look how I have zeros. Let's go see why. Well, we know this one's correct, obviously, but let's look at this first one. This one is taking G9, so it did move down like it should. But look, it also went down up here to sell G4, and there's nothing there. That's why I got zero. If I look at the one below that, Again, it went down, G10, that's correct, but look up here, it's G5, that's not correct. So what's happening is it's moving down like it should to make the answer what it thinks should be correct. But what we want is a little different this time. We want the total to move down in the formula, but we never want G3 to change. What we're going to do is in the formula itself, we're going to make G3 what we call absolute. The way you do this is make sure you're clicked in the formula where the G3 is. It doesn't matter if you're in front of the G, behind the 3, or in the middle of it, just as long as you're in G3. And you're going to insert dollar signs in front of the G and in front of the 3. Yes, you can type them, but you can also use on your keyboard your F4 key, and that will actually put those in for you. I'm going to go ahead and type mine in right here real quick, and what you're going to see is that I'm going to actually hit the Enter key, and now I've got my same answer, but now it's absolute. The way you actually read this is you want to say G8 times the absolute value of G3. If I copy these down now, notice they're all going to say G9 times the absolute value of G3. This one will say G10 times the absolute value of G3. And that's how you do an absolute value. Now one thing I just want to give you a little heads up on, in Module 12 we're going to talk a little bit about working with names. You do have the ability, if you'd like, to not have this 15% anywhere on this sheet and you can still have it do these calculations for you. And we'll come back and use this exercise when we get ready to do that. Well, that's all there is to working with absolute values. Let's go ahead and wrap up Module 8 and move over to Module 9 and talk about working with our sheets. In Module 8, we did a lot with formulas and functions, and I want to make sure that you can write some super basic formulas when it comes to working with your spreadsheets. What I'm going to have you do is open this file called Eastern Regions Report, and we're going to put a lot of formulas in here. I'm going to have you guys start by clicking in C12 and adding up January, and then you can copy that across. You'll do the same thing for averages and the highs as well. Once that's done, we'll come over to column G and figure out the totals across for each person, and also the commissions. Remember, when you figure out the commissions, you're basically taking your total times this commission rate to get an answer. And also remember that it will have to be an absolute value if you don't create the absolute value. When you copy the formula down, you'll get zeros for your answers. Once you get all the answers in here, you're going to copy every single one of them down to this Mideast region. And I've got instructions over on the Word doc on exactly what to do. Well, good luck with that. It's not really that hard, but just take a few minutes and just make sure you know how to do this before you move on to Module 9, Working with Sheets. All right, we've made it all the way down now to Module 9, and in this module, I want to talk to you about how to work with your sheet tabs that you see at the bottom when you open a workbook. You can actually add sheets. You can delete those sheets, and you can rename those sheets. Let's go through and talk a little bit about how sheets work, and I will show you how to add, delete, and rename those sheet tabs. We have an exercise here that has multiple sheets with information on them, and I want to take a peek at what this looks like before we get started. 
This is the Australian division of the company, and if you notice, they've listed each item that they're selling, the figures for quarters one through four here, and they've just totaled them down in row nine. Now notice that we're on sheet one at the bottom. Let's see what's on sheet two. All I have to do is click on it, and I'll flip to that sheet. This looks like the European division. If you notice, the setup's the exact same, except these numbers are different, which obviously changes our totals. Let's see what's on sheet three. Looks like the North American division. Sheet four looks like the South American division. And sheet five looks like a summary. What we're going to end up doing in section three is writing a three-dimensional formula here. That would be a formula that goes to the other four sheets and gives me a total here on this fifth sheet. But meanwhile, let's go back to sheet one for a moment. If I asked you which sheet was Europe, would you remember that it's sheet two? Probably not, so the best thing to do is go ahead and rename your sheet tab so that you know what's on each sheet. There are a couple ways to do this, but the easiest way is to double click on the words sheet one at the bottom, that will select it, and then you can type right over it. I'll just go ahead and put each of the sheet tab names in here. Sheet two is Europe. Looks like sheet three is North America. Looks like sheet four is South America. And sheet five is Summary. Now we know that when we click on the Europe sheet, we're going to see the European division of the company. There are some things you can do as far as adding sheets. Let's say you wanted to add a sheet in between North and South America. If I select the South American sheet, I can right click and I can insert a sheet in front of that sheet. It will ask you when you do this, what is it you're trying to insert and you want a worksheet. So I'll just click OK, and now you'll see it's using the name Sheet 1 since we're not using that name anymore. Now there is a plus sign all the way over here, and if I click on that plus sign, you'll notice I've added another sheet there. So that's another way to put a sheet in front of the sheet that you're currently on. If you want to delete a sheet, you just right click on that Sheet tab, and you can choose Delete from the list. If you delete a sheet, you cannot undo it. Just know that. I'm going to go ahead and delete sheet one as well. I'm going to right click and choose delete and now that sheet's gone too. Now I do have the ability to move the sheets around. What if I decided that I'd like North America to be the first sheet? Notice how if I just click on it, I can drag the sheets left or right. You'll see a little down arrow and when you let go, that's where it's going to be. Let's say I move this back and I'll move it to the right of South America. Be really careful about moving your sheets on the other side of summary because when we talk about our three-dimensional formulas, we're going to be saying that we want to add a range of sheets. And if you've moved this on the other side, it won't be in the range. Just be really careful about that. That's a quick way to go ahead and add sheets, delete sheets, and rename and move your sheets around. Why don't we go ahead now and go over into section two and I'll show you some additional sheet tab options you have. Welcome back, this is section two of module nine and in this particular module we are talking about working with the sheet tabs at the bottom of each of your workbooks. We've already learned how to add some sheet tabs, delete them and rename them. Now I'd like to go in and show you some of the additional sheet tab options you have when you're working with each of those sheets. We've already talked about some of the options you can do with sheets as far as adding sheets. We talked about deleting sheets and renaming them, but let's go ahead and look at all the options available when you're working with your sheet tabs. If you're on any sheet tab and you right click your mouse, you're going to see a list of things you can do, starting with insert. We talked about the fact that you can insert a worksheet and it will actually go to the left of the sheet you have selected or in front of that sheet. You can also right click on a sheet tab and delete it. Remember, if you delete it, you cannot get it back. So make sure that's really what you'd like to do. You can also rename a sheet. Choosing rename this way just selects the sheet tab name and that way you can type right over it. It's actually a little bit easier just to double click on the sheet tab name to do the same thing. Here you can move or copy. We did talk about the fact that you can pick up a sheet tab and move it left or right, but let's look at the options when you go this way. 
Here what you'll see is this is the name of the file that you're working in and these are the sheet tabs in that particular file. If I wanted to take South America, the one I'm clicked on, and move it to the very front, I would choose Australia because it says before sheet and then click OK. And now look how it's moved that sheet tab. Now I'm going to right click on that again and go back to move or copy because here's something that's really nice. Sometimes people ask me, can you take a sheet tab and actually copy it into another file like a blank workbook? And the answer is yes you can. Let's say you want to copy South America, but this time what I want to do is put it in a new workbook. And I want to create a copy because I want to leave this one here and just make a copy in the new workbook. Now when I click OK, I want you to notice this is a brand new file. Notice it says book one at the top. And notice we only have one sheet and it's the one called South America. That's a really great way instead of copying and pasting a lot of times what happens when you copy and paste the data on one sheet into another file, you lose all your formatting, you lose your column widths and all that. Doing it this way, you don't lose any of that. I'm going to go back and close this and we won't save it. And then we'll be back on the file we were working in. All right, I'm going to right click again on South America. And I want to just mention the view code. If you click on this, it's actually going to take you into an entirely different program called Visual Basic. And you do have the ability to write some what they call VBA code and stuff like that to make Excel do different things. But I don't want you to get lost in here because this is programming and if you happen to click on it accidentally, just go ahead and hit the X and close out of it. It's not actually part of Excel. Alright, I'm going to right click again. And let me talk to you briefly about protecting the sheet. We will talk in a later module about protecting your file and protecting your sheet, but you do have the ability to create a password to put on this sheet so that when someone opens it, they have to know the password to get in. Notice you can also change the tab color. If there's a particular sheet, like maybe the summary sheet, and you'd like that sheet to stand out for some reason, change the tab color, and when you click on another tab, you'll see that there's where the color shows up. I can also hide a sheet. If you hide a sheet, you can see that it looks like the sheet is not even there. You can right click and unhide a sheet. It will list the hidden sheets. You choose the one you want to unhide and you click OK. Some reasons for hiding a sheet might be, obviously you don't want someone to see that sheet. Let's say for example you've created a list with a drop down and this is a little more advanced than we are right now but you can have drop down lists in Excel. Well those drop down lists have to live somewhere. They can live on a sheet you've created and then you hide the sheet so that others can't get in and actually mess with the list and screw it up. So that's a great example of why you might want to hide a sheet. Now I'm going to go back because you can also do one more thing. You can select all the sheets. And you can see when you do this that all of these turn white or they're selected so that whatever you do on one sheet now appears on all the sheets. To deselect all the sheets, you just click on any sheet tab and now you're on this one sheet tab only. Those are the options that you have when you're working with sheet tabs. Let's go ahead and wrap up this section and I'm going to have you go over to section 3 where we're going to talk about three-dimensional formulas. We are going to wrap up Module 9 with Section 3 here. We've been talking about working with your sheet tabs, and now I want to talk to you a little bit about how three-dimensional formulas come into play. A three-dimensional formula is basically a formula that you write on one sheet, and it calculates data from other sheets and puts the answer on this sheet that you're on. And we call those 3D formulas or three-dimensional formulas. Let me go ahead and show you how three-dimensional formulas are actually set up. In this exercise, if you remember, I told you that all of the sheets were set up exactly alike. Each one was listing the items they were selling, the figures for quarters 1 through 4, and totals down in row 9. This area right here is the only thing that's different on each sheet because that's where the numbers are for each of the divisions. Now if we click over on the summary sheet, we're going to be actually putting the answers right in here.
We're going to tell Excel to go to each of these four sheets at the bottom and add up B4 and then put the answer here on this summary sheet. Now a couple things to review before we actually do this. If you remember when we were in Section 8 and we talked about formulas, one of the things we talked about was how to select a range. Remember a range means you have a starting cell, you're going to hold the Shift key, and then you'll click the ending cell so that it gets everything in between. You need to know that because when you're writing a three-dimensional formula, you're going to be selecting a range of sheets instead of a range of cells, but you'll do it the exact same way. If I wanted to select the sheet Australia all the way to South America, I'm going to make sure Australia has been clicked on. I'm going to hold Shift and I'm going to click South America. And you can see the sheet tabs all look like they've been selected when you do that. If you type something on a sheet tab that's part of a range of sheets that's selected like this, it's going to be on every sheet. Let me give you a little example. I'll put Books and Beyond here. Now I've just typed it on the Australia sheet, but notice I can click North America and it's in the same place, South America it's in the same place, and so forth. I'm going to delete that, and then if you want to deselect a range of sheets, you, then you just go ahead and click a sheet not in the range. Now let me go back to summary and I'll show you how to write a three-dimensional formula. I'm going to start in B4. What I want to do is add cell B4 from all four of these sheets and put the answer on the summary sheet. You're going to start with equals so that it knows it's writing a formula. We're going to put in the function, the word sum, which means add. And make sure you have the open parenthesis because remember all ranges have to be in parentheses. It's easy to forget that one step. Now I'm going to click on the first sheet that I want to add from. Then I'm going to click the cell I'd like Excel to add for me. And the only thing left now is to say add the rest of these sheets. To get the range, I'm going to hold Shift and click South America. Now I'm going to hit the Enter key. Don't click over on the summary sheet because then that will just replace whatever you typed in. I'm just hitting Enter and now I've got 900. Now let me open up this formula so you can see what it looks like. Notice it says you want to add the range Australia through South America and on all four of those sheets you want to add cell B4. Let me do a couple more so you can get the feel for how this works. We'll do our software. I'm going to start with equals. I'm going to put in the function, in this case the word sum. Make sure you have the open parenthesis. Go to the first sheet you want to add from. Click in the cell you'd like to add. Hold Shift and click South America. Then just hit the Enter key. One more. I'm going to add the furniture. I'll start with equals. I want to have the word sum, which is the function in there, and then an open parenthesis. I'm going to click the first sheet I'm adding from. I'm going to click in B6, hold Shift and click South America, and then hit the Enter key. And you get the idea that you just do them all the exact same way. Now you can just do one and then use your fill handle to copy the others down. Once you've copied them down, then you can pick the fill handle back up and go across. But make sure that first one's correct because remember if it's wrong, they're all going to be wrong. And this is something you just have to practice. Once you do two or three and you get it, you'll realize it's super easy to do. But just make sure you watch the video and go back through the exact steps that I did and you'll be able to do it perfectly. If you didn't have the four sheets set up the exact same, you would have to manually go to each sheet and tell it which cell to add. You wouldn't be able to do a range that way. We finished with module 9 now and we talked in this module about working with your sheets. And these are your sheet tabs that you see at the bottom of your file here. What I'm going to have you do is go through the first five of these sheets and rename each one to the actual division that they represent. Like this one will be Australia, this one will be Europe, and so forth. Sheet 5 is a summary sheet. Make sure you rename that as well. I want you to go ahead and add a sheet. I want you to add one in front of sheet 4. That's going to give you another sheet. Then I'm going to have you delete that sheet as well. 
Also, the summary sheet, I want you to make it red. You can just change the color of that tab so that that one stands out. The last thing I'm going to have you do is write a three-dimensional formula. And if you remember, a three-dimensional formula is one that spans several sheets. What you're going to do is on this summary sheet starting in B4, you're going to write a formula that tells Excel to add B4 from all of these sheets and put the answer on sheet 5, which will be summary. If you forget how to do this, go back and look at section 3 where we went through 3D formulas. Once you've got that down pat, then you can move over to module 10 and we'll look at formatting our worksheets. Hello there and a very warm welcome to this course on PowerPoint 2019. My name is Deborah Ashby and I'm going to be your host for this course. I'm an IT trainer and a Microsoft subject matter expert, so hopefully that qualifies me to be talking through this course with you today. And I'm very excited to be teaching you all of the new features and wonderful things that you can do in PowerPoint 2019. Now, just to explain, if you are coming from an earlier version of PowerPoint, this course will probably suit you fine if you are using PowerPoint 2013 or 2016. There are some differences in the new version, but the differences are very minor. So there is a lot of crossover with the last two versions. So if you do happen to have one of those older versions, but you're going through this course, then the majority of this course is going to be absolutely fine for you to work through. I will try and highlight as we go through if there is anything that I'm telling you that's specific to PowerPoint 2019. So just be aware of that as we go through. Now, before we jump into the content, I just want to give you an idea as to what to expect in this course, because you're probably very curious. This might be the first time that you're doing an online course, so you might have a bit of trepidation. But trust me, I'm not going to throw you in at the deep end. We are going to start right at the beginning with the basics. We're going to build that skill level up until we're pretty much getting towards those advanced topics. So let me just give you a rundown of what to expect. Now, this isn't by all means a comprehensive list. These are just some high level topics that I've put onto a list. We're going to be covering a lot more than this, as you'll see when we go through. But we are going to start out with the basics. So the very basics of navigation, creating blank presentations and starting all from scratch. I'm going to talk you through some best practices when it comes to using PowerPoint. So best practice regarding things like colors, animation, bullet points, how much text to use, what kind of imagery you should be using, all really, really important things to consider when you're putting together a PowerPoint presentation. We're of course going to look at how you can add in new slides and the different slide layouts you can use and how you can edit those slides and build up a really nice looking presentation. We're going to add some pizzazz with graphics. So we're going to add pictures and icons and 3D models, which are new to 2019. We're going to add animation to make it more engaging and also media files like video and audio. And finally, at the end of the course, I'm going to show you how you can present your presentation to an audience. So lots of really interesting stuff in here. I am very excited about taking you through this course. I absolutely love PowerPoint and I hope by the end of this course, you will too. So all that remains is for us to jump into the next section where we'll just have a quick word about the exercise files we're going to use in this course and then we'll get started. So I'll see you in the next section. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section, we're going to be taking a look at navigating around a PowerPoint presentation. And I'm going to just introduce to you some of the main aspects of the screen and some things that can really help improve your efficiency when we're working in PowerPoint. Now, what you can see on the screen here, I currently have what we call normal view showing on the screen. And in normal view, what you can see are the main slides. So this is the slide that I'm currently clicked on. 
And I can also see in the left hand pane, I have little mini previews of the other slides that make up my presentation. Now, as I said, this is what we classify as normal view. And this in general is the view that you work in when you're making edits to your PowerPoint presentation. Now, obviously, with a lot of PowerPoint presentations, the end aim is to display those presentations. So either we might be presenting to an audience or we might be wrapping it up in a PowerPoint presentation for somebody else to run. And if you think about it, if I was presenting this to an audience, I don't really want them to see the view that I currently have. So I really just want them to focus on the current slide. I don't want them to be able to see all of the other slides down the side or the ribbon or anything along those lines. Now, in order to do that, what we do is we switch our PowerPoint presentation into what we call slideshow view. And again, there are a couple of different ways you can switch between different views. The first one I'm going to show you is probably the simplest. If you cast your eyes down to the bottom right hand corner, you'll see down here we have a number of little icons. And as I hover over them, you can see that one says normal, which is the view that we're in now. We have slide sort of view, which I'll talk about a bit later. We have reading view. Again, I'll talk about that a bit later. And then finally, we have slideshow view. So let's click on that one. And now this takes me into what the audience is going to see. I can then easily navigate between my slides so I can move them on or I can move them back depending on what I want to show at that particular time. Now, in order to navigate through my presentation, again, there are a couple of different ways that I can do this. I can click my mouse to move me onto the next slide. Or alternatively, what I can do is just use the arrow keys on my keyboard, either the one going to the right to move forward or the one going to the left to move back. So it's really up to you which one of those methods you choose. If I want to jump out of my presentation, so maybe I finished it or maybe I want to make some edits, I can just press the escape key on my keyboard and that will take me back to that normal view. By using those icons in the bottom right hand corner. There is an alternative way of moving through your views and that is by using the ribbon. So again, if I go up to the view ribbon, you can see the first group there, presentation views, that has normal, outline, slide sorter, and I have a couple of other views in there as well, notes page and reading pane. So I can easily switch between my views from there as well. Now, what you might notice there is that we don't actually have a slideshow view. You'll find that on a separate tab. So again, we have a tab here called slideshow, and you'll see in this first group here called start slideshow, we have a choice. We can start our slideshow from the beginning. So if I was to click that, it starts it from the beginning and remember escape to come out. And you'll also notice as I hover over, there is a shortcut key to start the slideshow from the beginning. So sometimes that's a little bit easier and more efficient as well. So the shortcut key here would be F5. I could also choose to start my slideshow from the current slide. So what we mean by that is whichever one I'm clicked on. So if I was clicked on slide four and I was to choose from current slide, it's going to run the slideshow from that particular slide and escape to come out. So a couple of different options in there for you when it comes to running your slideshow. So now I'd just like to talk a little bit about the actual slides that you're using. I would say that when you are creating a presentation, it's really important to think about the layout of your presentation. And it's also really important to have a title slide to introduce the topic to the audience. So you can see here in my example, we have Wanderlust Travel, and then I have a subtitle underneath, Unleash the Explorer Within. And that really just introduces the topic that I'm about to talk about to the audience. Another thing to watch out for when you're creating PowerPoint presentations is to be consistent with the fonts that you're using. So I would advise against having lots of different types of fonts. You really just want to keep it consistent so that it flows throughout the presentation. Now, one of the things we're going to talk about over the next few modules is slide layout. And I just want to show you a little bit about what I mean by that. If I go to slide two, You'll see what I have here is a title, so where it says, why choose us? And then underneath I have some bullet points. 
And this slide is actually a completely different layout to the previous slide. So this first one is what we call a title slide layout. And this second one is a title and content, the content being these bullet points down here. And this is something I'm going to delve into in the next few modules to show you exactly all the different types of slide layout that you have. Now again, when it comes to titles, I would always recommend that you do put a title at the top of each slide. And the reason for that is, if you imagine you're giving a presentation, you have an audience, it's fairly common for people to get slightly distracted. Maybe they look at their phone, maybe they just zone out for a moment. You want to make sure that whenever they come back to you, that they know exactly what you're talking about at any given time and they can quickly pick up again from where they left off. So that's why it's so important to make sure that each slide has some kind of title or something that indicates what that slide is all about. Now, as I said, what we've got here is a title and content slide, and I currently have some bullet points in that slide. And it's worth noting that you can have up to five levels of bullets in a slide. So here I have what we call first level bullets. And if I was to move to slide three, you'll see I have some first and some second level bullets. In this case, they're both the same. You might find with some templates or layouts that the second uh, indented bullet is a slightly different icon, but in this case they're the same. But you can distinctly see that there is a difference between those first and second bullets by the indentation. Let's take a look at some other things that we have in this presentation. If I go to slide four, again I have my title at the top, and what I've got on this slide is something we call smart art. And again, this is something I'm going to go through with you a bit later on in the course, but this is just a nice way to add some kind of process flow, or maybe if you want to add an organizational chart or something along those lines, smart art is something that's a really good thing to use for doing those kinds of things. So you can see here, I've got it illustrating the booking process. Underneath that, I also have some images. Now, these are actually a fairly new thing that have been added to PowerPoint 2019. These are called icons, and you'll find them on the insert ribbon, along with all of your drawings and your shapes. And this is a library full of really nice little icons that you can add into your presentation, and they're all completely editable. So if I click on one of the icons just there, you'll see at the top, I now get the graphics format contextual ribbon, which will allow me to make any changes I want to that particular icon. You can see there I can change the color, I can do all sorts of things with it. So icons are a really nice way to add a visual element into your presentation. Let's look at the next slide, slide five. Here again I have that title at the top, but this time I've inserted a couple of pictures and I might have inserted them from the web or I may have had them stored off onto my PC. I'm going to show you how to insert pictures using both of those techniques. Move on to slide six. Now I have something slightly different on here. And again, this is a feature that's relatively new in PowerPoint 2019. And these are what we call 3D models. And they're actually pretty cool. What I can do is if I click on this backpack, for example, you see I get this little icon in the middle, which is a, a rotation, and it's actually a 3D image, so I can rotate it any way I like and set it just so. So that's a really, again, a really nice way to add a high quality, I guess you would call a vector graphic that you can rotate into your PowerPoint presentation. So those are quite fun to explore as well. Let's move down to the next slide. Again, we have something slightly different in this one. We have the title, but then we have a chart. So if you're used to using charts in Excel or inserting charts, then this works in a fairly similar way. You'll see when we do start to insert charts, you're actually using a kind of preview of an Excel spreadsheet in order to get the figures in to create this chart in PowerPoint. So that's a really nice way of displaying, in this case, sales figures by country. Moving down to slide eight, again, something slightly different. We have our title about us 
And then what I have underneath there is just again some smart art, but I'm using it in a slightly different way than before. I'm using it in combination with a picture. And again, you'll see when we go into the smart art library, you'll see there are a few layouts in there or a few diagrams you can insert, which also allow you to insert pictures. So again, a really nice way of illustrating that about us section. And finally, this is just my finished slide. So I'm encouraging them to book now. I'm letting them know that they'll get a 20% discount if they're a new customer. And you can see that's a bullet point. And again, I've just inserted a picture directly into my slide. So lots of different elements that make up my PowerPoint presentation, which make it into a really nice visually appealing presentation that flows. It's consistent in its color and in its font. Now we are going to move into how you edit presentations. And just remember that if you want to edit a particular slide, all you need to do is when you're in normal view, which we are now, just make sure you're clicked on the slide that you want to edit. And then you can go to town and do whatever you like within that particular slide. So that's the basics of navigating around a first PowerPoint presentation. In the next section, we're going to move on to looking at the desktop and I will be giving you an overview of the desktop screen so you know exactly what all the buttons do, which will help you navigate and create your PowerPoint presentations slightly more efficiently. So I will see you then. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section, I'm going to give you an overview of the desktop screen and the views. Now, what we're looking at here is that same PowerPoint presentation that we've been looking at in the previous modules, the Wanderlust Travel slide deck. And I just want to start by giving you a quick tour around the desktop screen so you understand what the ribbons and all of the icons do. So starting right at the top, you'll see where we have wanderlusttravel.pptx. So this is the name of your PowerPoint presentation. It's the name that you've saved this presentation as, and we're going to be looking at how to save presentations in the following modules. Underneath that, we have our menus or our ribbons. So you can see here currently, I'm clicked on home, and that gives me different groups, which contain different groups of commands that I can use. You'll see here I have insert as I move across, which will allow me to insert things into my presentation. And then I have all of these different ribbons that I can use. I'm not going to go through all of them right at the moment. Just be aware that there they are located just underneath that title. Now, if we move just below our ribbons, you'll see that I have a group of icons just here. Now, these icons are actually located on what we call the quick access toolbar. And the quick access toolbar is pretty much what it says on the tin. It allows you to very quickly access commands that you use frequently. And you'll have different commands on this toolbar. There is a, a default set of commands. So you might have undo, redo and save. But you can customize this toolbar to contain any command that's available to you in PowerPoint. Now, if I go across to the little drop down arrow at the end, when I hover over, it says customize quick access toolbar. If I click on that, what you'll see is a drop down menu, which is showing me the 10 most frequently used commands that I might want to add to my quick access toolbar. And you can see that some of them have ticks next to them, which means that they're already added onto that toolbar. So, for example, if I find myself uh, emailing presentations fairly frequently, instead of hunting around for the email button within PowerPoint, I could just add it to my quick access toolbar. And then I have a quick way of very quickly emailing that presentation. Now, it's worth noting that I'm not only limited to adding these few commands to my quick access toolbar, I can add any command. And again, there are a couple of different ways that I can do that. Let's go for the first simpler way. And that is if you find a command on any of the ribbons. So, for example, if I jump to the insert ribbon and maybe I decide that I add quite a lot of pictures into my PowerPoint presentations, if I want to add the pictures icon or command to my quick access toolbar, all I need to do is right click and select add to quick access toolbar. And you can see there it is on the end. 
Another way that I can add commands to the Quick Access Toolbar is again utilizing that drop down arrow and going to More Commands. Now this will actually take me into the PowerPoint options and you can see that I have Quick Access Toolbar highlighted in the list on the left hand side. What I've then got is in this first list where it says popular commands, I then have all of the commands which belong to that popular commands group. So these would be the ones that are used most frequently. If I want a list of all of the commands available in PowerPoint, again, I can click the drop down and I can select all commands and that will give me a very, very long list of every command available in PowerPoint in alphabetical order. And what I can then do is I can then find the command that I want. So maybe it's this one here, align text. And I can add that to my quick access toolbar directly from here. So if you glance over to the right hand side, you'll see it says at the top, customize quick access toolbar. And then I have listed there all of the commands that are currently on that toolbar. And all I would need to do is to click the add button in the middle, which will move align text over to the right hand side of the screen. Click on OK, and you can now see I have that Align Text button on my Quick Access Toolbar. So a couple of different ways that you can customize that to really increase or improve your efficiency when working in PowerPoint. Now, if we move up to the top right hand corner of the screen, you can see you've got my name there. So that's telling me the account that I'm currently logged in with. I also have a little ribbon display options button, and if I click it, you'll see I get a drop down with some other options in there. So I can choose to hide the ribbon. And that just gives me more screen real estate with which to work on my PowerPoint presentation. Now, I'm not saying that this is something I use all that frequently, because obviously you can't see your ribbons or your commands, but it is there if you just need a little bit of extra space. Now to get those ribbons back, if I click the icon in the top for ribbon display options, and I can select Show Tabs and Commands. It's worth noting that there is another option in there which will just allow you to show the tabs, so I can see those tabs but not the ribbons below, until I click on them. Okay, so it's really entirely up to you with regards to how you display those ribbons and tabs. I then have next to that option, I have the Minimize button, which will just minimize my presentation down into the system tray. And then alternatively, I also have the restore down, which will just make my screen a little bit smaller. And then of course, I always have my close button in the top corner. Now moving to the main bulk of our screen. So in the middle, obviously I have the slide that I currently have selected and you can see the rest of my slides in the pane on the left hand side. We covered this in the previous module. And right down in the bottom left hand corner, I have a little bit of information that I might find useful. So it's telling me, that currently I'm clicked on slide one of nine. If I click on number four, it's going to change to slide four of nine. It's telling me that there are no spelling errors so far found in this presentation. And it's also telling me my language. So currently I have my language set to English United States. Now moving across to the right hand side of the screen. The first thing you'll see here is something that says notes. Now if I click on notes, you'll see that I get a click to add notes pane display at the bottom. Now it's not too big at the moment and you'll see if I hover over the border or the line, I do get that double headed arrow. So I can just drag my notes section up if I want to. And if you're not familiar with the notes section in PowerPoint, all it means is that you can click in here and you can add any note that you like related to the slide. So I might want to say, uh, let's keep it simple the booking process. Now you might be wondering why this is actually useful and it is worth noting that any notes that you make on your slides don't show when you run the slideshow so your audience aren't going to see all of your notes. Now the good thing about notes is that you can print them separately to your slides and have them as speakers notes which is really helpful if you're giving a presentation. You can also choose to print the slide with the notes below. Not only is that useful for you, but also for the people that are attending your presentation. You might want to hand them out um, your slide and have the notes below so that they've got those notes. Alternatively, what you could do is you could just leave this notes area blank 
and print off the slide and the notes and that will give them a space underneath the slide to write any notes that they want. So notes are a really useful feature for your audience and also for the presenter. Now, if you don't want any notes on your PowerPoint presentation, you can get rid of this notes pane. And the way that I always do it is I just drag it all the way down right to the bottom. The next button that you have is a comments button. So if I click comments, I get a pane pop out on the right hand side. And this is where I can add any notes or any comments that I want other people to see. And this is particularly useful if you're collaborating with others on a presentation. I can add my notes in there. Somebody else, my colleague, might go into the presentation and they can see my notes and also add their own comments as well. So comments can be a really useful little function to add. Then next to comments, we're sticking in the bottom right hand corner. This is where we then have our views. And if you remember, we went through views in the previous module. But let's take a look at some of the ones that we didn't take a look at earlier. Now, normal view, as we know, that's the view we're in now. This is where we would most likely come to make any edits to our slides. The next view we have is slide sorter view. And this gives you a completely different way of displaying your slides or looking at your slide deck. And the way that I tend to utilize this is I tend to come into here if I want to do a lot of rearranging of slides. So if I want to maybe move slides around, I just find it a lot easier to see in this view. It is worth noting that you can still move slides around when you're in normal view, again, just by dragging and dropping the way you want to be. But I tend to get a better overview if I'm in slide sort of view. Another reason you might come into this view would be when you start adding animations or transitions onto your slides. This is the view where you can see if a slide has any kind of transition on it. And what I mean by transition is the way that the slides move between each other. You might have some kind of effect on there and you can see the effects when you're in slide sort of view. Now, I don't have any effects applied at the moment. I will do later on, which is why you can't currently see that. But you'll see what I mean as we move through this course. The next view that we have is reading view. And again, this is just another way of viewing your slides. So again, it makes it nice and big on the screen. I can click my mouse to move through my slides. Alternatively, I can use my arrows, so my left arrow or my right arrow to move through my slides. And then finally, we have that slideshow view, which again is the view you're most likely to use if you're presenting to an audience. And remember, to come out of slideshow view, you just want to press the escape key on your keyboard. And then finally, what we have on the end here is a zoom control. So we have plus and minus and it says 100% currently. Let me go back into normal view for a moment. And I'm just going to use the zoom slider and you can see as I zoom in and out, it makes my presentation or my slide bigger or smaller. So you can really kind of customize it to what suits you. And very finally on the end, we have this little square which says fit slide to current window. So if I click on that, it's just going to resize my slide to exactly the right fit for the window that I'm using. So again, that can be quite a useful thing just to get that sizing perfect. So that's about it. That's an overview of the desktop and some of the buttons and icons that you'll find on the desktop. In the next section, I'm going to set you an exercise and it's a very simple exercise. I just want you to open the file attached and use slide sorter and some of the different ways of moving around just to get familiar with it before we move on to the next section. So I will see you then. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. It's now time for exercise one, and this is going to be a very simple exercise. All I want you to do is to open this file called wanderlusttravel.pptx, and I want you to run the slideshow as I'm doing here. And what I want you to do is just to pay close attention to the slides and the different layouts of the slides, and also close attention to the bulleted items. And really the idea here is just to get a feel of the different slide layouts and how you can add different elements into your slides 
and also just to practice some of those navigation techniques. So feel free to run the slideshow, move back and forth, come out of the slideshow, go into slide sort of view, all of those types of things. So really just become comfortable with the presentation that you're looking at before we move on into some of the more intermediate modules. So that's it, very straightforward. I will see you in the next section. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. Now, before we jump into creating a brand new presentation, I just want to take a little bit of time to review some presentation tips and guidelines that are really gonna help you when it comes to creating that very first PowerPoint presentation. And the thing I'd like to talk to you about first is the use of colors. Now, when it comes to the use of color in your presentation, this is something you really need to give some thought to, preferably before you start creating your presentation. It's really important that the color scheme that you go with, that everything ties together. So from the headings, the background colors, any bullets that you use, all of the colors should tie together nicely so that it looks like a cohesive presentation. And when it comes to the types of colors that you should be using, I would always say that subtle colors create trust with your audience. So we're talking about colors like blues, browns, blacks. Also, bright colors tend to create a dramatic impact. So if you really want something to stand out and draw people's attention, then red is always a good color to use for that. It's also good to consider where you're going to be doing your presentation. So if you're going to be doing this or presenting it to an audience, it's worth considering the light in the room. And you want to make sure that you're using colors that can be easily seen by everyone in the audience. So if it's a particularly bright room, maybe you want to darken those colors, or if it's quite a dark room, you might want to use more like a white background and dark text. So it's worth checking out the room first, just to see the kinds of colors that you should use in your presentation. I would also say to use good contrast colors in your presentation as well. And what I mean by that is if you have, for example, a blue background, then something like neon green font is not going to look good on a blue background. You want to maybe stick to a light background with dark text. So of course, white and black is always good for that or other good contrast colors. So really think about that and make sure that the text is clear so that people can see it. Another important point is to never use red and green next to each other. And this is for people who suffer with uh, color blindness. So red and green can easily be confused and they can also tend to look the same to people who have uh, problems distinguishing uh, red from green. So make sure that you don't put them next to each other on a presentation. And also, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's important to keep your colors consistent throughout the presentation. If you don't, it just ends up like it's something that you've thrown together without too much thought. So do make sure that everything flows through nicely. So now let's move on to talking about fonts that you use in your presentation. As a general rule, your title should be size 44, which might seem quite large to you. But again, remember, if you're presenting this in particularly in a large room, then you're going to want to make sure that that font is big enough so that people even in the back of the room can see it clearly. So a general guideline would be title size 44 and any subtitles that you have size 32. If you've just got regular text on the screen, then size 28 is good. So the text that you can see on my screen right now for these bullet points is all size 28. In general, I would steer clear of very small fonts. So for example, if you were working in Word and you were typing a document, you might find that font size 10, 11 or 12 is perfectly fine for that. But when it comes to your PowerPoint presentation, you want to make it a lot bigger. I would also say don't use more than three different fonts per presentation. In general, when I'm doing a presentation, I tend to stick to the same font throughout just because I think that looks better. But if you do require more than one font, then try not to go above three. Otherwise, again, it can start to look a little bit messy and a little bit like you've just thrown it together. Let's now talk about words. So the words that you have on your slides. Again, another general guideline is six to eight words per line. The thing that I've found when I see people's presentations is that people tend to like to put everything they're going to say on the slide. And really, that's not the intention of PowerPoint. 
PowerPoint is really there to serve as a reminder, some bullet points, some notes for you. So keep it short, keep it sweet. It's just there so that you can elaborate on the points that are on the screen. So keep it short. If you do have a lot of text that you don't necessarily want to put on the slide, then it's a good idea to utilize the handout so you can add more text on there if required and you can hand those out to your audience either before the session or after the session. And I always say that less text is better. You really don't want to confront people with a wall of words. I think we've all heard that phrase death by PowerPoint when you're kind of sitting there in a presentation and all you have is this big screen full of words. It's quite hard to read what's on the screen and concentrate on what the speaker is saying. So less text is better. And a way that I kind of combat that when I'm doing a presentation is that I tend to use images instead of words. So I might have a nice big image on the screen that illustrates my point, and then I will talk through the image and I will say what I need to say without having it all written on the slide. So just some points there to consider when you're thinking about the placement of your words and what words you're going to put on your slides. Bullet points. Now, you can see here in this slide, I have some bullet points. And again, in general, four to six bulleted items per slide. You don't have to cram as many bulleted items on a slide as possible. If you do have quite a few, then please just use another slide, okay? And also remember that you can have up to five levels of bullets. Sometimes that's quite nice to use as well because it just gives it a little bit of structure. And again, to keep things consistent, if you're going to use some kind of picture or even a symbol like I have here, make sure you use the same bullet picture per level. Again, just to keep things consistent and flowing through. Templates. Now, again, I'm using a template here in this presentation and you may decide to choose one of the ones that are available in PowerPoint or you might have your own, maybe your own company template that you like to use. But in general, I tend to keep my templates really, really simple. I don't want too many bells and whistles and things that are going to distract away from my presentation. I also try to limit the number of lines, textures and other effects. I think there is a little bit of a temptation, particularly when we've just learned some new cool tricks in PowerPoint to try and add as much into our presentations as possible. And sometimes really the old adage, less is more. So keep it minimal, keep it simple. I'm a big fan of using images and graphics in my PowerPoint presentations. As I mentioned, sometimes I just like to have a large image on the screen and then talk through my points. So I would definitely recommend looking at the way that you can use graphics, pictures, those icons, 3D models, and also charts to enhance the template and the presentation. And again, going back to text slides, try to avoid using more than three in a row. So again, don't just have 10 slides full of plain text to present to people. Try and break it up with the odd image slide as well, just to make it a little bit more interesting and prevent people from snoozing off when you're in the middle of your presentation. So that's it. Those are the major tips I have when creating presentations. What we're going to do in the next section is we're going to jump in and we're going to start creating our first PowerPoint presentation, bearing in mind those tips that we've just learned. So join me for that. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section, we're going to take a look at creating a new presentation. Now, this might be the first time that you're ever creating a new presentation. It might be that you've edited presentations before. So if someone sent you a presentation, maybe you've been able to go in and make the required edits, but perhaps you've never created one from scratch. And that's what we're going to cover in this module. Now, there are a couple of different ways that you can create a new presentation, and you can see here on the screen, I already have a blank presentation open. Now, what I can do from this point is I can go one of two ways. I can either apply a design to this blank presentation, make it look a little bit more interesting than it currently does. Or if I was creating from scratch, I could go to the file tab, which will take me into that backstage area and select the new option. And what you'll see there is a whole bunch of templates that you can select from. And these templates are actually organized into different categories. And you can see some suggested searches at the top here. So if I was looking for a template that was business related, I could click on business 
and it's going to search the database and show me a whole load of presentations that are suitable for business use. And you can see there, there's some really, really nice ones in PowerPoint 2019. They seem to get better with every new release of PowerPoint. So it really depends what you're looking for. Now, one thing I would say when you're trying to decide on a template to use is to really give a long, hard think to those rules, those tips and guidelines that we discussed in the previous module. And your template that you choose really should be suitable for your audience. So again, if it's a business presentation, you don't want to choose a template that's going to be too jokey or too casual or maybe has font which isn't appropriate. So just bear those tips in mind when you're trying to decide which template to use. Now, at this stage, I'm not going to choose one of these templates. I'm just going to click the arrow at the top to go back to my blank presentation. What I'm going to do instead is apply a design to this blank presentation that I have here. So I'm going to go to the design ribbon. And again, you can see I have a whole bunch of themes that I can choose from. And if I click the drop down arrow, this will show me all of the themes that I have access to. And as you hover over them, you'll see you get a live preview in the slideshow itself. So you get a really good idea as to what that's going to look like. Now I'm just going to apply this one here, which is called iron. And what you'll notice is that now I have this theme applied. What I can do is if I decide that maybe I don't like the background color particularly, what you'll see is that when you apply a theme, you then get this additional group called variants. And again, if I click the drop down, um, I can see for this one, there's only actually four variants, which we have listed there. I could change it to a blue theme instead. So it's essentially the same theme. I'm just changing that background color scheme to something a little bit different. And of course, as with everything, you can go in and customize even further if you wanted to. So again, if you didn't particularly like these colors, you could go in and define the colors that you want to use. But in this case, I'm fairly happy with using the blue one. Now, one thing that's worth remembering is that if you've already put several slides in the presentation and you've maybe changed the fonts, anything you have manually changed, applying a design theme may override that. So what I would suggest is that it is really best to pick your theme up front before you start making changes to any slides that you have. So that's a quick tip to bear in mind when you're thinking about applying themes to your presentation. So that's pretty much it. We have our two ways. We can either start with a new blank presentation. So let me go to file and go to new. And the blank presentation is literally what we started out with. So you can either start from this point and apply a design and then choose a variance. Or you can start with a template if you wanted to, a template of your choice by selecting it from the list. So now we know how to create a new presentation. What we're going to talk about in the next section is how we work with slides. So please join me for that. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In the previous section, we created a brand new presentation and you can see it here on the screen. It just has that design template that I applied showing. And what we want to do now in this section is to add some new slides. And the first slide in general in your presentation will always be a title slide. And you really do want to make sure that you don't delete this out, that you always have some kind of title slide. It acts as like a cover to a book, I guess you would say. So it gives the audience um, an idea of what the presentation is going to be about. And it's just nice to have up there if you're presenting this presentation, just to have it up on the screen behind you again. So the audience knows exactly what they're in for in the presentation. Now it's worth noting that you can have multiple title slides in the presentation if you like. So for example, your presentation might be about three different topics and you might want to have a title slide before each new topic begins. And that's perfectly fine. And we're going to take a look at that later on in the course. But for now, we're going to concentrate on this presentation. So what we have here is a title slide. And I'm just going to start by adding some text into that title slide. So it's a very simple case of clicking in the placeholder. And I'm going to say Wonderlust. 
travel. And you can see underneath it says click to add a subtitle. So again, I'm going to add a quick subtitle in here and just click away. And now I have a very nice looking title slide. So what I want to do now is I want to expand my presentation. I want to add another slide in. Now I've already got a title slide, so I don't want to add another one at this stage. So I'm going to go up to my home ribbon and in the slides group, you can see I have a drop down that says new slide. And what this is showing me is all of the different slide layouts that I have access to. So you can see the first one there, if I hover over, is title slide. And that's what I currently have applied in my presentation. I then have title and content. So this will allow me to add a title in. And then I have various different pieces of content that I can add into that slide as well. So that might be a picture. It might be a chart. It might be some kind of diagram. I then have a section header slide a two content slide. So again, if I want a title running across the top and then two separate pieces of content, I might want to use that one. I have a comparison slide layout, title only. I have a completely blank slide if I don't want any of the placeholders on there. I have content with caption, picture with caption, so on and so forth. Now it's worth noting that when you go into this new slide drop down, you might not necessarily see all of the slide layouts that I'm showing you right now. Some of these slide layouts are assigned to the different design templates. So depending on which design you've applied will determine which layouts you see down below. But these first ones at the top here are in general, the ones that you'll see in every single layout that you use. So for my next slide, I'm going to choose a title and content slide. And you can see there it's given me slide two in that left hand pane. And I now have two placeholders. So the first one is for my title and the second one is for my content. And it says I can add text so I could click there and I will have bullet pointed text. Or alternatively, I can choose to insert any of these elements into this slide. So it might be a table a chart, a smart art graphic, video, online pictures, or a picture which I can browse to on my PC. Now I'm going to add a title in here and I'm going to say, why choose us? And now what I'm going to do is add in some text. So I'm going to click where it says click to add text. And I'm going to say um, over 100 destinations. And it's worth noting that if you don't want this text to be bulleted, you can just click and also just turn off those bullets. So if you go up to the home ribbon and into the paragraph group, you can see currently I have my bullets turned on. If I just click that icon again, it will remove that bullet from the slide. But I'm actually quite happy having those bullets in. So I'm going to put it back and I'm just going to add another bullet point. So when I hit my enter key, it's automatically going to give me another bullet on the same level as the previous one. So I'm going to say dedicated travel team. And as this is just an example, I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to insert yet another slide. So I'm going to go back up to new slide. And again, I'm going to select a title and content slide. And I'm going to click and add another title. So this one is going to be Wanderlust Travel Benefits. And my text here is going to be 20% discount for all new customers. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to hit the Enter key, which again is going to give me that secondary bullet point. But what if I want a, a second level bullet? So if I want this one to be indented, so it looks like it comes beneath the line of text that I've just typed in. Well, it's very simple to do. All you need to do is press the tab key on your keyboard and that will tab that bullet in like so. Now, if I've done that and I then think to myself, actually, I don't want that to be a second level bullet. I'd like it to be a first level bullet. All I need to do is do shift and tab and that will move that back and make that a first level bullet. So just remember that tab key makes it a second or even a third level bullet and then shift tab to move back through those levels of bullets.
So that's the basics of some slide layouts and also using those bullets and some shortcut keys for indenting your text. Now in the following sections, we're going to be doing things like inserting pictures, graphics, smart art, icons, all of that fun stuff. But for the time being, that's the end of this section. I will see you in the next one. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section, I want to talk to you very quickly about saving a presentation because that is one thing that we haven't done yet. And the thing that you don't want to do is spend a lot of time working on a presentation, forget to save it, and then maybe something happens and you lose all of your hard work. So we want to make sure that we save our presentation at the beginning and then we regularly save it so that we don't lose any of our most recent changes. And I'm going to show you a couple of different ways and a couple of different saving locations. Now, before we get on to that, just following on from the previous section, I just want to show you a couple of little tips and tricks within these slides before we save. So essentially what I'm going to do is make a change to this presentation and then we're going to save it. Now, where we left off, we had these three slides that we've inserted with our different layouts. I just want to show you a really quick way of inserting a slide, but almost duplicating the slide layout. Now, as we've seen, if we want to insert another, for example, title and content slide, I could go up to new slide and I could select my title and content slide, which is perfectly fine but I'm going to show you a different way of doing it. So I'm going to click on the undo on my quick access toolbar. And what I'm going to do this time is that I know that this slide here, slide three, is a title and content slide layout. And maybe the next slide is going to be reasonably similar to this one. What I could do if I wanted to is duplicate this slide. And the easiest way of doing that is just by pressing Control D on your keyboard, and it will essentially duplicate that slide and give you an exact copy for you to work on. So it's going to be exactly the same text. If you've got any images in there, those will be carried over as well. And it's also exactly the same slide layout. So I just wanted to mention that because that's personally something that I find myself doing all the time. I tend to duplicate if I'm going to be using the same slide layout. Another thing I wanted to quickly show you is now that I've inserted this duplicate copy, I actually don't really need this slide, so I'm going to delete it out of my presentation. And again, there's always a few different ways that you can do these things in Microsoft. I could right click on the slide and in that menu, I have a delete slide option. You'll also see just above I have duplicate slides, so I could select that instead of doing control D. Alternatively, probably the easiest way is just to hit the delete key on your keyboard to get rid of that slide. Nice and simple and straightforward. So now let's look at saving this presentation. I'm going to go up to my file tab, which takes me into the backstage area. And immediately you'll see in this list, I have save and I have save as. So I'm going to select save as. And this takes me to my different save locations. And it really is entirely up to you where you save your presentation to. Now, what I have up here is you can see I have the option of saving into OneDrive. And if you're not familiar with OneDrive, that is Microsoft's cloud storage. So if you have an Office 365 account, you definitely have access to OneDrive cloud storage. And this tends to be where I save all of my files. I save them up into the cloud so that I can access them wherever I am, as long as I've got an internet connection. Alternatively, I've got a SharePoint site that I could save into, and I'm not going to go into that too much, but it is another place that I could save my file. And then underneath in this other locations area, I can select to save to this PC. So if you want to save it to a folder that you have on your PC, so maybe to the desktop or my documents or something like that, I could choose to add a place, so a different network location if I wanted to. Or I can select browse. If I'm not too sure, it will allow me to browse around. So let me click on browse. And this should look fairly familiar to most of you. It pops up that file explorer and I can then decide on which location I want to save my file into. And I'm actually going to save into OneDrive. So I'm just going to navigate to the correct folder. 
and this looks good enough for me. I'm going to give my file a name. So I'm just going to call this my presentation. And you can see the save as type is defaulted to .pptx. And that is the default file extension for any file that you save into PowerPoint. Let's just have a quick look at what's in that drop down. So if I click on the arrow, you can see I have lots of different other file formats I could save in. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but some of these I might want to highlight would be if you're using a particularly old version of PowerPoint, you might want to save it as a 97 to 2003 presentation. Or if you're saving this as a template, so if you want to reuse it again, you might want to save it as a .potx file or a PowerPoint template. But I'm going to stick with the default, which is dot pptx and I'm going to click on save and what you'll see is that once you've saved your presentation the name that you gave it will now appear in the top bar so you can see at the top here it says my presentation dot pptx I'm now fairly safe and fairly confident that I can work on this presentation and as long as I save at regular intervals then I know that I'm not going to lose my work if anything bad was to happen so again, if you are working away and you want to quickly save to your file, you can just do the sh keyboard shortcut Control S to save, or alternatively, you can click on the save icon, which you'll have there on your quick access toolbar. That is one of the default icons that is added onto there. And you can see there, it also does show you that keyboard shortcut Control S. So that wraps up saving a presentation. Very straightforward, very simple. What we're going to do next is an exercise. So let's jump over there now so I can talk you through that. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. We've made it down to exercise 02 and I actually have a few instructions for you in order for you to complete this exercise. So what I want you to do for me is I want you to create a PowerPoint presentation from scratch. I want you to apply the theme called Berlin to your presentation. And I want you to add the title sales presentation and the subtitle 2018 sales and expenses. What I then want you to do is to add a second slide and that needs to be a two content layout slide. And what we're going to pretend is that once we've added that slide, it's going to be the wrong layout. So I want you to change the layout of that second slide from two contents to title and content layout. What I then want you to do on that slide is to add these three first level bullets. So one for sales, one for expenses, and then one for profits. I then want you to add this second level bullet underneath sales. So I want you to add something that says new southeastern region as a second level bullet. And then finally, I just want you to save that file to a location of your choice. So that might be on your desktop, it might be in OneDrive, wherever you want to save. And I want you to call it my presentation and we're saving it as just the default, the regular .pptx file. So a very straightforward exercise incorporating some of the techniques that we've learned in this section and building you up to be able to work on more advanced aspects of your presentation. That's it for now. I will see you in the next section. Hello again and welcome back to my course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section, we're going to start to take a look at how you can format text and also bullet editing options. But in this specific module, we're going to stick to formatting text first of all. So I'm currently on slide one, which is our title slide where I have the words Wonderlust Travel, and we're going to make some edits to the text on this slide. Now, I want you to know that when I click on the title here, Wonderlust Travel, what you'll see is that I get a what we call a placeholder around the outside. And you'll see these placeholders all over the place in uh, PowerPoint. And in general, what they'll contain is some kind of object. So it could be text, it might be some kind of shape or a picture. And the beauty of the placeholder is that in order to change any formatting on this text, 
I don't actually have to highlight the text. We're probably used to doing that across other Microsoft applications. If I wanted to change the font here or the color or the size, I'm used to highlighting and then going and selecting my options. But you don't need to do that in PowerPoint. What you need to do is just click on that placeholder. And you'll know you're clicked on it because you get these resize handles around the outside. So these also help you resize that placeholder. So if I wanted to, I could drag this up or down, and I could also drag it in or out. Now, you're probably noticing there as I'm doing that, it's not actually making any sizing changes to the text within the placeholder. It really just resizes that placeholder. So I'm going to make sure I've got my placeholder selected and let's go and explore the different options we have for formatting text. So I'm currently on my home ribbon and we're going to focus on this font group just here. Now the first one, the drop down just here, if I click it, again, you're probably fairly used to using these across the other Microsoft applications. This is where you'll get a list of all of your fonts that are available to use in your presentation. So I can see at the top any theme fonts that I have applied. And then I have all of my fonts listed in alphabetical order. And as I scroll over them, you can see I get a live preview, which is really handy. It means that I can see what that's going to look like before I actually commit to applying it. So I might want to go down and apply. Let's try this one. Bauhaus 93. Like so, and just switch up that font. Next to that, we have our sizing. So again, we have lots of different options in here. We can go all the way up to uh, 96. Um, for this one, I'm probably going to stick with around 72. It is also worth noting if you don't have exactly the size font that you want in that list, because if you look, the numbers aren't all consecutive all the way up from 8 to 96. There are some gaps. So if I wanted, for example, font size 64, I don't actually have that listed here, but I can go up into the font box and just manually change that to 64 and hit enter and my font will resize. So just be aware that you can do that as well, make manual changes to that font size. I can then make smaller changes, incremental changes by increasing the font size. So if I click the increase font size button, it will jump that up or I can use the other one to move it down. So little incremental changes if I want to make some minor adjustments. The row underneath, I have bold. Again, probably something you might be familiar with using, just makes that text a little bit bolder. I have my italics. I have underline. And I also have this one here, so text shadow. So that will add a shadow behind the selected text, which makes it stand out from the background a little bit. And sometimes it's quite subtle. It is quite hard to see, but I've actually put a shadow on there, which actually looks quite nice. So I'm going to leave that, I think. What we could also do is use a strike through. Now, in this particular scenario, the strike through makes no sense whatsoever. I really don't want to put a strike through through my title, but you can probably think of scenarios, maybe things that you might want to cross out or show that there's been a change where a strike through might possibly be useful. We then have next to strike through the character spacing and we have a little drop down here and I'm currently set to normal. But again, you'll see if I hover over, you'll see that that's very tight spacing. Tight is a little bit wider. Then we have normal, loose, very loose. And then we have more spacing options in here as well. And that will take me to some advanced options for my character spacing. So I can then set how many points in between my characters I want spaces for. So just remember that that is also there. The next option along is to change case. So we have sentence case, which is where you have the first letter capitalized, lowercase, uppercase, capitalize each word, and then toggle case. Now toggle case is useful when, and I'm sure you've had this scenario before, where you've typed something and you've accidentally had caps lock on, so everything comes out the opposite way of what you imagined. That's a good one to use in that particular instance. Next to that, we have our text highlighter color. So again, if I wanted to, I could select a highlight. So this is much like just having a highlighter pen and running it across. Again, not particularly appropriate on this slide, but it, it could be useful to emphasize certain words or certain points or sentences on other slides. And then I have my font colors. So I could go through and change this to something completely different just by selecting from the palette if I wanted to. 
Now, another little thing I want to highlight here is this little arrow in the bottom corner of the font group. If you click that, what it will do is it will give you access to some additional options when it comes to formatting your text. So some of these you've already seen on the ribbon, such as the font just here, and also things like font color, uh, font size, font style. Again, we've got regular italic, bold, bold italic, if you want to use that. We can select an underline style. Now that's quite interesting. We do have an underline button in that font group on the ribbon, but we only have one option for underline. If we were to select that from the ribbon, we just get a solid underline under our text. Whereas if we go into the additional options, we have lots of different styles of underline that we could use. If you wanted a dotted line or dashed or something like that, you can definitely find that in those advanced options. Again, underneath effects, we have some things which we found in our ribbon, such as the strike through, but we have additional things like double strike through, uh, superscript and subscript, small caps, all caps, and we can also equalize character height. Let me just show you that because that's one you may not have come across. If you look at my title, what will happen when I click this is that all the letters are kind of stretched to become the same height. So that might be something which you find quite useful. I'm going to undo that by clicking the undo button and just jump back in to my advanced options. And then I have that character spacing tab. Now we were in here a moment ago, it jumped us straight to it when we were looking at more options for character spacing. So again, you could select the type of spacing, so normal, expanded, condensed, and here you can actually customize how many points in between. So if you want the characters really spaced out, you could put quite a large number in here to get that effect. So don't forget that you have those additional options lurking in the background. Now, one other thing I want to show you with regards to formatting text is the Format Painter. This is such a useful utility. What it basically does is it allows you to take all of the properties that you've applied to a piece of text and essentially copy them and paste them or paint them over the top of another piece of text. So it's a really good efficiency tool. So what I mean by that is I'm currently clicked on the placeholder for Wanderlust Travel. And I've changed lots of properties about this text. So we changed the font that we were using. I changed the size. I changed the color of the font. And I also added a background shadow as well. Now, if I want the subtitle here, Unleash the Explorer Within, to be exactly the same as the title, I want to copy all those properties over. Now, of course, I could do it manually. I could select the subtitle and I could go through my different options. But the quickest way of doing it is just to use the Format Painter. So again, I'm going to highlight my placeholder because it's the properties of this text that I want to copy. I'm going to go up to my Home ribbon. And in that first group, I have Format Painter. And I'm going to click. Now, as soon as I click, you'll see that my cursor changes to a little paintbrush icon, which means I'm in Format Painter mode. And all I need to do is go down and click on the placeholder for that subheading. And you can see it applies exactly the same formatting to the subheading. Now, currently that doesn't look too great. I might want to go in and make it a bit smaller so it doesn't look like it's overlapping too much, but I could definitely do that. And that is so much quicker than copying the properties individually. It's also worth noting if I just undo out of there and get it back to how it was, with the Format Painter, it's a one-time deal. So when I click on my placeholder and I click Format Painter, as soon as I've painted that formatting, the Format Painter deactivates. So if I wanted to apply that same formatting to lots of pieces of text, I would have to keep going back to Format Painter in order to do it because it essentially deactivates after you've used it once. The way to stop it from doing that is to double click on Format Painter. So what I could do is I could highlight my placeholder, double click on Format Painter. I can then click on my text below, but you see that my Format Painter is still active. Look at my cursor, I still have the paintbrush icon. So I could then go and carry on painting that format on other pieces of text. To deactivate it, all you need to do is click the Format Painter option again, or you can press the Escape key on your keyboard. So that's it. That's all I wanted to show you with regards to formatting text. In the next module, we're going to start to look at bullets and how we can format those. So I will see you over there.
Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section, we're going to focus on working with bullets. And I'm back in the presentation that we've been working on so far in the course. And currently, I'm clicked on slide one, the title slide. Now, we don't have any bullets on here, so I'm going to jump straight across to slide two. And you can see what we have on this slide is a number of first level bullets. And if we jump across to slide three, you'll see we have some first and some second level bullets. And we're going to talk a little bit about how you can format these and also how you can customize them. So let's jump back to slide two. Now, just to reiterate some points that I've made previously about bullets, you can have five different levels of bullets. And remember, to get another bullet, all you need to do is click at the end and hit the enter key, and that will give you another bullet on the same level. And if you want to indent that, so to give yourself a second level bullet, you just need to press the tab key on your keyboard. If you want to go back or essentially outdent it, shift tab, will outdent that for you. And again, if I wanted to delete it, I can just press my backspace key a couple of times to get me back to where I was. Now, the bullets that you can see here, these little green triangles, the reason why I have green triangles is because these are the bullets which came along with the design template that I'm using. And if we want to, we can change those. So remember, most things, if you do select a design template, most things are customizable and you can change pretty much any element. So we're going to focus on changing these bullets. Another thing I can also change is not just the bullets, but I can also change the spacing between the text. Now I want to show you something first of all. Let me click inside this first line of text. And I want you to cast your eyes up to the ruler just above the slide. What you should be able to see is on the ruler, we have these little tabs or these little controls. We've got this first one just here, which is sort of like a, a little down facing arrow. And then we have a second one that's up facing. And then directly underneath, we have a kind of a block or a square. Now, it's these two which are controlling the spacing of your bullets and also of your text on this slide. So, for example, if I wanted to change the placement of this bullet, if I grab that first little tab, and you can see I get a line as I click and drag it in, it's going to drag that bullet in. And if I drag it out again, it's going to put it back to where it was. The same thing happens if I want more space between the bullet and the actual text. If I grab the up facing tab and drag that, and you should see that dotted line again, that's going to move the placement of that text further away from that bullet. And again, I can drag it back to put it back to where it was. Now you'll notice when I'm doing that, it's only moving the first bullet or the first piece of text. It's not actually moving the rest of the text. And why is that? Well, it's because I'm clicked in that first line of text. So if I wanted to move the entire lot, what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight all of my points and then I can drag that top tab and you'll see it moves all of those bullet points. And I could do the same if I wanted to drag that text over a little bit as well. So just a point to bear in mind when you are moving these around or adding extra space in. So now let's talk about the actual bullets themselves. If we jump up to the home ribbon and in the paragraphs group, you can see I have this little bullets option just here. So I'm going to click that drop down arrow and you can see I have a number of different options in here. So I could change the style of the bullets that I have. And you'll see as I hover over, I again get that live preview. So if I wanted something a little bit different, I could choose any one of these in the list. I also have the option of none if I wanted to remove those bullets altogether. But what if I wanted to do something completely different? Maybe I didn't want to use any of these options that we have in this drop down menu. Well, I do have more options for this. Let me jump down into bullets and numbering and that will open the little bullets and numbering dialog box. And again, I have a few options in here. So these are the ones that I was just looking at. 
I can change the size of the bullet. Now, when it comes to sizing, what you need to remember here is that 100% or 100 in this box means that the bullet is going to be exactly the same size as the text. So you can adjust accordingly. And I can also change the color of my bullets. So if I wanted to make them, let's make them orange and click on OK. I now have orange bullet points. Let's jump back into that bullets and numbering again. Now, again, if I didn't want any of these particular styles of bullet, I have two additional options that I can choose from. So I could choose to use a picture that I've got saved off to my PC as a bullet, or I could customize the current bullets. Let's jump into customize first of all. And this will open up the symbols box. And this gives me access to all of the symbols and I can use any of these as a bullet. Now, when you click the drop down here, you see you have lots and lots of different font types and each one of these contains slightly different characters or symbols that you can use. And sometimes it's quite hard to kind of find the particular one that you're looking for. Now I'm going to scroll down to wingdings. There's normally some good ones in there. And you can see I have lots and lots of different options. So I'm going to choose a plane as this is all about travel and I'm going to click on OK. And I'm going to change the color of these. I'm going to make them stand out a little bit more. Let's make it a slightly brighter color orange and click on OK. And I now have those plain bullet points. So that looks quite nice actually for this presentation. So I do have another choice. I can choose to use a picture that I've got saved off on my PC. So let's jump back into bullets and numbering. And this time I'm going to select picture. And I have the option of choosing from a file. I can browse the web for a picture or, and this is new for 2019, I can choose an icon. And the icon sets, we haven't covered them yet in this course, but they are really good and they're particularly good to use as bullet points. So in this case, I'm going to select from icons. And what it will do is it will load all of the icons that are available within PowerPoint. And if you've never used these before, these are completely customizable icons, which can be resized, recolored, all of that good stuff. And they're organized into different categories. So if I scroll down, I can't remember if there is a travel one. I can't see one. So let's just scroll through and have a look at something that might be appropriate for our use. So you can see here we've got arrows, lots and lots of different things. So here we go in the location section, I might want to choose uh, the globe. So I'm going to select this and select insert. And you can see now I have my icons. Now, I don't particularly like the way that they look, so I might want to customize them. So again, up to bullets and numbering. And I'm going to say I want these 100% of the text. And I'm going to click on OK. And that makes those a little bit bigger. And just to show you another way that you can add a bullet, this time I'm going to use a picture that I've got saved off to my PC. So you've probably guessed it, up to bullets and numbering. And this time I'm going to select picture. And I'm going to say from a file. Now I'm just going to select a random picture. So I'm going to choose this one down here because that looks like it might possibly be related to travel. And I'm going to select insert. And there we go. Now I'm not saying that's the best way of uh, using a bullet. You might be able to find some pictures which look a little bit better, but just to show you the technique and how you can use icons and pictures as bullets if you want to. Now I'm going to jump across to slide three because in this slide we have two levels of bullets. And in this case, both of these levels are the same. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the placeholder again. And what if I wanted to use numbers as opposed to bullets? Well, again, if we jump up to our paragraph group next to our bullets, we have numbered lists or numbering. So if I click the drop down, there's all these different styles of numbering that I could choose. So I'm going to select, uh, let's say this one just here. And you can see now that that's how it's organized it. So if I was clicking on the end of balance and if I hit enter, 
you'll see it gives me a B. Okay, so it follows through. And let's go back into numbering and go into bullets and numbering. And again, these are my advanced options. So again, I have the same options. I can choose to change the size. I can choose to change the color. I can even choose to start at a different number if I wanted to. So it's entirely up to you how you customize these, but just be aware you have the bullets and you also have the numbering available as well. Now I'm going to put that back to, uh, let's say one, two, three and click on OK. And there we go. So that about wraps it up on bullets and numbering. Now in the next section, I have an exercise that I want you to do just to make sure that you are OK with everything that we've covered so far in relation to formatting bullets and numbers. So I will see you then. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. It's now time for exercise three. We've made it all the way through. And the idea of this exercise is really just to practice the skills that you've learned over the course of this section. So what I want you to do, I have some instructions up here, is I want you to open the file called Practice Presentation 4. And what I want you to do within this presentation is to change the bullets on slide two to the numbers one, two, and three. I then want you to jump across to slide three and change the bullets to second level bullets. And I've listed out there what I want you to change them to. So I want you to change them to recently renovated, designed to cultivate your dining experience, and no car needed. I then want you to change those bullets to whichever picture you like. So you can grab an icon, you can maybe use um, an image that you have saved off to your PC, or you can browse online for an image that you'd like to use. So entirely up to you. Once you've done that, I want you to save, and then I want you to close the file. And that's pretty much it, a very straightforward exercise. So see how you get on with that, and I will see you in the next section. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section, we're going to be focusing on adding graphics and some more visual elements into our slides. And specifically in this module, we're going to be looking at working with shapes. Now to do this, I'm going to want to have a new blank slide. So I'm currently clicked on slide three and I'm going to jump up to my home ribbon. I'm going to go to new slide. And this time I'm just going to select a blank to add one of those in. So you can see here, there's absolutely nothing on here. There's no placeholders, there's no text, there's nothing. But what I do have is that design template. So I still have the blue background with that green rectangle tab at the top. Now, sometimes when you're working with these templates, particularly if you're adding graphics in, if you start to add too many graphics, it might clash a little bit or overlap with the design template. Now, the one I'm using here is fairly basic. We don't really have too much on it other than this green rectangle in the corner. But just be aware of that. If you do have a rather busy looking background, and then you start to add more graphics and shapes on, it can tend to look a little bit chaotic. Now, I'm gonna show you a little trick which will enable you to essentially remove or hide all of the background images on either the side that you're currently using or across the entire template. So I'm gonna go up to the design ribbon and you'll see all the way across on the right hand side, we have an option that says format background. And this will just allow you to fine tune that formatting of your background. Now in this first group here where it says fill, I currently have picture or texture fill selected, but what I do have is an option to hide background graphics. And you'll see as soon as I click that, that green rectangle has disappeared, just leaving me with that very plain blue background, which is essentially what I want for this exercise. Now it's only gonna remove it from one slide. If I did, however, want to remove it from all of my slides, all I would need to do is click the apply to all button at the bottom. If I don't click that, and I'm not going to do that, if I just close down this pane, then it will just remove it from the slide that I'm currently on. So that's a nice little trick. 
So now what we're going to do is we're just going to play around with some shapes. I'm going to insert some onto this blank slide so you really just get a feel of how you can use them. Now you can access shapes from a few different tabs and you'll see as we go through, I think it's sort of three or four tabs that you have access to shapes on. So if we jump across to the home ribbon, you'll see in this drawing group, we have this little drop down here, which has all of the shapes that I have access to. And they are organized into different categories or groups. And the first group up there is my recently used shapes. So you normally find the ones that you use most often will be listed up here. We then have a selection of lines, some rectangles, some basic shapes, that's where you'll find things like triangles, circles, squares, all things like that, the smiley face, some people love to add that one into their presentations. We then have block arrows, uh, equation shapes, if you're doing some kind of math on your slide. We have flowchart icons, which can be very useful, stars and banners, call outs, and then finally we have action buttons. Now, we're not gonna cover action buttons in this module, we're gonna do that later on in the course because these are a little bit more functional than some of the other shapes. So essentially what these action buttons are are hyperlinks. So you can, for example, add an action button so that when it's clicked on, it will maybe open an Excel spreadsheet or maybe jump to a different slide, something like that. So they're shapes that have a bit more to them that allow you to perform an action. And as I said, we're gonna come back to that a little bit later on. So let's just draw a basic shape. I'm gonna go up to my lines group and I'm just gonna select this first one here, the basic line. And you'll see now my cursor changes to a crosshair. And what I can do is literally just click and if I drag, and I can drag it up or down, I get a very basic line. Now, because this is an object, you'll see when I let go, I do get those control handles at the end, which will allow me to resize that line or move it around and just make some minor adjustments if I want to. What you'll also see is because it is an object, now I'm clicked on it, I get my shape format contextual ribbon appear. Remember, in any of the Microsoft applications, every time you're clicked on an object, you will get a contextual menu appear, and that will contain all of the formatting options which are related to the particular object that you're clicked on. So I can see in here, I can go in and change the shape style, the shape outline, I can add effects, so on and so forth. So just be aware of that additional ribbon that appears. Now, as I mentioned before, there are a few different ribbons where you can access shapes and this is another one of them. So this is the shape format contextual ribbon and the first group is the insert shapes group. So if I wanted to add another shape, I could click my drop down and I have access to my shapes library again. I'm going to go back to these lines and I'm just going to add this one here. So I'm going to do a squiggly line, which is this one on the end and you'll see here it says free form. So if I click it, and then I get a pencil tool this time or a pencil cursor. And that just allows me to really kind of free draw whatever I want. And obviously this doesn't look particularly great and you do have to be quite careful with it. This is a lot easier, I would say, if you're using a tablet which has a, a pen, it's a lot more accurate. I'm using a mouse and it's a little bit hard to get the accuracy level when you're doing freehand drawing, but hopefully you get the idea. You can see again, once I let go of my mouse, I have those control handles, so I can then use those to resize my squiggle and I can always pick it up and move it around. And you can see I can drop objects on top of objects. And we're gonna discuss this a bit later on in the course, and that is positioning objects, moving them, aligning them, so on and so forth. But you can place them on top of each other. Now, I actually don't want this squiggle, so while I've got it selected, I'm just gonna press the delete key on my keyboard just to get rid of that. Now, I'm gonna show you yet another ribbon where you can access your shapes, and that is on the insert ribbon. And you'll see in the illustrations group, we have a shapes drop down, and again, we get that same shapes library. I'm gonna pick something slightly different this time, so I'm gonna do a rectangle, so let's just click this first one. I get a crosshair, and I can drag and draw a rectangle on the screen. And again, I get those control handles, I can move it around, I can change the color, I can do whatever I like with this particular shape. Now I'm not gonna go through all of the shapes, but let's just add a couple more. 
Um, let's go down to our basic shapes. And for this one, I'm going to draw a smiley face. I'm just going to draw that underneath here. Now, one thing I will point out, you can see it's kind of like quite free and easy how you can size that. It's not a constrained sizing when you're dragging and dropping. So if I wanted to make sure that this smiley face was completely circular, what I could do is as I'm dragging, if I hold down my shift key and drag the corner, it will resize it proportionally. So it will essentially constrain the limit. So that's quite nice if you want to make sure you're getting an exact circle on your shape. And what you'll also see when you add some of the shapes is that they'll have a control handle inside the shape. So with this smiley face, you can see that on the smile, we have another control handle. And this is pretty cool. What this means is that I can manipulate just the smile. So if I drag this control handle up, I can turn him into a frowny man instead of a smiley man. So look out for those control handles within the shapes as well. And just to make this all match, I'm going to change the color of my sad face man. Let's go back to our shapes drop down and just do a couple more. I could use the block arrows. Again, these are particularly useful if you're doing some kind of chart. And remember to constrain, hold down the shift key, and I can draw my arrow like so. And again, just going to change the color by clicking back up to my shapes. And I want to show you something quite interesting. We're going to go down to stars and banners, and I'm going to pick this 16 point star. And again, I'm going to hold my shift key and I'm just going to draw this star. Now, again, remember what I said, this particular shape has that control handle within it. So if I grab this little red control and just drag it down, you can see I can change the way that that shape looks simply by dragging out or dragging in. So that's another point to remember. And the final one I'm going to show you is just the call out. So let's select one of these call outs. Let's do this one. I'm going to hold down my shift key and I'm going to drag. I'm just going to change the color of that one. And again, this is another one of those shapes that has an additional control handle. So that means that I can change the direction of this call out depending on where my other objects are. So if the sad man was saying something, I could really direct it in that direction. And then I could add some text into this shape. I can do that in a couple of ways. I can just start typing. Alternatively, if I right click my mouse, you'll see I have an edit text option. And I can type something in here. Uh, I'm so sad. And again, I could change the font. I could modify the size if I wanted to just by highlighting, going to my home ribbon. And I'm going to make that text a little bit bigger like so. Now, another one that's worth pointing out before I forget is if we go back to insert and go to shapes underneath basic shapes, the first one there is a text box. So let's click that. And I'm just going to click somewhere on the screen and you can see it automatically adds a little text box. So I can just start typing any text that I want to add. So um, I'm going to say this is how to add a text box. And if I click off, you can see it just looks like regular text that I've added. And if I click on again, I can drag and drop that and position it how I want. If I did want to add some kind of background to that, just to make it stand out a little bit, remember when you're clicked on an object, you have that shape format contextual ribbon. And I could choose to fill my background if I wanted to. So I'm going to select just a gray background like so. And then I can drag and drop. So that's the basics of adding shapes into your PowerPoint presentation. They really can add a nice visual element. And they're also particularly useful when you're doing things like diagrams or process flows or anything along those lines. So really just have a play around with them, resize them, move them about, change the color, use the different options on that shape format contextual ribbon and see how you get along with that. So that's it for this section. In the next section, we're going to look at how you can add different kinds of graphics into your PowerPoint presentation. So please join me for that. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. 
In this section, we're going to take a look at inserting graphics into our slides. And the reason why you might want to do this is because slides can tend to get a little bit boring if you just have bullet points and text on them. So you might want to add something which makes them a little bit more visual, a little bit more interesting for your audience to look at. And we've already seen how we can add some shapes to give it a little bit more pizzazz, but we're going to take that up a notch now and we're going to start adding in some graphics. Now I'm working on slide three and I've got quite a lot of text on here and I want to add an image on the right hand side. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to resize this placeholder very slightly and just move it over a little bit to give myself some room in order to place an image. So I'm now going to jump up to my insert ribbon and you'll see that I have an images group just here and I'm going to select online pictures. Now you can see here automatically we have lots of really high quality images that we can add and they are organized again into different categories. So you could choose to go into a category. So if I click on uh, airplane, for example, and you can see I get lots of nice images of airplanes. I'm just going to click the arrow to go back because what I can also do is if I'm searching for something very specific is I can use the search bar at the top here and you can see that it says search Bing. So that's essentially what you're doing when you're adding an online picture is that you're essentially doing a search as if you were in a Bing browser. So I might want to click in the search here and I might want to type in travel and hit my enter key. And one important thing to note is you can see at the top here, I have a little checkbox that says Creative Commons only. So essentially I have a filter applied to my search results, which is only showing me images which have a Creative Commons license. Now, the way that Creative Commons license works is that if, for example, somebody decides to upload a picture or maybe a video to the Internet, automatically that person owns that picture or that video. So you can't just jump on there, grab that picture and use it. However, when they upload, they do have the ability to give that image or that video a Creative Commons license, which means that you do have permission to take those pictures or those videos and use them in your presentation. So essentially what I've got here is I'm only filtering for images that have a Creative Commons license, which means that I'm OK to use them. So now I have my list, I could scroll through and I could select one of these if I wanted to. So I'm just going to select this travel, uh, this luggage or suitcase and select insert. And there we go. Now I'm going to drag that over. It's a little bit big, so I'm just going to resize it like so and put that into my presentation. So that's one way that I can insert a graphic onto my slide. I can go up to insert, I can search online and I can add it in. Let's jump back to slide two because I want to show you a slightly different way of utilizing this. So this might be if you want to add an animated image into your presentation. So again, I'm going to go up to the insert ribbon. I'm going to go down to online pictures. But this time in the search bar, I'm going to type in animated GIF travel and hit enter. Now, when it comes to animated GIFs, you can see here none of these look like they're animated particularly. And the thing with this is that you don't tend to see the animation until you've added it onto your slide and then you've run the slideshow. So just to show you an example, I'm going to just click on this one and select insert. And this one's quite small. I'm just going to drag him over here and you can see here it's got the license underneath. Now that is just a text box. So if I don't want it there, because I know that I can use this picture, I can just highlight the text box and delete it. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger and I'm going to put him down in the corner. Now you'll see that this won't show as animated until I run this slideshow. So I'm going to click my slideshow button, which if you remember is right down in that bottom right hand corner. And you can see, there you go, he's slightly swaying from side to side. Now that's not the best image, it is a little bit pixelated, but that hopefully that gives you an idea of how you can search for those animated GIFs in order to add them into your presentation. I'm going to press escape 
to come out of my slideshow. Now, both of these images that I've added into these slides are kind of in the, the clip art variety, shall we say. Now, one thing I will say, when you are selecting images for your presentation, again, be very aware of the audience that is going to see this presentation. I would say that clip art, a lot of the time, is not particularly good to add to slides, which are going to be used in a business context. It doesn't really have that much of a professional feel. So you might want to add a more professional, high quality picture as opposed to clip art. So now we've talked about adding those basic graphics into our presentation. We're going to move on and talk about adding pictures into our slides. So that's what we're going to cover in the next section. I will see you then. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. So far in this section, we've looked at how you can add shapes and also how you can add pictures and animated GIFs into your slides. In this module, we're going to take a look at how you can add in icons and 3D models. And both of these are fairly new items that have been added into PowerPoint. So I'm currently clicked on slide two. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete out this image that I have just here by clicking on it and pressing the delete key on my keyboard. Now, what we're going to replace it with is an icon and you'll find icons on the insert ribbon in the illustrations group. So you can see here we have this icons button just there. As I said, these are fairly new and you should have them if you have PowerPoint 2019, then you definitely will have these on your ribbon. And I actually really love these. I think they're really, really nice. So let's click on icons and take a look at the library. Now we saw this briefly earlier when we were dealing with bullet points, but just to recap, these are all the icons that you have access to. And again, as with everything, they are organized by category in alphabetical order. So it really depends what kind of icon you're looking for. So I can just scroll through and it's worth noting that all of these icons are completely customizable. So whilst they're showing in this library as being black, you can change the color, you can resize them, which makes them really nice and versatile. So I'm going to scroll down and look for something that's related to travel. And if I stick with the same one that I used for the bullet points, which was the uh, icon of the world, which I think is towards the bottom, Yep, there it is. I'm going to use this one by selecting it and clicking on insert. And there we go. I have my icon. So I'm going to put this down in the corner and I find with icons, they're actually quite nice to add to master slides. So they're quite a nice thing to have in the bottom corner of every slide, but that's just how I like to use them. It is entirely up to you. So I'm just going to put this down in the bottom corner. And again, when I'm clicked on it, because it's an object, if you look up on your ribbons, you'll see that you now have that graphics format contextual ribbon. So this means I can edit any element of this particular icon. So I don't think it looks particularly good in black. So I'm going to change the fill by selecting another color from the palette. So I'm going to go with, in fact, let's use something that we used previously. And that is my favorite eyedropper utility because I'm going to make this the same green as we have up here. And there we go. So very simple. And I can just use those handles to drag to resize. And as I said, you have all of these other options in order to format that particular icon. So icons are a really nice thing to utilize on your slides to add a bit of pizzazz and a bit of interest. So now let's have a look at adding 3D models. And again, these are new and they're particularly cool. So let's jump across to slide three. And again, I'm just going to delete out this image that I currently have in there by pressing my delete key. I'm going to go up to the insert ribbon. And in that illustrations group, I have an option for 3D models. So I can select from a file or from online sources. Now, in this case, I'm going to select from online sources because I don't have a 3D image saved off onto my PC. Now, this should look fairly familiar. Again, it's bringing up the 3D model library so I can scroll through the different categories or if I'm looking for something very specific, I can search for it in the top here. So let me just scroll down and see if there is a travel section. 
And yes, there is a traveler section just here. So let's click on traveler. And I have now all of my images and you can see immediately that these are a lot higher quality vector images and you'll see how cool they are when I add them in. So let's select this passport 3D model and select insert. And sometimes you'll find with these 3D models, um, they are quite large file sizes, so they do take a few seconds to load. I've got my passport there. I'm just going to resize that slightly, make it a little bit smaller and add that in. Now the image is really nice, but the cool thing about 3D models is that you can rotate them. So if you look in the middle of this model, I have this little round uh, control handle. And if I click and drag, it allows me to rotate that all the way round because it is 3D. So I think that's pretty cool and you can really get some nice effects by doing that. So I'm just going to rotate it so it's kind of like that. And again, if I'm clicked on it, you can see I get the 3D model contextual ribbon, which allows me to do things like select the model view so I can choose any of these. So maybe I want to change it to above front right. I can add alt text. I can change my 3D model. I can do whatever I like with it. So those are really nice. I would say don't go crazy adding 3D models into your presentation. As I said, they are quite hefty on space. So you might find if you do have like loads of them in your presentation, the presentation does start to slow down and lag a little bit. So those are another couple of different types of image that you can add into your presentation to really give it that wow factor. So have a little play around with those, investigate and see what you think. So that's about it for this module. In the next module, we're going to be taking a look at inserting pictures. So I will see you then. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section we're going to continue on adding images into our presentation and in this module we're going to focus on adding pictures. So uh, images which are more like a photograph as opposed to the ones that we've added before. So already we've added into our presentation shapes We've added in some sort of clip art style graphics and animated clip art. We've added in icons and we've also added in 3D models. So I'm just going to show you a couple of techniques and things you can do with photos and putting those into your presentation. So I'm going to jump across to slide two. And what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to change the slide layout. So currently this is a title and content slide. And I'm going to change it just by clicking this layout drop down. And you can see there it's telling me which one is currently in use. It's highlighted in gray. And I'm going to change it to a two content layout. And you can see automatically what it's done. It's put my text content on the left hand side and it's given me an additional box here or an additional placeholder, which will allow me to add another piece of content. And these icons we've seen before. The one that we're going to use is this one just here, the one that says pictures. So that's not to be confused with the one next to it, which is online pictures. I'm going to choose a picture from my desktop, so I'm going to select pictures. Now I've got a couple of images here, which I might like to use. And I think I'm going to just select this one and click on insert. And as you can see, the picture is inserted the same size as that placeholder. And of course, I do have the freedom to move that around and I can make it a little bit bigger if I want to. So I think that one actually looks quite nice. Now, there's something really important I want to mention here. When you do insert a picture, it's essentially sitting on top of your slide. If you have a presentation that has a lot of pictures in it and you're inserting them in this way where they're sitting on top of the slide, you'll find that the file size of your overall presentation starts to get very, very large. So I'm going to show you a way that you can combat this. I'm going to jump across to slide four and we're going to insert a blank slide. So let's jump up to new slide and go down to blank. And you might be thinking, well, 
I don't have a layout or a placeholder here and I don't have an icon to click on to insert the image. So how do I do that? Well, very simply, we go up to the insert ribbon and in the images group, we have a pictures option and that's going to take me back to my same folder that I was in previously. And this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this image of an aeroplane above the clouds, very nice image and click on insert. And that's inserted it and it's quite a nice image. It doesn't quite take up that whole slide. I can still see a bit of blue lurking in the background and I guess I could pick it up. I could drag it and move it and I could use the resize handles. Now the problem with stretching some images is it can distort them. It can sort of like flatten them very slightly. This one's not too bad, but that is just something to watch out for if you are doing this. Now I might want this image to take up the entire screen or the entire slide like it is right now. But as I said, if I had a lot of images like this and I am someone who does like to use very large images in my PowerPoint presentations, I think they look really effective. But there is a way that you can keep your file size down and still have these larger images in your presentation. So I'm going to show you how to do it in a slightly different way. I'm going to delete this image out. So I'm clicked on it, press delete. I'm going to go up to the design ribbon. And again, I'm going to go all the way across to the right hand side and select format background. Now I have quite a few different options here with underneath fill. So I have solid fill where I could choose a different color if I wanted to. Gradient fill allows me to have um, a gradient background and I can make various different adjustments to that. Picture or texture fill. Now what you get in here as the default is very much determined by the theme that you used or the design that you used. But the one that I'm actually interested in, I'm going to stay clicked on picture or texture fill because I do want to fill the background with a picture, but I'm going to say insert picture from file. And I'm going to select that same image and click insert. And you can see now that that image is still taking up the whole slide, but instead of sitting on top of the slide, it's made it into a background. And that means it keeps your file size really, really low. So that's a much better way of utilizing a large image as a background and keeping your file size down. Now you can see that I still have that green sort of rectangle poking through. I actually don't think that looks too bad in this case, but remember, if you want to, you can hide background pictures. And finally, I'm just going to jump back up to slide one, the title slide, and I'm going to close down that pane. And I'm going to insert another picture. So up to insert and down to pictures. And I'm going to choose this one just here and click on insert. And this is a bit too large. I might want to have this just at the top. So I'm going to resize that just by dragging the corner in. And I'm going to put it at the top in the middle there. And remember, you can move any of your placeholders around. So maybe I want my title to be in the middle and my subtitle to be underneath. You can really can just position these however you like. And this will change as we go through the presentation. But I think for now, I'm just going to leave it like that. So you've seen a few different techniques of inserting photographs into your presentation. All that's left to do now is to do exercise four, which we're going to do in the next section. So I will see you then. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. We've made it to exercise four. And in this exercise, we're going to practice some of the techniques that we've learned in the preceding section. Now, as always, I have some instructions on the screen for you to follow. So what I first want you to do is open up the file called Practice Presentation 5. And then on slide two in that file, I want you to change the layout to two columns and add a clip art picture using the online pictures option. I then want you to jump across to slide three and just add a regular picture. So not a clip art picture necessarily, but just a picture using the online pictures option. I then want you to go to the end of the presentation and add a new slide 
and then make a picture that you have saved to your computer as the background for the slide. Finally, I just want you to save and close the file down. So again, very simple instructions. Give it a go and I will see you in the next section. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this module, we're going to talk about selecting objects and we've discussed objects in some of the previous modules. So objects can be a number of different things. So they might be shapes as we have on the slide right now. They might be text, they might be graphics. And it's important that you know how you can select one or multiple objects on the slide. It's going to help you increase your efficiency dramatically. So let's talk about just some single object selections. So I'm currently clicked on slide four. And if you remember, this was the slide where we added in all those different shapes and we weren't too careful when we added them. We just kind of put them on the slide. So if I want to select any of these shape objects, it's a very simple case of just clicking on the object. And you'll see then I get that placeholder around the outside with those control handles and I can make any formatting changes I need to to that particular shape. But what if I want to select multiple shapes? So maybe I want to change this star and also this arrow. Maybe I want to change the color of both of them at the same time. So you can select multiple objects by holding down your control key and clicking on that second object. And you'll now see that I have both of those selected. And I could continue with that. So if I wanted to select the rectangle as well, hold down control again and click to select that object. And I can then go in and I can make any changes I need to to those particular objects. To deselect everything, just click away onto a blank part of the slide and those objects will become deselected. Now, another way that you can select objects is by drawing what we call a net around those objects. So, for example, if I just click anywhere on this blank slide and I just drag my mouse to include some of these objects, so I'm just going to include these ones just here. When I let go, you'll see that everything that's contained within that net is going to be selected. Now, you can see that I kind of have part of, a very small part of that rectangle is covered by the net, but because the entire object isn't covered, then the rectangle won't be selected. So I'm just hoping that the arrow, the star, the call out, and also that text box are going to be selected when I let go. So let me let go of my mouse. And there we go. I have all of those objects selected again. So very simple to make multiple selections and click off to deselect. The final thing I want to show you is sometimes you might want to select all objects on a slide. And a good example of this would be if you'd maybe done quite a complex um, organizational chart and you've got lots of different shapes and pictures. If you wanted to move it all as one object, as opposed to moving the individual elements, you might want to select all objects on the slide. And the easiest way to do that is by using a shortcut key, control A, and that will highlight or select all of the objects on the slide. And you can then drag them as one and reposition them. So those are just a few techniques when it comes to selecting objects. And we will be using those as we go throughout the course. In the next module, we're going to talk about how to edit objects. So please join me for that. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this module, we're going to start to talk a little bit about editing objects. So previously, we've seen how we can select objects, but now we're going to look at the different ways that we can edit them. And when we're talking about editing, what we mean is doing things like changing the size, rotating the object, copying it, deleting it, so on and so forth. So let's start with deleting objects first of all. Now I have quite a few shapes on my slide here and I'm just going to make it a little bit less chaotic and delete out a few of these. So I'm going to first of all delete out this call out. So all I need to do is click on the call out to select it. And the easiest way is to press the delete key on my keyboard. And I'm also going to delete out this text box. So I'm going to click on it to select it and press the delete key. 
and that's gone as well. And finally, I'm just going to delete the little sad face man because he is a little bit depressing. So again, click and press the delete key. So now I have just three objects left on my slide, which is a little bit easier to work with. So first of all, it's worth noting if you want to move an object, it's a very simple case of clicking and just dragging those objects around like so. So very nice and easy. And when you are clicked on an object, one thing you might have noticed is that aside from these control handles, which control the size, so if I was to drag in this one in the corner, it drags it in diagonally. Alternatively, if I wanted to decrease the height of the object, I can do that. And the same on the bottom. We also have a rotation handle at the top here. So you'll see as I hover over that little circular arrow, I get my cursor changes again to something similar, a little black circular arrow. And this will allow me to rotate that object. So I can just click my mouse and drag it round in order to rotate that particular object. So again, very simple, nice and easy. Remember that if you do have multiple objects selected, so let's select this arrow as well by holding down the control key and clicking. If you then use your rotation handle, you're going to rotate both of those objects at the same time. So again, that's worth bearing in mind. So let's talk now about copying objects. Now, most of the time when it comes to copying, people are very used to right clicking, selecting copy, or using the shortcut key control C to copy and control V to paste. And that's perfectly fine. If I wanted to copy this rectangle, I could do control C. I could click somewhere else on my slide and do control V to paste a copy of that. That's perfectly fine. But a better way of doing it, or an easier way, is to just duplicate that object. So again, if I click on this object and do Control D, that's going to give me an exact duplicate. So that's something I use all the time as opposed to Control C, Control V. It's just less uh, keyboard shortcuts to use, so it's a little bit more efficient. Another cool thing is if we select this star and I'm going to do control D, I'm going to duplicate this object multiple times. So I'm just going to carry on pressing control D. So I get lots of stars just there. Now this goes back to selecting. I might want to do something with these stars. I might want to maybe move them all in one block and it's going to be very difficult for me to go in and hold down my control key and select every single one of those stars because there's so many of them and they overlap. So again, this is where we use our net to select. If you remember from the previous module, if we just click and drag round all of those stars and let go, it's going to select the whole lot and I can then pick them up, move them by dragging and dropping to wherever I want to place them. So just bear that in mind as we're going to be using some of these techniques as we go through the rest of the course. So that's a little bit about editing. We're now going to move on and talk about formatting those objects. So I will see you in the next module. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this module, we're going to talk about formatting objects. And when we say formatting, all we mean is just taking the properties of an object and changing them. So for example, the color or maybe the shadow effect or the outline style. Now there are two parts to this section. So make sure that you do watch both parts. There's formatting part one and formatting part two. And you'll see that there are a lot of different options when it comes to formatting your objects, and it can get a little bit overwhelming, but we're gonna try and step through these at a reasonably slow pace. Now, I'm currently clicked on slide four, and I've already taken the liberty of deleting off of this slide all of the objects that we had on there. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw some new objects. So I'm gonna go up to insert, I'm gonna to go to shapes, and I'm just going to select one of these rectangles. So I'm just going to drag that like so. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to copy this three times. So I have three of them on here. And we've seen a couple of different techniques. We could do Control C, Control V to copy paste. Alternatively, we could do Control D to duplicate that object. 
But another way that I didn't show you was you can use your uh, keyboard and mouse controls. So if you hold down the control key and click on the object and drag it, you'll see that I get an exact duplicate. And I'm gonna do that again. So I'm gonna hold down control, click, drag, and let go. And you can see that my objects aren't particularly aligned at this time, which is absolutely fine. We're gonna sort that out in a moment. I'm going to add some more objects. I'm going to grab a block arrow. Now I'm currently on the shape format tab and I can access my shapes from here as well. So let me click the drop down. And I'm just going to add this block arrow and I'm just going to draw a little block arrow in between these. And again, I'm going to duplicate this. So I have two of them. I'm going to hold down my control key and I'm going to drag and drop like so. And I'm going to add more shapes. I'm going to go to insert. I'm going to go to shapes and this time I'm going to add a sun. So I'm going to select it and then I'm going to drag like so. And finally, I'm just going to add a call out. So let's do this little bubble call out just here. So we have quite a few objects on our slide right now. Now, as I mentioned previously, you can add text inside any of these objects and you just click on the object and start typing. So in this first one, I'm going to say uh, welcome. In the second one, it's going to be about. And the third one is going to say benefits. And remember, if I want to change the size or resize any of these objects, if I'm clicked on one of them, I can just use those control handles to drag in and drag out. But if I wanted to make sure that they were all resized in exactly the same way, again, if I select all of them, so if I hold down my control key and select all three of them, you'll see that when I drag out to resize one of them, it also resizes the others as well. So that just ensures that you keep your sizing consistent across all of the objects that you have selected. So that's a, a cool little trick. So what else can I do with regards to formatting? Well, I can change the font color. So remember, if you're clicked on the placeholder, you don't necessarily have to highlight the text. I can go to the home ribbon and I can choose to change the font color. So I'm just going to make that a light gray color. Another thing you might want to do is that if you have a shape, for example, this one here, which is kind of a rectangle with the corner cut off, you might decide at a later stage that you want to actually change the shape. And you can do that if you click on the object or the shape, go up to the shape format contextual ribbon and go to edit shape you then have an option that says change shape. And as I hover over, it pops out that very familiar list of shapes. So maybe I just want to change this into a rectangle. And you can see, there we go, we now have a rectangle. It's a very small change. It just doesn't have that corner cut off. So very simple to change the shape after the fact. Now I'm gonna come out of there. I'm gonna undo that just by clicking on my undo button. You can also press control Z. And what I want to talk about now is the shape styles just here on the shape format ribbon. So these are somewhat predetermined by the theme that you've chosen. And you can see that they have, some of them have solid background fills, some of them have more gradient, some of them have outlines, and then we have some presets listed at the bottom as well. So if you just want a really quick way of applying some formatting and you quite like the look of these, you can just click to apply that style. So that's a really quick way of applying formatting. Now it might be that when you're looking in this shape styles gallery, that you don't particularly like any of the colors in there or they're not suitable for the presentation that you're doing. So this is where you can go in and refine by using these buttons to the right. So shape fill, shape outline and shape effects. So let's take this second one, let's highlight it. If I want to change the fill, and when we say fill, we're talking about the background color of the shape, and I can see it's currently set to this lime green color. I can click shape fill, and again, I get a palette of all of the colors that come with this theme. I then have a palette of standard colors that are in PowerPoint and I can choose any of those if I want to. So if I wanted to, I could make this orange. Let's click shape fill again. 
Now again, if I don't want to be limited to the theme colors and the standard colors, you really can customize this at a very granular level. So I could go down to more fill colors. And this will pop up this little palette and I have two tabs, standard and custom. So if we click on standard, you'll see I have a whole host of colors that I can choose from. So I could select any of these if I wanted to. So I could do a nice purple and select OK, and the shape will be filled in that color. But what if I want to get even more granular and customize this color? Let's jump back into Shape Fill, go down to More Fill Colors, and this time we're gonna go across to Custom. And this is where you can drag over the palette and really kind of choose the color that you want. Most of the time, you probably have the kind of color in your mind that you want to use. So maybe I want a, uh, let's say a yellow kind of color. In fact, let's make it a bit darker because our text is white. Uh, let's do, let's do a yellow, but then I can use this to adjust the shade of that yellow. So if I want to make it darker, I can drag it down or lighter, I can drag it up. So I'm just going to make it, it's not a particularly nice color. Let's choose something a bit better, a dark purple and click on OK. And there we go. So you can really get into customizing the types of colors that you use for your shape fill. Now, the one below shape outline, if I just click away, sometimes this is quite hard to see. It actually stands out quite a bit on the shape that we're currently looking at. Every object by default, every shape has a very small outline. And you can see here it's kind of in a greeny color. And again, you can customize this outline. So if I click shape outline, I might want to choose something that's a bit brighter. So I'm going to select this light blue like so, which looks quite nice. And I can also adjust the thickness of that shape outline as well. So again, back into shape outline. And this time I'm going to go down to weight and I'm going to make this a little bit thicker, three points. And there we go. And I can even go as far as to customize the type of outline. So currently I have a solid outline, but I could go into shape outline, go down to dashes and I could choose any one of these. So I'm going to say, uh, let's try the rounded dot. And you can see I have a completely different effect now on that shape. And finally, we have shape effects underneath. And this is where you can do things like add shadows, add reflections. And I'll just show you a reflection so you can see. We kind of now have a little bit of a reflection effect, which is actually quite a nice effect. Um, but I'm going to take that off. So let's go back to shape effects, go back to reflection, and I'm going to say no reflection. So it's worth having a little play around with those shape effects as well, because there are some really good visual elements in there. Now with this final shape, I want to show you one more thing. And we did touch on this earlier on in the course, and that is using the eyedropper utility, which you'll find underneath shape fill just here to fill the background. And what the eyedropper does just as a reminder is it will allow you to select any color that you have on your slide and use that as the fill. So it might be that you want to use this background color, or it might be that you want to use color that's in a different object. Even if you have something like a piece of clip art or a picture, you can use eyedropper to kind of suck up the color that you want to use from that picture and use it as a fill. And that's what we're going to do now. I'm going to very quickly just insert a picture into this slide. So up to insert, down to pictures. I'm just going to select one that I have on my PC. So let's do this one again, coconut trees. And it's quite a large picture. So I'm just going to resize that down and put it over here in the corner. So now what I can do is I can click on my shape. I can go to my shape format ribbon. I can click on shape fill and I can use the eyedropper. And now you'll see that as I scroll over this picture, it's showing or it's picking up all of the colors in that picture and I can choose any of these colors. So let's go for this dark green and it will fill the shape with that particular color. I love that utility. It is fairly new in PowerPoint. I think it came in in 2016, but it's really nice just to get a cohesive look to all of the colors 
on your presentation. And the final thing I want to mention is if you want to use a picture as the fill here. So with this picture just here, if I was to drag it on top of here and try and fit it in, I mean, maybe I could with a lot of fiddling around, it's not going to look too great and it's not really fitting exactly into that shape. So we can do it a slightly different way. Let me just delete out this picture and I'm going to click on my object. I'm going to go to shape format and again, I'm going to go down to shape fill, but this time I'm going to select picture. I then get a choice. I can choose something from a file or online pictures. So I'm going to stick with the picture we were just using. So I'm going to say from a file. I'm going to select the picture and click insert. And you'll now see that that picture is exactly inside that shape. And I could go in and change that shape outline as well, just so it looks a bit nicer. And that gives a really, really nice effect. So it's worth knowing all those different techniques of how you can fill shapes and objects. So hopefully that gives you more of an idea of how to work with fill. Let's go over to the second part and continue with some of these formatting options. So I will see you over there. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section, we're going to take a look at formatting objects and we already begun this exercise in the previous module. And now we're going to focus on some of the more advanced objects, particularly again related to fills. So when we left off in the last module, we just put this picture inside this shape, which looks very nice. And we're going to highlight this uh, second shape that we have here, the one that has the word about inside. And I'm going to jump up to my shape format ribbon and we're going to go down to shape fill again. And we're going to concentrate on some of these options that we haven't looked at very thoroughly so far. So I'm going to jump down to gradient. And this is where you can add a gradient fill and you can see you have different variations of it. So light variations and also darker variations as well. So you can always choose one of these and that just gives a nice gradient effect to the fill within the shape. Let's jump back up to shape fill again. And the option underneath that is texture. And this gives us some tiles with some various different textures inside. And I don't tend to use these too often because a lot of the time I've got text within my object and these sometimes make it quite hard to read that text. But just so you can see, we're going to select, uh, let's select this one here, the green marble. And that one's not actually too bad. It's quite dark, so you can still see the text through. So those are pretty much all of the options that you have within that shape fill drop down. Let's move down to looking at some of the options that we have within shape effects. And before I do that, I'm just going to click on the sun shape that I have down here. Go to shape effects and let's look at what we've got in here. So the top one are some presets which are inbuilt into PowerPoint. And again, if you hover over each one, you can see those different effects applying to that sun shape. And some of these are really quite nice. And it is worth having a little play around with them to see if there's any that you think would work in your presentation. The next one down is shadow. So this is if you want to add some kind of shadow effect to your shape. And again, as I scroll over, some of these are fairly similar, but you should be able to see that you get a kind of a very slight shadow on your object. And of course, if you don't want a shadow at all, you can make sure that you have no shadow clicked. Now, reflection is quite a nice one. We did look at this a little bit earlier. But you can see here, I can, if I select this one, for example, you can see that I now have that reflection effect and that can sometimes look really nice on your pictures as well. We then also have below that glow and this will allow you to put kind of like a, a nice glowy area around your object. And again, if I hover over, you can see the different ones as I go through the live preview. So these are definitely worth having a play around with. Now, again, if you don't like these glow variations, you do have the option for more glow colors and you can select any color from the palette or more colors if you want to. And then finally, at the bottom, you also have glow options. 
And this will open up the pane at the side and it will just allow you to make some further more granular customizations to your glow options. So I can change, for example, the size of that glow if I want to increase it or decrease it. And I can also change the transparency so I can make it quite opaque or very transparent. So those are your more advanced glow options. We have an option for soft edges. So again, you can see very slightly as I hover over, some of these are more dramatic than others. In fact, that one, it disappears entirely. And you may decide that you have a use for these. So it's worth having a little look and a little play around with them as well. The next one is bevel. So as I hover over the live preview, you can see that some of these actually make this shape look quite nice. In fact, I quite like that first one. So I'm going to select round. And then the final option that we have in here is 3D rotation. So that will allow you to rotate your shape or your object around through 360 degrees. And we also have some perspective options as well. So loads of ways that you can really apply some really nice effects to your shapes and to your objects in your presentation. Now, it's also worth noting that these aren't the only options that you have. You do have a whole host of advanced options as well. And as always, you can access your advanced options by clicking on the little arrow in the corner of that shape styles group. And you'll see as I hover over, it does say format shape and it says make fine tuned adjustments to the look of your shape using the format shape task pane. So when I click on this, I get that helpful pane pop out to the side. And currently I'm clicked on shape options. So we've got shape options and text options. Now, because I am clicked on a shape, it's taken me straight to the shape options. And the first one that's highlighted is this fill. So the little bucket icon just there. And again, this is where I can choose what kind of fill I have in my particular shape. So I've got no fill. I can have solid fill, gradient fill, so on and so forth. And we've seen some of these already. I'm just going to stop on gradient fill for the moment because you'll see now that underneath I get a whole host of other options which are really going to help me customize the way that my gradient looks so I can get it really really specific. So I have some preset gradients in here and I can also choose the gradient type so linear, radial, rectangular, so on and so forth and each of these just differ very very slightly. I can also change the direction of the gradient. So if I want it coming out from the center, I could choose that one from bottom left corner, so on and so forth. And then underneath here, I can change the color of my gradient. So maybe I want it to be a purple and I can choose my gradient stop. So you'll see as I drag and drop this, it either gives me more or less of the gradient. And I can also drag the yellow one to give me more or less of the yellow as well. So really highly customizable. So I'm going to put it about halfway because I think that that looks quite nice. You then have some additional options at the bottom. So things like transparency, if you want to take the transparency up or down, you can. And also the brightness of your fill. So let's scroll all the way back up to the top. So you can see that there are quite a lot of options in there, which can get a little bit overwhelming. So the best thing I would advise is to just jump in there and have a little play around with all of them. So you get comfortable and familiar with what each one does. So the next icon here is effects. So if you remember, we were in shape effects before. So this is your advanced options for your effects. And again, it really does depend on what effects you have added. So I have glow added to mine which is why glow is expanded. So again, I could go in and I could change the color of the glow if I wanted to. So I could change it to black and I can also change the size of that glow. So I'm actually going to take it down because that's actually quite big at the moment to four points. And again, if I wanted to, I could increase or decrease the transparency on that. Now I'm not going to go through all of these. You'll find you have very similar options for each of these effects. So whether it be shadow, reflection, soft edges, so on and so forth. So just have a little experiment and a little play around. And the final point I want to make here is in regards to pictures again. So say you have a situation where you have a picture that you want to work with, but not necessarily in PowerPoint. So maybe you have a picture that you want to add onto a website or a web page that you have. Maybe it's a blog. 
What you can do is you can copy and paste that picture into PowerPoint and you can utilize PowerPoint's tools. So you can utilize the effects, the outlines, the fills, all of the options. You can edit that picture and then you can save it off or cut and paste it back into your web page or the other application that you're using. So it's a really nice way of being able to edit your picture before you use it in another application as well. So I just wanted to highlight that because I've done that quite a lot of times and I actually find it really useful. So speaking of pictures, we are going to be talking more about pictures in later modules. But first of all, we're going to be talking about arranging objects. That's in the next module. I will see you then. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section, we're going to be talking about arranging objects and what we mean when we say arranging objects is really just making them look neat on the slide. So once again, I'm clicked on slide four and I've just removed a couple of the additional objects that were on there to just leave me with these three standard objects. And we're gonna take a look at how we can align these objects both on the slide and also against each other. Now, essentially on this slide, I have five objects and that's because I include these arrows as well. So each of these three shapes are one object and then the arrows are objects as well. So essentially I have five on this slide. Now, what I'm gonna do here is really just tidy up the way that this looks and make everything look consistent, cohesive and all aligned. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to copy the formatting from this first object across to these other two objects. And we've seen how to do this already previously. We can use the Format Painter utility. Now, if you remember what I said in one of the previous modules is that if you just click the Format Painter once, it will allow you to paint the format to another object just one time. So if you have more objects to paint, in this instance I do because I need to paint three times, then you can double click that Format Painter. So first of all, make sure that you're clicked on the object which contains the formatting that you want to copy. So welcome in this case. Double click on Format Painter and then click on your second object. And you can see the Format Painter is still active so I can just go and click on the third object to copy that formatting across. Now currently I'm still in Format Painter mode. I can see that because I have the little paintbrush icon. So to come out of that, I can click the Format Painter icon again, or alternatively, I can just press the Escape key on my keyboard and that will take me back to a normal cursor. So they look a bit nicer now. They're a little bit neater and they all are the same. But what I really want to do now is to line up these three rectangles. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to select them all. And again, if you remember from a previous module, we can draw our net and that will select every single object within that net. Now, it's also selected the two arrows and I actually don't want to line those up, not in the same way that I'm gonna be doing the rectangles anyway. So to deselect just these two arrows, if I hold down my control key, and just click on the objects, that will deselect. So now I just have the selection that I need. Now there are a few different ways that you can align objects. And as we're already on the home ribbon, we may as well use the options on this ribbon. So you'll see in the drawing group, we have an arrange drop down, And all the way at the bottom, we have a position objects and we have an align option. And this shows you all the different alignment options that you have. And it has very little useful icons next to them. So you can see how your shapes are going to align. So I could choose to align them to the left, to align them to the center or to the right. And these top three will align your objects up and down. These three, align top, align middle and align bottom will align your objects across. So for this, I'm gonna say align them to the top of the highest object. So I can see here the about rectangle is the one that's highest, it's above the other two. So if I select a line top, the other two are gonna jump up to a line with the top of the tallest object. So let's do a line top and there we go. So now I really want to deal with the two arrows. So I'm going to select those arrows by clicking, holding down my control key and clicking again. I'm gonna go back to arrange 
down to a line and this time I'm going to select a line middle and that aligns both of my arrows to the middle. Now one other problem you might come across, and it's not actually too bad in this slide that we have here, is the spacing. So you might find that you have bigger spaces in between your objects which aren't consistent and you just want to make sure that everything is distributed evenly. So once again I'm going to draw a net around my objects to select all of them. I'm going to go up to a range, I'm going to go down to a line, and this time I'm going to use this option here, Distribute Horizontally. And I don't know if you saw there, there was a very slight movement with those arrows just to make sure the spacing is exactly the same for each of them. And I can now click off. So now I've aligned the individual objects, what I might want to do is just align all of the objects on the slide. So at the moment it's kind of in the top, uh, towards the left hand corner and I want this to actually be centered on my slide. Now there's a couple of little useful utilities in here which will help you with that and you'll find them on the view ribbon. And the first thing I'm going to do is say turn on guides and you'll find guides in the show group and when you click it what you'll ordinarily get are these two guidelines and those guidelines will be positioned at zero. So essentially this is going to help me align all of my objects. I'm going to draw my net and really if I want to align this what I'm aiming for is to move this center one, so the center control handle in the about, that's the center of this object, of this grouped object. So I really want to align that and place it on this guideline. So I can pick up my objects and I can try and roughly position them in the right place. If I let go, yeah, I'm not too far off, but if you do need to make some minor adjustments, so I can see that this group of objects needs to go a little bit to the left to make sure it's exactly on that guideline, you can do what we call nudge the objects. If you hold down your control key and then use your right or left arrows, so in this case I'm gonna use left, and I can just nudge that along, and place it exactly over the top of that guideline. I can then do the same but for the other way. So if I want to grab my objects again, when I drag it down I'm really going to want to align with the center control handle just here. So I'm going to grab my objects and I'm going to move them down and let's let go and see where we're at. And wow, that looks pretty good to me. So again, remember, if you hadn't got that quite correct, you could use your nudge, the control and your arrow keys. And when I click off, that's pretty much my objects aligned in the center of my slide. I'm just going to turn off guidelines. So I'm just going to click in that checkbox again and just direct your attention to the option above, which is grid lines. And there is a shortcut key for this. It's shift F9. But we're going to select the checkbox and this will turn on your grid lines. Now what I tend to use this for is if I have some um, other smaller images, so maybe some clip art or a picture, and I want to make sure that I've got those lined up with other objects on the screen. And these can be quite useful for doing that. So remember that you have those grid line options in there, which will just assist you when you're trying to line up objects on your slide and I'm going to turn my grid lines off. Now let's talk about one other thing. Say I want to put a background picture behind the objects that I have. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to insert a picture into my slide and you should be used to doing this by now. We go up to insert, I'm going to go down to pictures and I'm just going to use this picture here and click insert. Now that's quite a large image, so I'm just going to drag the corner handles in and resize it slightly. And I'm going to move it over the top of my object, so you currently can't see those objects behind. Now the way that you have to think about this is that PowerPoint works in layers. So the layer at the front here is the picture, and there's a layer behind which contains the objects. And you can essentially move the layers backwards and forwards to either show or hide the objects. So again, up on our picture format ribbon, you'll see in the arrange group, we have options for bring forward and also send backward. So I have my image selected at the moment and I'm going to say send to back. 
And you can see immediately what that does is it moves that layer, that picture layer, behind the object layer. So I can now see those objects in front. In the next section, we're going to talk about playing with transparencies just so that you can make the objects stand out a little bit more. And I'm also going to show you how to do things like lighten up the picture. And we're also going to talk about things like grouping. So all of that is in the next section. I will see you then. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this module, we're going to be talking about grouping objects, which is really going to help you when it comes to working with lots of different objects that you have on your slide. In the previous module, we left off that we had a picture behind these five objects that you can see here on slide four. And I've actually just removed that picture in order to show you a little bit clearer how grouping works. Now, before we get on to grouping, just something which I want to let you know about. In the previous module, we were talking about aligning objects on the screen, and we aligned our objects in the center of this slide. Now, one thing you might notice is that those two green arrows are not actually aligned to the center of the rectangles. We literally, when we aligned them, we aligned them to the middle. So that's really in relation to each other, so that they were both along the same kind of plane, shall we say. But now I want to align them so that they move up slightly, so they're in the middle of those rectangles. So again, all I need to do is to select all of my objects, so not just the arrows, I'm going to select the whole lot by drawing my net. I'm going to go up to the Arrange group and down to Align, and I'm going to select Align Middle. And you'll see immediately that both of those arrows jump up. Because I've got all of the objects selected, it knows that those arrows need to be aligned in relation to the other objects on the slide. And now I have them perfectly in the middle. So now let's move on to talking about grouping objects together, because it's sometimes easier to work when things on your screen are grouped together and you can move them and edit them in a uniform way. So I'm going to start out by grouping all of these objects. So currently they're all individual. So if I click on them, it just selects that particular object. And I want to group them all together. I'm going to draw my net again around all of my objects. I'm going to go back up to that arrange group. And this time I'm going to select group. And what you'll see immediately happens is that I now have a placeholder around the entire group of objects. And it means that if I click and drag, I'm now moving them as one. And another useful thing here, which is a fairly recent addition to PowerPoint, is that if I want to make sure that I place this exactly back in the center again, if I move across slightly until I get that red dotted line running down the middle, and then start to go down until I get a horizontal line, I can see that that is exactly in the middle when I let go. So that's a really nice way of moving things as one object. If you want to ungroup again, just go back up to Arrange, and you see that now I have the Ungroup option available. I can click it, and they're now back to being individual objects that I can move around independently. Now, it's worth noting that when you're grouping objects, they don't have to be lined up. So these ones are all in line, but maybe I have a couple of other objects on my slide which aren't necessarily in line. So let's draw some more objects. So I'm going to do, let's just do this 12 here. And I'm just going to draw that down here. And let's add another one. I'm going to add, let's add a cross. And I'm going to add that in the top corner. Now these two objects you can see here in green aren't aligned, they're not together, but that doesn't mean that I can't group them. All I would need to do is to select both of the objects. So I have the cross selected already. I'm going to hold down my control key and click on the other green object. I'm going to go to arrange and I'm going to group. And now these two objects are grouped and I can move them together as one. So just remember that you don't have to have them next to each other in order to be able to group them. Now I'm going to quickly ungroup those two and I'm going to delete them. Now let's take a look at another example. I'm going to add another object and this time I'm going to add a star. So let's add the 16 point star. And I'm going to draw a fairly small star 
down in the corner. And I'm going to just modify that by dragging that handle in like so. Now, if you remember, we previously discussed how you can duplicate objects. We press Control D on our keyboard and now we have a duplicate of that star. So maybe I want to drag this star all the way over to the other corner. And again, you can see I get those useful red guidelines which show me that I'm exactly lined up. And I'm going to drop it. And if I wanted to, say, group these and then move them to the top of the slide, I can do that in the same way. So hold down Control and select the other object up to the Arrange drop down and go to Group. And I can now move these as one to the top of the screen. And I'm quickly going to ungroup those. One final thing I want to show you is again, if we make some duplicates of this star, and I'm going to do quite a few, so I'm just going to carry on pressing Control D until I get quite a few stars. It might be that I want to line these stars up in some way. So I'm going to draw a net around them because that is by far the easiest option to select them all. I'm going to go to Arrange. I'm going to go down to Align, and this time I'm going to say Align Center. And now I have those stars running down. I could then group them. So back to Arrange, go to Group, and I can now move them as one to wherever I want to on the slide. I could even, if I wanted to, rotate them and make them look slightly different. So that's how you can group together multiple objects and move them in one go. And that's a really good efficiency tip. It's really helpful when you're moving lots of things around on a slide. So that's it for this module. In the next module, we're going to be doing an exercise. So I will see you then. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. We've made it all the way down to exercise five. And in this exercise, there's a few different things that I'd like you to do for me. And as always, we have some very clear instructions. So first of all, what I'd like you to do is open the file called Practice Presentation 6. I'd like you to add a new slide using the blank layout. And the first thing I want you to do is to take all of the background graphics off of the slide. I then want you to draw a few objects, so those are objects of your choice, it doesn't matter which ones you choose. And I'd like you to go over the formatting options that we've discussed and get familiar with them and where they're located. Make sure that you do play with the fill and the line and effect options. I then want you to take a few of your objects that you've drawn and practice grouping them and also ungrouping them. And then finally, I'd like you to add a picture of your choice inside one of the objects that you drew. I then want you just to save and close that file down. So that's it. Give it a go. See how you feel. And I will see you in the next section. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. So far in this course, we've looked at a number of different options when it comes to pictures, inserting them and also manipulating them very slightly. And I'm back on slide two where we have a picture and I'm currently clicked on it. So it's selected. But some of the things that we haven't worked with with regards to pictures are things like changing the colors or cropping. And we're going to look at some of these basic utilities just to change the look of the picture. Now, this picture that I have here on slide two, it's OK, it's not great, but I could make some changes just to make it stand out very slightly from the rest of the slide. This picture has quite a blue background and because my slide background is also blue, it doesn't really have the impact that I'm looking for. So I want to apply some formatting to this picture really to enhance it and make it jump out at the audience. Now you'll notice that when you're clicked on a picture, as always in any of the Microsoft applications, you get a contextual ribbon. And if you glance up to the top of the screen, you can see we have this picture format ribbon. Now, if you're not really sure what I mean when I say contextual ribbons, they're ribbons that only appear when they're needed. So you'll notice that if I click on something else on here, so maybe if I click on the text, 
I now get a shape format contextual ribbon because that relates to the object I'm currently clicked on. If I click back on the picture, I get my picture format ribbon and this contains all of the options related to formatting this picture. So maybe something I want to do with this picture, just to make it stand out a little bit better, is put a border around the outside. And if you look in the big group in the middle, the picture styles group, you see I have three options just here, picture border, picture effects, and picture layout. So let's jump up into picture border. And what you'll notice immediately is that this is pretty much the same as the options that we got when we were working with shapes. I have my theme colors so I can change the color. I have standard colors and I can also do things like use my eyedropper utility, change the weight, so on and so forth. So I'm going to select a color for my border and just to make this stand out, I'm going to make my border white. Now you can see that it has put a very thin border around the outside and remember you can play around with the thickness of that border. If we go back up to picture border and down to weight, I can choose something that's maybe slightly thicker just to make that stand out even more. So I'm going to go for three points and you could also, if you wanted to, change the way that that border looks. So currently I have a solid line, but I could have a dotted line or rounded dots. I could have squares so on and so forth. Now, I quite like the solid border, so I'm just going to select that one. And now you can see that that picture kind of jumps out from the background. It's not blending in as much. Something else I might want to apply are picture effects. And again, we've seen these when we were dealing with shapes. So I could do things like add a shadow, and you can see we have an outer shadow, we have inner shadows, and we also have perspective shadows as well. So if I look at these at the bottom, because they are the most dramatic, I could add a perspective shadow, which just gives me a little shadow in the corner there, which can sometimes look quite nice. Let's go back to picture effects. I could add a reflection if I wanted to. So why not? Let's do that. I could add a glow around the outside. I could add some soft edges if I wanted to. And I could also make the picture slightly beveled. So I'm going to add a round bevel. And then the final option in that menu is 3D rotation, which allows me to rotate that picture around. Now, I don't particularly want to do that, but just be aware that those options are there if you need them. Now, when you do start adding formatting to pictures, sometimes you might add so much formatting and you just think to yourself, "Ugh, you know what, I just want to reset it back to how it was originally. Unfortunately, there is an option in PowerPoint in order to reset it back to its default settings. So I've got my picture selected. I'm going to stay on my picture format ribbon. And in the adjust group, you have a reset picture option. And I can choose just to reset the picture but I can also choose to reset the picture and the size. So if I'd made some sizing changes, if I've made it bigger or smaller, I can choose to reset that back to the default as well. Now I'm happy with the size. I just want to remove all that formatting that I've applied. So I'm going to say reset picture and it takes me back to how it originally was. One other thing to notice is that you don't just have these options here when it comes to applying formatting to your picture. You do also have some helpful picture styles which you can select from the gallery. And again, if I roll over some of these, you'll see them apply in the live preview. And some of them are really nice. That's quite a nice one, reflective rounded rectangle. So it's worth having a look in here and just having a little play around and seeing which ones you want to apply. I could even make it circular if I wanted to. Now I quite like the rounded rectangle with the reflections. I'm going to select that one. So many of those options for the picture are the same as what we've already looked at when it comes to formatting shapes. So really jump in there and have a little play around. In the next module, we're going to be looking at cropping pictures. So I will see you then. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section, I'd like to discuss cropping pictures. And if you've never come across that word before, cropping, all that means is that sometimes there are areas of a picture that you want to keep and areas that you want to discard. 
So we're back in our presentation and we clicked on slide two and I've clicked on the picture that I have in here. So I have a man standing on a what looks to be a cliff edge looking out across the horizon. Now this is quite a nice picture, but it might be that I want to crop out some areas of the picture. And there are a few different ways that you can utilize the crop utilities in PowerPoint. So let's take a look at all of them. So I'm going to jump up to the picture format ribbon and right in the group on the end, in the size group, you'll see we have an option for cropping. Now I'm going to select this first one here, crop, and what you'll see is it puts these black markers on my picture. And what I can do is if I wanted to crop some of these background out, I could drag this in and maybe drag this down so there's less sky. And if I click away onto the slide, it's going to crop that picture to those specified dimensions. Now it's worth noting when you do crop, you haven't actually deleted anything. The picture that you've cropped out is still there. It's just essentially hidden. Let me show you what I mean. If I click on the picture again and click on crop, you'll see that the picture is still there in the background. So if I wanted to pull it back, I could like so, click away, and I've changed my crop. So when you're cropping, you're not actually affecting the size of the file. If you think that by cropping out large portions of your image, that's going to decrease your file size, that isn't the case. So that is definitely worth bearing in mind. So I'm actually going to put this picture back to how it was. So I'm gonna go back to crop. I'm gonna to go to crop, and I'm just gonna drag that handle back up again. Now, another option that we have when it comes to cropping is we have the option to crop to shape. And this is quite a nice option. It just means that you can select any shape from your shapes library. So I'm going to select this oval and PowerPoint will crop it to that particular shape. So you can see there that actually gives quite a nice effect in this presentation. But again, remember, you haven't actually deleted anything. I could put it back to rectangle if I wanted to. Now that's all well and good. Those are a couple of really nice cropping options. But what if I wanted to go a step further and actually remove all of the background from this picture? So maybe I just want to have this picture where I have the guy standing on this mountain, but I don't want any of the sky or the horizon. How can I specify parts of a picture to crop out? Well, we have a couple of ways of doing this. Again, if we jump up to the picture format ribbon, you'll see the first option that we have is remove background. And if I just hover over that for one second so you can read the screen tip, it says automatically remove unwanted portions of the picture. If needed, use marks to indicate areas to keep or remove from the picture. Now, the success of this really depends on the type of picture that you have. Some pictures are a lot better to use than others. Now the picture I've got here is actually quite a complicated picture to use, which is quite good for this example, because I'm just gonna show you how you can get around the difficulties that this picture presents. Now the first thing I'm gonna do is I am gonna click remove background. And what PowerPoint will do is it will make a kind of guess as to what I want to remove. Now, as I said, this is quite a complex picture. If this was a clip art or something that was a lot simpler, then it would probably get it right the first time. So when I clicked remove background, it would probably exactly select the background that I want to remove. Now in this case, it hasn't. You can see here, everything that's showing in purple is currently what's going to be removed from the picture. And everything that isn't in purple is going to be kept. Now this isn't quite right in this instance. I don't want any of this sky. I just want to keep the guy and the mountain that he's standing on. So this is where I can then utilize these refinement options. If I look up on my background removal ribbon that I now have, I can go in and mark areas to keep. So this is basically allows me to draw lines and tell PowerPoint which parts of the picture to keep. So I'm going to select that. And this is a bit of trial and error. Sometimes it can be a bit tricky, but there we go. I've selected the guy and let's try and select this mountain as well. And as I said, sometimes you have to play around with this a little bit to get it exactly how you want it. So I'm going to carry on drawing my lines. 
And now I want to remove this sky. So I'm going to go to Mark Areas to Remove. And we're just going to draw a line down the middle here and up here and also down here. And let's see if we can get this little bit in between there. There we go. So now I've pretty much isolated the man on the mountain from the background. And all I need to do now is click away and I've completely cropped out that background. So that's a really nice way of doing it. And now it kind of looks like he's sort of floating in mid air. If I wanted to, I could then move the placement of this to make it look a little bit better, like he's coming in from the corner if I wanted to. So let's do that and let's just move this over very slightly. So that's a great way of just being able to crop out that entire background and make your pictures a little bit more interesting. As I said, it is a little bit of trial and error sometimes with this. Now I'm actually going to move him back over here so we can use him in the next section. I'm just going to replace my objects around. I'm going to move him just here and I might decide to make him a little bit bigger as well. And there we go. Those are the three different ways that you can crop a picture. In the next section, we're going to discuss some formatting options that we can use now that we've cropped our picture. So I will see you then. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. So far in this section, we've looked at lots of different ways that we can manipulate and format pictures. So we've looked at basic ways that you can enhance pictures, and we've also looked at cropping. So now we're going to move on to some more formatting options. And what I want to do here is I want to put in a new slide and add a completely new image or picture. And I want this slide to be slide five. So I'm going to jump down and select slide four. I'm going to go up to new slide and I'm going to choose the title only layout. And you can see that that is now slide five. I'm then going to insert a new picture onto this slide. So up to the insert ribbon, and I'm just going to insert one that I already have saved off. So I'm gonna jump down into pictures, and I'm going to select this boat image and click insert. And let's just drag that down. Now I'm going to add a quick title. So let's call this optional activities. And I have my boat picture here, but again, I have all of that white background, which I don't particularly want. It doesn't look great. So just as a bit of a recap, let's remove that background. I'm going to go back to picture format, and I'm going to select the remove background option. Now, as I said, some images are simpler to use than others. And this is a fairly simple one because it's a plain white background and it's a reasonably simple image. I can see though that I do need to make some small adjustments because currently it's going to crop out the sides of this boat. Remember everything in purple is what's going to be cropped out. So all I need to do is mark areas to keep and I'm just going to say this little area just here and also this one just here and that looks pretty much exact to me. And I'm going to click away and there I have my image. And I'm just going to resize that ever so slightly and just move it up. So that looks pretty good. Now there are some additional options you have when it comes to working with images. Let me click back on my picture and up to the picture format ribbon. And you'll see in the adjust group, we've already looked at remove background, but we have some other options in here that we can utilize. So let's click the drop down underneath corrections. And this is where you can make some other minor changes. And you'll see as I hover over, those changes apply in the live preview. Some are more obvious than others. So these ones I can sharpen or soften the image. I can change the brightness like so, and the contrast as well. So really go through, have a little look at those and pick the one that best suits your image. I also have at the bottom here some further picture correction options. So if I click on this, it's going to open up that pane on the right hand side where I can go in and make some more adjustments if I want to. So I can make the image sharper. I could adjust the brightness up and down and I can also adjust the contrast if I want to. You also have in there that reset option, which will allow you to reset the image back to how it originally was. 
just going to close down that pane. The next one on here is color. So this is going to allow you to change things like the color saturation. And let me just move this picture so you can see it as I'm doing this. So back to color. So I can change the color saturation, different levels of saturation. I can change the tone. And I can also do things like recolor it if I want to. So if I hover over, that blue one actually looks quite nice. So I'm going to select that. Again, within color, I have three more advanced options at the bottom. So I have more variations if I want to select a completely different color that isn't already available in the list above. I can set transparent color and I can also open up my picture color options, which as we just saw, allows you to go in and refine some of these settings. So really you can edit this to your heart's content. What we also have is some artistic effects. So again, I don't tend to use these too often, but you might find a use for these. So I can make it look like it's been drawn in pencil or maybe a pencil sketch. I could select any of these that I want to. So I'm gonna say, let's just add a line drawing like so. Now, before we move on, I just want to highlight these three options as well. This first one here, compress pictures. Now remember, every time you add a picture into your PowerPoint presentation, you greatly increase the size of your presentation. So if you plan to email this presentation or you have a lot of pictures in it, then the file size is going to be quite large. So it's a good idea to go through and compress any pictures that you have just to try and keep that file size as low as possible. So I have some compression options in here. So I can say compress this picture only. If I wanted to compress all of the pictures in my presentation, I could just untick this checkbox. The one below is actually quite an interesting one. If you remember when we were cropping pictures, I said to you that it doesn't actually remove the background that you've cropped, it's still there. And so therefore the file size doesn't decrease. If you did want to permanently remove any cropped areas of picture to keep that file size down, you could make sure that you've got that option selected. Now, I don't want to do either of those in this instance, so I'm just going to click cancel, but just make a note that that option is there. I could also change the picture. So if I change my mind and I want to replace the picture I currently have, I could just go in and select a picture from a file or from an online source. So let's quickly do that. Let's go to online sources and I'm going to search for a boat and hit enter. And I have lots of different pictures of boats down here. So let's switch it out for a speedboat and click insert. And there we go. And again, I could go in and do exactly the same as what I did with the previous image. I could delete out this background. So let's go to picture format, remove background. And that's pretty much perfect. So I'm going to click away. And there we have our speedboat. And that last option in this group is reset picture, which as we've seen before, will just reset the picture back to the original settings and discard any formatting changes that you've made. So that's it for your additional picture formatting options. In the next section, I want to really make use of some of the things we've talked about and start working through how you can layer pictures and also some other cool things that you can do. So I will see you then. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section, we're going to be talking about some additional things that you can do with pictures. So we've already done some formatting and some cropping, but now I want to show you some cool things you can do when you mix and match pictures and use pieces or parts of pictures to create entirely new images. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new slide and this is going to be slide number six. So I'm clicked on slide five. I'm going to go up to new slide and I'm just going to add a new blank slide. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a couple of images onto this slide. So let's go up to insert and to pictures. And I'm just going to select some that I have saved off. So the first one I'm going to select is this camera image and I'm going to click insert. So once again, this camera, it's a pretty nice image, but it has that white background that I want to remove. 
So I've clicked on the image and I'm going to select Remove Backgrounds. So this is something we've done quite a lot already. Now I can see that PowerPoint hasn't picked up exactly what I want to remove. So I'm going to mark areas to keep just by dragging a line down here and all the way down here. And hopefully we'll get towards something that looks like the image that we want. And let's draw a diagonal there. And that looks a little bit better. So I'm going to click away and there I have my camera image. Now, one cool thing that you can do is to combine images together to make a really effective image. So what I'm essentially going to do here is I'm going to insert another picture and I'm going to put it inside the camera lens. So let's go back up to insert and down to pictures. And I'm going to grab my old favorite, the coconut trees image and click insert. Now let's just resize that down by using the control handles and move it over there. Now, currently this image is rectangular. It's not going to look too good if I put it inside. So what I want to do is I want to make this into a circle so it's going to fit nicely inside this image. And if you remember, we spoke before about that option of crop to shape. So if we jump up to the picture format ribbon, go all the way across to crop, we have that crop to shape option. And I'm going to go to my basic shapes and select the oval which crops my picture down. Now it's still not quite the right shape, but what I can do is just move it across and I can start to make some adjustments. So I might want to drag it in to make it more circular. And I can really just start to refine that down so that I get it so that it fits exactly inside that camera lens. And click away. And there you go, that looks so much more impressive than just having the two individual images. I could also, if I wanted to, add something like a text box. So let's jump to the home ribbon, click our drawing tools and select the text box shape from our basic shapes. And I might want to say in here that this is a picture of Sri Lanka. And I'm gonna drag and drop that on top of my image. I could then go in and do some formatting changes. So maybe I want the word Sri Lanka in all caps. So I could go up to my font group, click on the arrow in the corner to bring up my advanced options. And one of them is all caps and click on OK. And I also might want to make that bold. And there we go. Very quickly, I've utilized some of the techniques that we've already seen, combined them and made an entirely new image. Let's look at another way of doing this. I'm going to add another blank new slide. So up to new slide and down to blank. And I'm going to insert two images this time. So up to insert, down to pictures. And I'm going to insert this hot air balloon. And if I scroll down, I'm also going to insert this travel frame. So I'm going to hold down my control key so that I can select both of them and click insert. And again, these are quite large, so I'm just going to drag them down and reposition them so I can see them both. Now let's deal with this frame first of all. Now I want to get rid of a lot of this background, not all of it, but a lot of it. So I'm going to select it and click on the remove background button. And it's done not too bad of a job. I'm going to mark a few areas to keep. So I want to make sure I keep the top of the Eiffel Tower and I want to keep Big Ben. And the rest of this looks pretty good. I'm not too concerned about the planes flying around the outside. I really just want this central image. So I'm going to click away and there I have quite a nice frame. And what I want to do is I want to place this hot air balloon inside this frame. Now I'm going to make it slightly smaller and I'm going to move it across to this image like so. Now what I want to do is I want to remove the white background from this hot air balloon and I can do it whilst it's placed inside this other image. So once again, let's click remove background 
mark areas to complete and I'm just going to make or refine my selection to make sure I get all of that hot air balloon in and I think we have some pieces down the side we need to include and I think there's another little bit of the side there like so and the basket at the bottom and click away and there we go. So once again, I've made a really, really nice looking image by combining two images together. Let's look at one final option. So let's insert another new blank slide. And this time I'm going to insert an image of a person. And I'm going to use this image just here and click insert. And let's make it a little bit smaller. And we're going to pretend that this lady doesn't know which trip she should book. So again, I'm going to crop out this background by clicking remove background. And I'm going to mark my areas to complete to refine this. And I think there's also an area at the top of her head that I need to include. And that's good enough for me at the moment. So I'm going to click away. And we have her there, so she's looking pretty good. And what we can do is combine our image here with some shapes that we used earlier. So maybe I want to have a call out, or a thought bubble, I should say. And I'm gonna change the color of this in a moment, but remember that you can adjust where this call out is coming from. So I might want it to look something like that. And then I'm going to add some text into here. So she might be saying, uh, I just don't know which trip to book. And I'm going to make some changes to this text. So I'm going to make it a bit bigger by using my increase font size. And I'm also going to change the color of this speech bubble. So up to shape format. And I could use any of these shape fills, but I might also want to use my eyedropper utility and hover over the image. So I'm going to pick up this sort of slight gray lilac or lavender color. And there we go. Now, once I've done that, I might decide that I want to change that font as well, make it a bit darker. So I'm going to go back into my font and I'm going to make the font a dark purple. And I can also see that I have an outline around my speech bubble that doesn't particularly match. So I'm going to go to shape format, shape outline, and I'm going to do a dark purple there as well. So very quickly, I've been able to make some really nice looking slides just by mixing and matching and combining some of the techniques in relation to shapes and pictures together. So it's definitely worth having a little experiment and a little play around with those. You can really unleash your creativity in this type of thing. So that's it for this module. All that's left for us to do now is our exercise. So I will see you then. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. We've made it through to exercise 06 and as usual I have some instructions that I want you to do. So first of all I'd like you to open the file called Practice Presentation 7. I'd then like you to add a new slide using the blank layout and I want you to add a picture of your choice from the internet and I would recommend finding one that you think you can easily crop. I want you to crop out the pieces of the picture that you don't want and I want you to practice formatting the picture. I then want you to get creative. I want you to try adding one or more additional pictures and combining them and using them together to make a visually appealing slide. Once you've done that, I'd like you to save and close the file. And that's it. I hope you get on okay with that and I will see you across in the next section. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section, we're going to be talking about smart art and smart art might be something that you've never used before or in fact, never even heard of. So I'm just going to start out first of all, just talking a little bit about exactly what it is and how you can use it. 
So I've added a slide into my presentation, slide 10, it's the one you're currently looking at, that shows the board of directors for Wanderlust Travel. And this is a really good example of how you can utilize Smarter in your presentations. You can see here, I've got a very nice kind of organizational chart or diagram, which shows the pictures of the directors. It has their title and their name underneath. And this is really simple to create. You'll see when we go in, there's a whole host of different types of smart art diagram that you can insert into your presentations. And it's a really nice way of representing information in a visual way with very little effort. Now, when you're using smart art, there are two ways that you can use it. You can either directly add it to a blank slide, or you can already have some generic info typed out on your slide and then convert that to a smart art object. So we're going to look at how you can utilize both of those methods. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new slide. So let's jump up to new slide and I'm going to select title and content. And I'm going to add a title in here and we're going to say this is going to show the team members. And then you'll see underneath in my content slide, I have all these different pieces of content that I can add. And one of them is insert a smart art graphic. And this will take me into my smart art graphics library. And as with everything in PowerPoint, they're all categorized. So it really depends on the type of smart art that you're looking for. So currently I'm showing all of them and there's a whole heap of them in there. If I'm looking for something or maybe I want to display information in some kind of list, I have my options for that. Process, this is good for showing sort of process flows. So in this presentation, maybe something like the, the booking process. I have cycle, hierarchy, so that's good for organizational diagrams, relationship, matrix, pyramid, and this one contains all of the smart art diagrams where you can have a picture. And that's basically what I want to use in this example. I want to add in my team members and I want to show their picture as well. So it's really just a case of going in and selecting which one of these is going to be appropriate. So I think I'm going to choose this one down here, which is a vertical picture accent list. And I'm going to click on OK. And that gives me the basic bones of my smart art diagram. So I can come into here and I can type my text. So I'm going to list out my team members. So we have Brian, Fosling, we have Heather, Ganniston, and we have Stacy, who. So I have the names listed, but now I want to add their pictures. And it's worth noting, if you are going to add pictures, you can search for online pictures. But if this is a, a real world situation, most likely you're going to want to save off your team members pictures in order to add them into the presentation. So I've already done that. So I'm just going to click on this icon in the middle here. And this is where I can select from a file or online. So I'm going to jump straight to from a file. And the first one is Brian Fosling. So I'm going to select Insert. I'm going to do the same for Heather Ganniston. And then finally, Stacy Who. Like so. Now it's worth noting that these have come across fairly good, but if you wanted to adjust these pictures, so maybe they weren't quite centered or maybe you were chopping off too much of their head, you can go in and crop these images. So if I wanted to crop this one, if I click on the image and jump up to my picture format ribbon and go into crop, it's going to allow me just to drag that image in and out so I can make it a little bit wider. I can move it up and down just to make sure it's exactly centered in that frame. And very quickly, I've been able to create something that looks really, really effective. So that's how you can create a smart art graphic from scratch. You can insert your title and content slide and select smart art from there. Incidentally, if you did have a blank slide. So let me just insert a blank slide so you can see what I mean. Where I didn't have those icons to insert smart art, I could just go up to the insert ribbon 
and I have the option to insert a SmartArt diagram from there. So I can build it up from a blank slide as well. Now I'm just going to delete that out and I'm actually going to insert another title and content slide because I want to show you a slightly different way of doing this. So this one is going to be testimonials. So we're going to have some customers listed in here. Now it's worth noting that not all SmartArt has to contain a picture. There are many SmartArt diagrams where it's just purely text. And what I want to show you now is how you can take some text that you already have on a slide and then convert that to a SmartArt object. So I'm going to add on some testimonials from different people. So I'm going to say the first one here is Adam Lacey. And I'm going to put their job title underneath as well. So I'm going to say sales director. I'm going to do shift tab to get my first level bullet. And the next one I'm going to put is Mish Na. And we're going to say that she is a creative director. Shift tab to take me back. We're going to say James one and he is the marketing director and I think we'll just have three on there for the time being. So if I had a list that looks something like this and I wanted to convert it into a smart art object all I would need to do would be to highlight the text and you'll see on the home ribbon in the paragraph group we have a convert to smart art button. So let's click that. And I can then go in and select whichever one I want. And I can't actually see the one that I want to use in here. So I'm going to jump down to more smart art graphics. I'm going to go to list and I'm actually just going to choose this very plain one here, the lined list and click on OK. And there you go. You can see now that it's added those in for me. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how you can utilize those smart art diagrams to really give some pizzazz to your presentation. They're so simple and such a quick way of putting in charts, process flows, lists. And you can see how you can start from a blank smart art graphic and also convert things that you already have on your slide into smart art graphics. In the next section, we're going to be furthering this idea and we're going to take a look at how you can modify your smart art graphics. So that's what's up next and I will see you then. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section, we're going to start to take a look at modifying smart art. So this really carries on from the previous module where we added some smart art in. I'm now going to show you some of the options that you have when it comes to changing elements of your smart art and editing it. So I'm currently clicked on slide 12 and this is the line object or line smart art diagram that we added in the previous section. So I'm going to click on it and just show you a couple of other options that we have. The first one I want to show you is if you look down on the left hand side of where I'm currently clicked, you'll see that there is an arrow pointing out to the side. Now if you click this, what you'll get is a little pop out, which is showing you the text that you have in your smart art diagram. Now you'll see this on some smart art objects that you place into your slides. And this is quite useful because sometimes depending on the layout of the smart art diagram, it can be quite hard to edit some of the pieces of text. So if you have this little pop out, it makes it a lot easier. So I could come in here and I can make some changes if I wanted to and it will update in my smart art diagram. So don't forget that you have that little text pop out to make any changes that you need to. Now, one of the things that you might want to do is that if you've added a piece of smart art like I have here, it might be that at a later time you change your mind and you maybe want to change the layout of that piece of smart art. Well, it's okay, you can still do that even if you've got another piece of smart art already in the slide. So let's jump up to the Smart Art Design ribbon. And you'll see that in the middle there, we have a layouts group. And if I just click that more drop down, this allows me to switch to any of these different layouts. And you'll see as I roll over, I'm getting a live preview in the slide behind. So I could go through and I could select any of these. 
If I didn't fancy any of these which are currently showing, I could click on more layouts at the bottom, which will pop up that entire smart art gallery. And I'm currently clicked on all, so I can scroll through and find the piece of smart art that I want. Now I'm fairly happy with choosing one of these which are available in the layouts menu just here. So I am going to choose, let's do this one here, vertical box list. Now once I do that, I have some other editing options on my SmartArt design ribbon. So let's pay attention to these SmartArt styles first of all. I'm going to click the more drop down again. And you can see what PowerPoint has done is it's looked at the smart art and the text that I have on this slide and it's given me a selection of five smart art diagrams or five smart art layouts, I should say, which would best suit the text that I have. So I've got here my best match for document items. And if I hover over, you can see some of these. And I also have down here some 3D effects as well that I could use if I wanted to. Now I'm just going to choose this one here, the subtle effect, like so. What I could also do is change the colors of my smart art diagram. So if I click change colors, what I'll see here are some primary theme colors at the top. So these are really the ones which are best suited to the theme that I've selected. I then have some colorful themes. I have some with different accents for different colors. So you can go through and choose whichever one you think is suitable for your particular diagram. So I'm going to mix this up a little bit and I'm going to select colorful accent colors. Now, a couple of other things of interest on this ribbon. If you look all the way over to the left hand side where you have the create graphic group, what you'll see here is that you have some buttons that are active. So for example, this button here where it says move down. This is if you want to reorganize the order of the items in your list. So I'm clicked in Michael Lacey and you can see that move down is active. So if I click that, it's going to move that item down into the list and I can click it again to move it down again. And of course, I also now have move up so I can reorganize. So remember that you have those in there as well. I also have some demote and promote buttons. So if I click demote, it's going to demote Michael Lacey from a top level heading to a second level heading. And let me do promote and that will put him back to where he was. So you do have some additional options in this little group for managing and manipulating that smart art graphic. Now, if you get way into this and you find that you've made lots and lots of changes, remember, if you just want to get back to basics, if you just want to reset everything and remove the formatting that you've applied, you do have a reset graphic option right over in the right hand corner and that will discard all of the formatting changes you've made. And then finally on the end here, you have a convert button. So, so this will allow you to convert your smart art diagram back to just plain text. So in this case, a bulleted list. I could also convert to a shape if I wanted to so that it can be resized, moved or deleted independently of the remaining shapes. Now I'm not going to do either of those two options. I'm going to leave my smart art diagram as it is. Now, one of the really useful things with smart art diagrams is the ability to create a flow chart. So instead of drawing all the boxes and the arrows, you can use a smart art diagram. And that's what we're going to look at in the next module. So I will see you then. Hello again, and welcome back to my course on PowerPoint 2019. In this section, we're going to take a look at how you can use SmartArt to create a flowchart. Now, flowcharts are a fairly common thing to add into PowerPoint. And what you'll find is the way that most people do them is that they add the individual shapes in order to build up that flowchart. So you might add a few rectangles, you might add some block arrows in between them to show some kind of process and you might add some text within those rectangles. And that's perfectly fine if you want to do it that way, but it is quite time consuming, particularly if the chart is quite large or quite detailed. So why not take all the pain out of it by utilizing SmartArt and you can have it done in just a few clicks. So that's what we're going to work through in this module. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new slide. So up to new slide. 
and I'm going to select title and content. Now I'm going to give my slide a title and what we're going to display here is the booking process. Now I'm just going to have three items in my booking process and I'm going to type them underneath here and have them as bullets. So the first one is going to be find trip. My second bullet is going to be book trip. And my third item is going to be pay deposit. So those are essentially the three steps of my booking process. So I'm now going to convert this list to a smart art process chart. So I'm going to highlight all of these. And if you remember up on the home ribbon in the paragraph group, we have this option here, convert to smart art. And I can go through and I can select any one of these. Now I'm looking for a specific process flow diagram. So I'm going to go into more smart art graphics. And let's just move that up out the way. And you can see one of the categories is process. So this is sort of where I'm going to find some of the options that I might want to use. So I can have one which is just a basic process chart or I can make them more complex if I like. So let's have a look. Let's choose. Let's just do this very basic one just here. And I'm going to click on OK. And there we go. Really quickly, I've just managed to make that process flow chart. Of course, remember that once you insert your SmartArt graphic, you then have the SmartArt design ribbon, which opens up all of those formatting options. So I might want to go in and very quickly change the color. So I'm going to make this consistent with my previous slide and just add the colorful accent colors. I'll leave the rest of the options for you to play around with, but hopefully you can see just how simple that is to very quickly create a process flow diagram. Now, one other thing I just want to point out whilst I'm here is the ability to add more processes into this. So, for example, if I want to add another one onto the end here, so maybe after pay deposit, they have to pay balance. I'm going to click on my final uh, shape. I'm going to go up to the Smart Art Design ribbon. And in this first group, you can see I have add shape. So I'm just going to click that and it adds another one onto the end. And I can just go in and say pay balance. So I can do that for any of these. If I wanted to insert one in the middle, I would just need to make sure that I have the book trip selected. Then when I add a shape, it's going to appear in between book trip and pay deposit. So nice and easy to add more in once you've got that smart art diagram there. So that's pretty much it for Smart Art and how you can utilize it in your PowerPoint presentations. We're now going to do an exercise to make sure you're okay with everything that we've covered so far. So I will see you then. Hello again and welcome back to our course on PowerPoint 2019. In the preceding section, we've spoken a lot about smart art and working with the different elements of smart art. So in this exercise, I want you to utilize some of those skills that you've learned. So let's take a look at the instructions. I'd like you to open the file called Practice Presentation 8, and then I would like you to add a slide using the title and content layout. I'd like you to type in the title, our team, and then I'd like you to type a bulleted list using these names. So we have Felicia Klein and she's the president. We have Ben Lee and he's the vice president. And we have Phil Yang, who is the treasurer. I then want you to select that list and convert it to a smart art object. I'd like you to change the layout of the smart art object to one of your choosing. And then finally, I'd just like you to save and close the file. Hi there and welcome to Microsoft Word 2019. My name is Deb and I'm going to help walk you through these series of videos as you go through this online course. But first, I want to very quickly introduce myself and also tell you what to expect in this course. So my background is that I've been a Microsoft IT trainer for just over 11 years now and I've worked in the wider IT industry for over 23 years. I'm also a TAP certified trainer and a Microsoft Office specialist, and I just love teaching people just like you how to improve their skills across all of the Microsoft applications. And I really think you're going to like this new version. 
Before we get going, I just want to set some expectations about what you can hope to achieve or expect in this course. We're going to start at the very beginning. I'm not going to assume that you know anything. So if you have a little bit of experience with Word, then this course is going to be just perfect for you. But also, if you're somebody who maybe utilizes Word every day at work, but you're self-taught and have never attended any um, official training, then you're probably going to pick up a lot from this course as well with regards to little efficiency tips, keyboard shortcuts, just those little things that can make your life so much easier. We're going to go through all of the basics. So we're going to create documents, save them, do all different kinds of edits to our documents. We're going to add different graphical elements into our documents. So charts, smart art, pictures, and some new things to 2019 like icons and 3D models. We're going to see how we can work with templates, paragraphs, tables, styles, all of those kinds of things, too numerous to mention at this moment in time. So we have so much to cover. So what I want you to do is grab a pen and paper or a laptop, sit back and walk through these videos with me. There is a practice exercise at the end of every section and you'll see there is a quick Q&A to make sure that you're okay with the key concepts as we go through. And the cool thing about learning Word is that when you move on to some of the other Microsoft applications, maybe PowerPoint or Excel, so many of the utilities cross over. So you'll already have a really good foundation for learning those applications as well. So that's it. I can't wait to walk through this course with you. So please join me in the first module. I'll see you over there. Hi everyone and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. In this module, we're going to start out by taking a look at the Microsoft screen. So really just getting an overview of everything that we're looking at on the screen. So you can start to identify some of the options that you have and also understand some of the terminology that we're going to use throughout this course. So what we're looking at here, first of all, is a blank document. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is if you cast your eyes up to the top of the screen, we have what we call the title bar. So currently my title bar says document one and it says dash word. So it's identifying the application that I'm currently in. And it's also showing me that I haven't yet named my document. So you'll find that when you create a new blank document, the default name will be document one, document two, document three, and so on. So just be aware of that because you will see this change when we get around to saving this document a little bit later on. Directly underneath that, we have some tabs. And this is what I mean by tabs. You currently can see home and insert. And then we have draw design, layout, references, mailings, review, view, developer, and help. Now, what you see on your screen might differ very slightly to what I have. It really depends which one of these tabs you have turned on. But in general, you will see running across the top these tabs. And what these tabs contain are what we call ribbons. And those ribbons house all of the commands that you need. So you can see, for example, I'm currently clicked on the Home tab, which is showing me the Home ribbon, which is all of these commands running across the top here. And in general, these commands are organized onto their corresponding ribbon. So in general, what you'll find on the Home ribbon are the commands that you use most often. So things like formatting commands, cut, copy, paste, um, lots of things to do with finding and replacing words in your document, paragraph options, all of that kind of stuff. I'm not going to go through all of the ribbons, but just know that they are organized logically with their corresponding commands. Directly underneath the ribbons, we have what we call the quick access toolbar, which you can currently see. I have a few different commands on my quick access toolbar. If I hover over the first one, you can see I have the save command. I then have the undo, the redo. I also have a spell check. I have a new blank document. I have a macro that I've set up and I also have an insert address. Now I've customized these very slightly and you can customize this quick access toolbar. Now the whole point of it is to give you quick access
access to the commands that you use most often. So that will vary greatly from person to person, depending on what you do in your daily work. So these are some of the ones that I use most often, but as I said, you can customize them. If you click the drop down on the end, you'll see you have lots of different options that you can add to that quick access toolbar. The ones that are currently ticked are already on the toolbar, and I could choose to add any of these ones listed here if I wanted to. Alternatively, if I wanted a completely different command, which isn't listed here, I could go to more commands and select something to add to that quick access toolbar from there. And again, we'll cover that in more detail a little bit later on. But just be aware that that is a completely customizable toolbar just to help you access the commands you use most often quickly. Now, another thing I should point out before we move on fully in relation to these ribbons, again, I'm clicked on the home ribbon. You'll see that the commands are organized into groups. So we have here clipboard, font, paragraph, and styles. And at the bottom of each of those groups, you'll see that there's a little downward arrow. And if you click that, what you'll find is more advanced options or more options related to that group. So again, just be aware that you're not limited to the commands that you can see within the group. If it has a drop down arrow, if you jump into there, you'll more than likely find some more advanced commands in there as well. Moving to the top of our document, you'll see that we have a ruler running across the top and we also have a ruler running down the side. And on this top ruler, you might be able to see these little sort of triangles and this little block at the bottom. And you'll see as I hover over, it says left indent, hanging indent, and also first line indent. So we're gonna get into this a bit later on, but this helps you align your text in your document. You can move the indents in and out. So just be aware of the ruler and the indent functionality on there. Moving down to the bottom of the screen, we have the status bar. And on the left hand side of the status bar, this gives us some general information about our document. So you can see that I'm in section one and I'm on page one of one. I currently have zero words in my document and it's also telling me that my language is set to English United States. And obviously these are going to change as I start to add things into my document. And then all the way over on the right hand side, this is where we'll find our views. And this is just a quick way of switching between views. And these buttons relate to how you're currently looking at your document. So you can see the first one there is read mode. And if I switch over to it, it gives me a different way of looking at my document. Now it gets rid of basically everything on the screen and just leaves my document. Now I don't have anything in my document at the moment, which is why it's showing as nothing, but that's quite a nice way of switching to something. It just gives you a little bit more real estate on the page so you can see more clearly exactly what you're looking at. So it's great if you're trying to read through a document. The next view we have is print layout view. Now that's the view that you'll be in by default. And in general, that's the view that you'll be in when you're working in your documents. And the next one along is the web layout view. So again, if you're preparing something which is going to go on the web, so maybe you want to include things like HTML code, you would go into this web layout view and compose your document that way. I'm going to switch back to print layout view. And the final thing we have down here is a zoom slider. So again, I can just drag this up and down if I want to zoom in or zoom out of that document. It's also worth noting that these commands down here, so the views and the zoom can also be accessed from the view ribbon at the top here. So you can see the first group that we have are views and we have a couple more views on there as well. And we also have some zoom options as well. And then really the final thing to point out on this screen is the scroll bar at the side. So I can scroll up and down. And obviously if I have more pages, it will allow me to scroll through all of my pages. So that's basically a very quick overview of what you're currently looking at in this word screen. So hopefully that's kind of got you a little bit more used to the terminology I'm going to be using throughout this course and has made you a little bit more familiar. It's a great base for us to jump off into our next module. And that's going to be looking at the backstage view. So please join me for that. Hi again, everyone, and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. In this module, we're going to start to explore the backstage area or the backstage view, as you might hear it referred to.
Now, it's worth noting that the backstage view is common to all Microsoft Office products. So if you're working in PowerPoint or Excel or even something like Outlook, then you will find that there is a backstage view. Now, you might be wondering where it is. How do I access it? Well, very simply, it's just this file tab at the top here. So let's click on file. And what you'll find in here, and the reason why it's called the Backstage View, is this is where you'll find all of those kind of admin -y tasks related to your document. So if we start with this menu running down the left-hand side, you can see it's divided into a couple of sections. In this top section, we have three icons. So we have Home, and if I was to click that, it's going to take me to the Home screen, which we'll get to a little bit later on. I then have New. And this is where I would go if I wanted to create a new document, either a new blank document or one that's maybe based on an inbuilt template. I have open, which is where I would go if I wanted to open a new file or something that I had saved off somewhere. I then have info. Now, this is where I will find all of the information related to the document that I currently have open. Now, we haven't saved this document. It doesn't contain any text at the moment. So there's not a great deal of information to show you about this document in here. If you look on the right hand side, this is where you'll find all the properties and you'll see that these will change once we start doing some of those things. So you can see here currently it tells me the document isn't saved yet. It tells me I have one page and there are zero words. How long I've been in that file, so 19 minutes. And I could go through and do things like add a title and tags, which will all help with searching and things like that. So just be aware that if you're looking for information about the file that you're currently working on, this is worth jumping into and taking a look. Now, if we move back to the right hand side, we have some other things in here which we could use in our document. So the first one here is protect document. And really you would come in here to control what types of changes other people can make to this document. So for example, if you're sharing this document with other people, so maybe you've sent it to a client or a work colleague or someone else in your team, then you can have some control over what they can do with that file. So you can apply some editing restrictions if you want to. And that is where you'll find all of those kinds of options. And again, this is something we will explore a little bit later on, but just be aware that it's there. We then have an inspect document or a check for issues button, I should say. And what this allows you to do is once you've completed your document and it's finished, you can inspect your document or run a little check on your document to make sure that it has certain things. So to make sure that it's accessible by others and also to make sure that there's no incompatibility issues. And what I mean by that is that we're using Word 2019, but you need to be aware that maybe somebody that you're sharing this document with has an older version of Word. So it's worth pointing out or it's worth highlighting in your document or finding out in your document which elements they won't be able to view because there's some functionality that you'll find in 2019 which isn't available in older versions. So say, for example, there was a new font in 2019 and you use that font in your document, then you'd send it to someone who doesn't have that version of Word, they might not be able to see that font that you've chosen. And that's the same with some other things as well. So it's always worth checking if your document is compatible and making necessary changes before you send it out. So all of those kinds of things you can find under that inspect document button. You also have a manage document area. So this is where you can go back and recover unsaved versions of your document. And I think we've all probably done that from time to time. We've started typing away. We've forgotten to save. And then maybe we've closed it down and we think, oh my God, I've lost everything. Well, one of the good things about Word 2019 is that it does constantly save your document. So you can go in here and if you do have previous versions available, it will show under this manage document and you can click to restore it. So it's a little bit of a lifesaver. So remember where that button is in there as well. Underneath that, we then have save and then save as. Now these two do work slightly differently. What you'll see is with save, you have to have your document saved first before you can just utilize save. So if I was to click save now, it's going to ask me where I want to save or it's going to jump me to the save as area because I haven't saved my document yet. 
Now, if I had saved my document and I just wanted to save some changes that I'd made, I could just click the Save button and it would look like nothing has happened, but it does actually save to the file name. So that's the difference between the two. This one is just for a save and a document that you've already saved as a name. And this is where you would go if you wanted to select a folder and save your document for the first time. We then have a history area. Now it's currently greyed out for me because I haven't done any work on this document. But again, this is where you'll be able to find previous versions of your document. I then have print, which is pretty much what it says on the tin. If I've created a lovely looking document and I want to print that out, I can come in here. I can select my printer and I have all my various printing options in here. I have a share button, so this will allow me to share my document. And again, there are a few different ways that I could do that. I could choose to email it. I could save it to the cloud and send a link to people. I could present it online or I could even post it to a blog. So lots of options in there when it comes to sharing. We then have export. So I come here mainly if I want to create a PDF file. So if you've never used a PDF before, it's really a version of your document which is very hard to edit. So if you want to protect your document or you don't want people to be able to easily go in and edit your document, it's always worth saving the document or creating a PDF of your document before you send it. Now, that isn't a hard and fast rule. There's lots of pieces of software these days which will allow people to edit PDFs. But in general, to add that extra layer of security, creating a PDF is a good option. So that is where you would come to do that. And then finally, we have a close button at the bottom, which I won't click because it will close down my file. But again, that's pretty much what it says on the tin. If you want to close your document, click on close. Then at the bottom, we have our third and final section. We have account, which just gives me some details about my account information. So you can see some information about me and you can also see the version of Office that I'm using in this case, 2019. I have a feedback button, so if I want to be helpful and send some useful feedback to Microsoft, I could do that if I wanted to. And then finally, we have the options area, and this is an area we're going to cover in great detail later on. But this is where you'll find all of those little options, things you can set as default and little changes you can make to how Word works in general for you and it is specific to you. So this way you can really customize how your version of Word works. And there are so many options in here. As I said, we will get around to exploring these in more detail a bit later on. I'm going to cancel out of there and just jump back into the file area. The final thing you'll see is this back arrow at the top here. And you can probably guess what this does. If I click on this arrow, it just takes me back to the document I was in. So that's a very brief run through of some of the stuff that you'll find in that backstage area, everything that's lurking behind that file tab. And hopefully again, it's expanded your knowledge of some of the terminology that we're going to use throughout this course. So now we've wrapped our heads around that. We're going to move on to creating a new blank document, which is very exciting. So join me in the next section for that. Hello again and welcome back to my course on Word 2019. In this module, we're going to start to explore how you can create your first blank document. Now, when you first open up Word 2019, as I've done here, you'll be presented with this home screen. And what you'll see in the main body of the screen is a list of recent documents. So these are recent documents that I've been working on and they're all listed under here. So I can just double click on any of these and it will open that particular document. So it's a really good way of just being able to quickly open things that you've been working on recently. So that's just a little bit of information for you on how to access recent documents. But what we want to concentrate on in this module is how to create a blank document. If you cast your eyes to just above that recent list, you'll see the first thing that we have there is in fact a blank document. So it's fairly straightforward. You can probably guess what you have to do here. Just simply click on blank document to create a new one. But before we get on to doing that, I just want to show you some other options that you have in this area when it comes to creating new documents. Now, if you don't want a blank document, you might decide to create a new document based on a specific template. And Word has a number of different templates that you can utilize in order to do that. 
Now, if you've never used a template before and you're not really sure what they are, it's just really a good starting point. So for example, if you know that you need to create a resume or maybe some meeting notes, you can search for a specific template related to a resume or meeting notes, and it will already have a lot of the information or the layout that you want for that particular document. So I have a few up here. You can see we have blue, gray resume, welcome to Word, single space, so on and so forth. And I also have a more templates link, which I'm going to click on. And now I can go through and I can really get a good look at some of the templates that are available for me to use. And there is a whole host of them in here and they definitely are worth checking out if you've never been into this section before. Now, if you are looking for something very specific, you can search for it up here. So again, if we use the example of resume, I can just type it in, click on the magnifying glass. It will search the templates and it will pull back a list of all of those resume templates. And if I find one that I like, I can just click on it and then I can start working on it. So very, very simple. Now, I don't want to use a template at this stage. We are going to get into that a bit later on. I just want to create a new blank document. So very simple. Now, what I'm going to do from here is I'm going to click on this little arrow. So the one that says all, I'm going to click it. So we go back and I'm going to select blank document. So now we've created a blank document and you can see in the title bar, it just says document one because we haven't saved it yet. Now, there's a few things I just want to highlight to you with regards to typing in your first document. You'll see I have the cursor flashing and you can see it doesn't flash right at the edge of the page on the left hand side. There is a little bit of a margin left in there, about an inch or so. And you can see that that's where when I start typing, that's where all my text is going to start coming out. So I'm just going to type a very basic line first of all. So let's say uh, this is my first document. Now, if I was to carry on typing, when I get to the end of a row, I don't need to hit the enter key in order to go on to the next line. It will just automatically wrap as I start typing. So you can just continue typing your text and it will wrap itself around. So don't feel the need to hit enter at the end of a line. If however, you do want to force a line break. So if I was here, and I wanted to do something on a different line, I could hit the enter key and that will take me down to the next line and I can carry on typing again. Like so. One other thing to notice is that if you're at the start of a line and you start to type a sentence and you don't capitalize the first letter, Word will automatically capitalize it for you. So if I just start to type in the same thing as above, so uh, let's say this is how, you see there it capitalized it for me without me needing to go back. That's due to Word's autocorrect feature. It recognizes certain things and it will change it for you, making your life a lot easier. We are going to explore a lot of the autocorrect options in the following modules. Now, some other things for you to be aware of. Let me just go in and I'm just going to delete out that text that I've just written. I'm going to go up to the line above and I'm actually going to spell the word breaks wrong. So I'm going to add an E in there and click away. Now what you'll see is I get that red squiggly underline and that tells me that I have a spelling error in that word. So what I can then do is hover over the word and if I right click my mouse, it's going to give me a whole host of options. And more often than not, the word that you're looking for is normally in this list. If it isn't, then you will have to go in and just make the change manually. But I can see here that mine is, it's the top one, so I can just select it and make that change. Now also, I'm going to jump back into this sentence and I'm going to add a comma and a space space. And I'm going to click at the end. And you can see now that words also picked up that there's something wrong there. There's a grammatical error. And this kind of error is very common, particularly when you're typing quite fast. You might accidentally put a comma in, hit the space bar twice. But I can see now with that double underline, if I right click, it's telling me how I should fix that. So it's saying how and comma would be better there. Now, when it comes to spelling words wrong, I'm just going to put that spelling error back in there again. And if you right click, 
you can choose to add the word to a dictionary as well. So there will be some instances where you'll type a word, um, maybe it's the name of someone or the name of a place. Sometimes word doesn't recognize things like that. And it will tell you that it's spelt wrong when actually it isn't. It's just not recognized by word. So if you do have that, you can select add to dictionary and it will then add that word into the word dictionary so that the next time you type it, it doesn't register as any kind of spelling error. So just be aware of that as well. And all of these options are available in that right click menu. Now, just a couple of other things I want to highlight before we move on to the next module. If I wanted to do another blank document, I would just go up to file. I would go to new and I would select blank document. And what you'll notice now, if you look up in the title bar, is that it now says document two. So it hasn't closed down my original document. It's just underneath the one that I'm currently working on. Now, if I do want to switch between the two, or in this case, switch back to the first document, there are a couple of ways that I can do that. I can either hover my mouse down in the status bar at the bottom over my word icon. So I have my word icon pinned to my toolbar there, and it will allow me to see both of my documents. And I can then choose which one I want to move to. So I can switch back to document one. I could also go up to my view ribbon and I could say switch windows and it will list there all of your open documents. So again, I could choose to switch back to document two. So really nice and easy to be able to switch between any or all of the documents that you have open. And of course, if you want to close your document, then you can do that very easily as well. Now I will warn you, if you look right up in the top right hand corner, you have this big cross icon where it says close and that will close all of Word. So just be aware of that. I tend to like to just go to file and down to close if I'm just looking to close one file. So hopefully that sort of explains how to create a new document and how to first start typing and some of the little things that you might see as you start typing into your first document. We're going to move on now to the next module where we're going to be talking about working with non-printing characters and line spacing. So please join me for that. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. In this module, we're going to start to discuss how you can work with non-printing characters and line spacing. And what we mean by that is that there are certain characters, so for example, things like space, enter, tab, that you can't see. And what I'm going to show you in this module is how you can make those visible so that you can work with your document a little bit better. And we're also going to be taking a look at line spacing as well and how you can adjust line spacing when you're typing in your document. So the first thing I'm going to do here is we have a blank document in front of us and I'm going to set this up as a very basic letter. So I'm going to start by typing in a date. So I'm just going to start by creating a basic letter. And the first thing I want to type on the top of this letter is the date. So I'm going to type in a date. So let's say um, July. And as I start to type, you can see it's picked up July 25th, 2019. So if that is the date that I want, then I can just hit the enter key and it will insert that date automatically for me. So that's a great time saving tip there. So now I'm going to want to address this letter to someone. So I'm going to press my enter key, which will take me down a line and I'm going to type in two and I'm going to put in a colon and then I'm going to press the tab key on my keyboard, which will give me a little bit of space in there. And what tab does exactly is that it stops at the half inch mark on the ruler. So you could press tab numerous times and it would move across half an inch across the page each time you press it. And the good thing about using tabs as opposed to putting in lots of space to get your cursor where you need it is it ensures that everything will be lined up. So you'll see if I go underneath and I start to type something, if I press the tab key, it's going to jump me across directly underneath where the tab was in the above line. So it just makes it a lot easier to line up things rather than pressing that space bar over and over again to move your text along. So I'm going to say to oops, Adam, I'm going to press my enter key and I'm going to type the word from, I'm going to put in a colon and I'm going to press my 
tab key again and you see what I mean it's directly lined up underneath where I have Adam so I'm just going to type in my name underneath there so just remember that you have those tabs when you're working in a document as well and I'm going to show you a little bit later how you can adjust those and how you can set up your own custom tabs as well so that things line up wherever you want them to line up on the page now I'm going to press enter a couple more times and I'm going to start my document and we're going to say uh, call Mr. Jones to check your order. The item you want is out of stock. And will not be available to order until next week. Now a couple of things to note there, you'll see that as we got to the end of the sentence, it just wrapped around, I didn't have to hit my enter key, I didn't need to put a line break in there, just to get that to wrap around onto the next line, which is perfect. And you'll also note that we have a little squiggly line under where it says Mr. So if I right click and look at my options, I can see there the top one is probably what I want, so Mr. Dot Jones. So I'm going to add a little bit more text in here. If you have any more questions please call me I'm gonna go down a couple more lines just by hitting my enter key and then I'm going to put regards and then my name so we've created a very basic letter just there and we've utilized some tabs, we've got some spaces in there, we have some enters or some carriage returns as we used to call them in the old days. But we can't see any of those. Now you might think to yourself, well, I don't actually really need to see the tabs, the spaces, but sometimes it is actually very useful. And I'll give you a couple of examples why in a moment. But there is something that you can turn on in Word which will show you all of those non-printing characters. And it's called the Show Hide button. And you'll find it here on the Home ribbon. In the Paragraph group, you have this little thing which looks like a paragraph marker. And when you hover over, it says Show Hide. And the dialog box says Show Paragraph Marks and Other Hidden Formatting Symbols. So if I turn that on, now look at the document, you can see what we have. So everywhere that there is an enter, you can see the little paragraph mark. You can see the little arrows which indicate that tab as well. So this is useful in situations like, for example, have you ever had it where you've printed a document and you get a blank sheet of paper at the end of your printing and you can't work out why because you don't have anything on that piece of paper? If you turn on your paragraph marks, what you'll normally find is that you have a rogue or maybe a few of them, paragraph markers or extra enter keys on the next page, which is why that page is printing. So all you need to do is go in and delete out those additional lines. So without turning on that show hide, you wouldn't be able to see those and you wouldn't know that was what was causing that blank page to print out. So sometimes it is very useful to be able to see these non-printing characters. So I'm going to turn that off for now just by clicking on the same icon again. And we're going to look at line spacing this time. Now what you'll notice with Word is that when you press the Enter key, so say for example like I did between to and from, you get quite a big space in between there. So that doesn't look like single line spacing, that's actually double line spacing by default. So what I want to do is I want to tidy this up a little bit. So I'm going to select all of my document or all of the text in my document. And there is a quick way of doing that and that is the shortcut key, Control A. And you'll see as I do that it highlights everything. What I'm then going to do is I'm going to jump up to my home ribbon in the paragraph group and this little drop down here is for line and paragraph spacing. And I can go through and as I hover over, you'll see I get more or less space in between my lines in my document. So it's really up to you which one you want to select. Now, because I've selected my whole document, it's adjusting the line spacing according to the line spacing that was already there. So say, for example, I only wanted to adjust the line spacing in this to from area. I could just highlight that bit there. I could go up 
and then I could make it smaller, I can make it bigger, or I can go into line spacing options, and I can really go to town with how much space in before and after that I want. So if I don't like this space in between, I can see here in the spacing area, it's actually because of this eight point spacing after. So I could take that down to zero, click OK, and I now have no space in between. OK, so definitely worth having a little play around with some of those line spacing options. You do also have a couple at the bottom here, so add space before paragraph or add space after paragraph. So again, it depends exactly what you want to do, but everything is very customizable in this area. So we've seen how we can turn off and on those paragraph markers so that we can show or hide those non-printing characters. And we've seen how we can adjust line spacing. What I want to talk to you about next is saving. So that's in the next section. I will see you then. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. In this module, we're going to talk about saving a document. Now, this is the document that we created a few moments ago. And if you look at this document, it's quite difficult to tell on first look if it's been saved or not. But there are a couple of clues. And the biggest clue, I guess, would be if you look up into that title bar at the top of the document, it just says document one at the moment. Now, because it doesn't have a name, it means that I haven't saved this document. Remember, document one, two, three is the default name you get when you create a new blank document. So that's how I know that this document isn't saved. So the first thing I want to do is to save this document to a location of my choice. Now, as always in Microsoft, there are a few different ways that you can save a document. So I could go across to my quick access toolbar and you'll see the first icon there is the save icon. Now, again, normally, if I had already saved this document and I've then made some changes, I could just click save and nothing would happen. It would just save my changes to the file name. But because I haven't saved this document yet, if I click on save, it's going to jump me to that save as area. Let me just go back for one moment. So that's the first way you could do it. You could click on the icon if you have it on your quick access toolbar. The second way of doing it, which essentially is going to take me to the same place we were just in, it's just a slightly longer way, is to go into that backstage area. So I could go to File and down to Save As. Now this Save As screen might look a little bit unusual if you're not used to it. Again, this is similar in all of the Microsoft applications. What you have on the left hand side is you have a list of recent folders. So again, it's going to show me all of the folders that I've recently saved into. Or alternatively, I have different locations where I can choose to save this document. So I could choose to save it to OneDrive, which is cloud storage. So that would be a great option if I wanted to collaborate on this document. So specifically, if I wanted to share it with other people and also if I wanted to make sure that I could access this document from wherever I am, I would save it into OneDrive into the cloud. Alternatively, I could choose to save it to any other location. So I could choose to save it to my local drives on my PC and I could choose to browse to a specific location as well. So I'm going to click on browse and I can now choose a location from my local folders. So I'm going to scroll up and I actually am going to save it into my OneDrive. So I'm going to go to my OneDrive. I'm going to click on documents and I'm going to select a folder. And I'm going to put it in this one here, Word Documents. And I can then give my file a name. So you can see here in the file name area, it's picked up the first line of that document. And that's what you'll see as the default file name. It will always put in the first line of your document, which most of the time isn't what you want to call your file. So we're going to jump into here and we're going to change that. So I'm going to say my first letter. And underneath you can see it says save as type. So I've selected uh, docx, which is the 2019 file extension. Just as a point of note, if you click the drop down here, you do have other file types that you can save your document as. So some of these you might want to use. For example, this one here, 
Word 97 to 2003. So that will save it in the dot doc format, which is the old format for Word documents. So if you're using an older version of Word, that's in general what you would have saved your document as. Now, why might you want to save your 2019 document as an older version? Well, as I mentioned briefly in one of the earlier modules, if you plan to send this to somebody who you know doesn't have 2019, maybe they have a much older version, then you can help them out a little bit by saving your document as a doc file. And it will ensure that you can, when they open it, it will open in compatibility mode and they can read it. So just be mindful of who you're sending it to. You could also come in here and save it as a template if you wanted to reuse it. You can save it as a PDF and we will be going through some of these options as we go through the course. But for now, I'm happy to keep it as a docx file extension and I'm going to click save. And it's as simple as that. So now if you glance up to the top of your letter, you should now see that it's been given a name. So my first letter. So what that means with regards to saving is if I now uh, make a change to this, so if I put in my full name, so now if I want to save this, I can go to my quick access toolbar and I can just click on save. I don't need to go back into save as. And can you see now my save button has those little arrows over the top? That's because I've saved it into a cloud location. So essentially what it's doing when you save is it's doing a refresh with the cloud version. So if I click save, it just saves those changes to that particular file name. Another thing I could do would be control S on my keyboard, that is the shortcut for save as well. Now I would recommend when you are working in a document, if you have saved it and you have your file name, as you're going through, just do control S every now and again, just to make sure that those changes are being saved. Now, if I was to make one more change, so I'm just gonna put my name on the next line by pressing enter. Now, maybe I don't save, but I just go to close my file by clicking on the cross at the top. You can see it's asking me, do you want to save your changes to my first letter? So Word will recognize any unsaved changes as you go to close and it will prompt you to save those. So you can then click save or don't save. Now, I actually don't want to close this down, so I'm just going to close out of there. So that's pretty much it on saving, fairly straightforward. We are going to close this document in a moment and I'm going to show you how to open it in the next module. So I will see you over there. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. We're now down to the opening a document module. And really opening a document is just the opposite of saving. So it's very straightforward. What we have on the screen here is just a blank Word application. So I closed down the previous document and now I want to reopen it. So I'm going to go up to the file tab. So remember, this takes us into that backstage area and it's jumped me automatically to the open section because I have nothing open. Word is assuming that I'm going to want to open a file. Now, that may be the case or it might not. It might be you want to create a new one from scratch. But in this case, it's got it pretty much right. I do want to open a document. So again, this looks kind of similar to the Save As screen that we were in previously. You'll see that Recent is highlighted and I also have Documents underlined. So it's showing me underneath all of my recent documents and you should be able to see there right at the top, we have my first letter at the top there. So if I wanted to open it, I can very simply just click it from this list and it will open. Now, I'm not going to do that at the moment because I want to show you something slightly different. I'm going to browse to a location and I'm just going to go up to a location where I have a number of different Word files. So let's go to Documents and I'm going to go into this folder here because I want to show you something quite important with regards to this Explorer window that we're currently looking at. So there's different ways that you can view files before you open them. So a lot of the time you might know what you're looking for. Sometimes you won't. Sometimes you might need to see a little bit more detail about a file. So there are lots of different ways that you can view this file list. And you can do that by clicking on this little option just here. 
and it gives you a number of different ways that you can view the file list in the Explorer window. So currently I have details selected, but if I go to extra large icons, it's going to show me them like that. And if I go to large icons, they're a bit smaller. I also have medium icons. I'm sure you can imagine what those look like. And then small icons. Then we have list. List is quite a popular one. I personally prefer to choose the details option because not only does it give you the list, but it also gives you a little bit more information about each particular file. So I can see here in the status column, I can see that those are all saved into the cloud and that they're all synchronized up. I can also see the date that these files were modified. And I can also see the type, so whether they're a Word document, PDF, Excel file, and also the size. Now the size can be critical sometimes, particularly when you're dealing with very large files. It's good to be able to see the file size. So I like the details option, but it is up to you. There are a couple of others in here. So we have tiles, again, just a different way. And then finally, we have contents. That gives you, again, a little bit more information like the author, date modified, things like that. For me, that's slightly too much. As I said, I prefer the details option, but just be aware that you have different ways that you can view your files so you can see a little bit more information so you know which one you want to open. Now, in this case, I'm going to open a file called Navigate. So let's select it and click Open. And I'm also going to open another file. I'm going to reopen that letter file that we just saved. So back to File. I'm going to jump down to Open. And this time, I'm going to pick it up from my recent list. So I'm just going to click. And again, it's going to open that document over the top of the other one. And remember, we can switch between the two by going up to View going to switch windows and we can switch between the two of them. Alternatively, we can hover our mouse over our word icon at the bottom and then navigate between the two of them as well. So that's a nice way of having multiple files open and being able to switch between them. Now, another thing that's quite nice sometimes is to be able to view two documents side by side. This is particularly good if you're comparing two documents or maybe you are cutting something from one and pasting into another. You don't want to have to keep switching between the documents. What you can do is you can display them side by side. And again, it's quite useful. We're on the correct ribbon. On the view ribbon, you'll see that you have a view side by side option. So let's click it. And there we go. I now have both of my documents taking up exactly half of the screen. So as I said, really good if you need to copy and paste or see two things at the same time. Of course, if you want to just get one of the documents back to its full size, if you just click on the maximize in the corner and it will bring that document to the front in its full size. Now, another thing you can do on that view ribbon is you can use the split option. So let's see what that does. Let's click on split. Now, this is quite interesting. What it will do is it will split the same document. So I have the same document in both halves of the screen. You can see exactly the same, but it means I can scroll each document independently. So again, this is good if I'm trying to do some comparisons or some cutting and pasting, lots of different things you can do with that split option if you want to see two different areas of the same document at the same time. And of course, if I want to get back to it just being one document, I have the remove split option. And there we go. And there's just one final option I want to point out in here, which you might want to use, and that's the arrange all button. So let's click it. And it kind of tiles them over the top of each other. And I don't particularly like this view too much. I, I never really use it. But again, if you've got quite a few documents open, maybe more than two, it can be quite useful to be able to see them all kind of arranged next to each other. And again, to get out of this, just click the maximize on one of the documents. So a few different ways that you can view your document once you've opened it. So hopefully that's given you some insight on how you can open one or more files and the different ways that you can view them when you're working on your document. In the next module, we're going to talk about navigating in documents. So please join me for that. Hello again, this is Deb and welcome back to Word 2019. 
In this module, we're going to take a look at how you can navigate around your document. Now, I have open on the screen the navigate.docx document, and this is just a document that's been created about Smith properties. Now, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to cast your eyes down to the bottom left hand of the screen, where you can see here it has section one, page one of three, 845 words. So we're getting a little bit of information about this document from our status bar. I can see it has three pages and I can see the number of words and I can see that currently I'm clicked in section one. Now we're going to talk about how you section up documents a little bit later on. So don't worry about that too much at the moment. What I want to focus on is how you can quickly navigate using some of the tools in Word to jump around your document, which is particularly useful if you have a very long document. This document here only has three pages, but a lot of the documents you create could be hundreds of pages long. So being able to quickly jump around, find what you need is extremely important and will add to your efficiency. Now, obviously, I'm going to start with the most obvious thing. A quick way of moving through your document is to use your scroll bar on the right hand side. So I can use that just to scroll up and down. And again, if you've only got a few pages in your document, that might be absolutely fine and that might work for you. So you do have your scroll bar. But let's talk about using some utilities for a document that's a little bit longer. So first of all, I'm going to click my mouse at the top of the document here, just in front of where it says Smith Properties. Now, if I had a document that was thousands of pages long and I wanted to jump right down to the bottom of it, it's going to take me quite a while to use the scroll bar and scroll down. I'll probably end up with a little bit of a wrist ache by the time I've finished. So a quick way of doing it is to use your keyboard in order to jump you straight down to the bottom. And in Word, what you need to do is press Control and End, and that will jump you all the way down to the bottom. And you can confirm that by looking down in the left hand side in your status bar. It says that we're now on page three of three. So I know that I'm on the last line on the last page of that document. If I want to jump all the way back up to the top, if I do Control and Home, that's going to do the reverse. A couple of other shortcuts, if you hold down control and press your arrow key, so you can see here I'm pressing the right arrow key, it jumps me per word. So you can see it's jumping around that document just per word. So another quick way, and I could go the other way by using the left arrow key. Control up and down will jump me up one paragraph at a time, as you can see as I do that. And the same if I do control up arrow. And if I wanted to select everything in my document, a quick way of doing that would be to do control A, which will allow me to select all of the text in my document. And we're going to be utilizing control A as we go through this course quite a lot, because it is a really useful feature when you want to make mass changes to text. So that's a few quick ways of navigating around your document using your keyboard. What I want to talk to you about in the next section is using things like go to find and replace again to navigate around your document using page numbers, using headings, using specific words, so on and so forth. So please join me in the next module for that. Hi everyone, this is Deb and welcome back to Word 2019. In the previous module, we started to take a look at some of the basic ways that you can use your keyboard to navigate around your document. And I'd just like to further that idea and introduce a few more utilities that you can use in Word in order to navigate around your document and really increase your efficiency when you're working with your documents. And what I want to focus on in this module is the go to find and replace options. So when you're working with larger files, especially you might need a quick way to jump to a page or maybe to replace a word in documents. So let's start by replacing a specific word in our document. I'm going to click at the top of my document. So just before where it says Smith properties, I'm going to go to the home ribbon and all the way across on the right hand side, we have an editing group, which is where you'll find your find and replace. And you can see that find has a little drop down arrow next to it. 
So I have find, advanced find, and I also have go to in there as well. Now, in this case, I'm going to start out by using find. So let's click find. And you can see it opens up on the left hand side, this little navigation area where I can type in exactly what it is that I want to find. So let's say that I'm looking for the word firm. And you can see it's brought up four results and I can see those listed underneath in that results area. And I can also see them highlighted in my document. So it's very easy for me to find those. So that's one way that you can find a specific word in your document. Let's look at another way. I'm going to close down this navigation panel just by clicking on the cross. I'm going to go back to find and this time we're going to go into advanced find. And this takes me to this little dialog box and it's asking me find what and it's got in there firm which is the last thing that I searched for. So if I wanted to skip through these one by one I could say find next and it's highlighted in the document the first time it finds the word firm. I can do find next again so I can step through one at a time in my document and when I get to the end it's going to tell me it's finished searching so I click on OK. Now another thing you need to be aware of in this find and replace box is this more option. So let's click it and you can see I have a whole host of options that I can use. So for example, I might want it to match the case, which means that it will find the word firm if it matches this case. So if firm is in the document with an uppercase F, it's not going to find it because I've told it to match the case. I could select to find whole words only. So if firm was part of another word, um, so maybe you had something like uh, infirmary, it wouldn't find that. I could also say use wildcards. So with this, I could put a wildcard in front or somewhere in between or at the end of the word. So for example, if I remove the word firm and I type in a asterisk, it's going to find everything in that document which starts with an A, no matter what comes after it. I could also put the wildcard at the beginning and maybe have something like that, which means it will find anything that ends in S. It doesn't matter what comes before it. So wildcards are really useful for searching for specific things. Another thing you can do up here is if I was to type in A and then put in two question marks, that means that the word has to start with an A and it can only have three characters in total. Now it doesn't matter what those three characters are, but it must be three characters. So again, you're getting very granular here. I'm just going to remove that and just type firm back in again. You do also have a sounds like option. So what this would pick up is any word that sounds like firm. So it might pick up turn, burn, learn, anything along those lines. Find all word forms will find any form of that particular word. And then I have some other options like match prefix, match suffix, ignore punctuation and ignore white space characters. So just be aware that underneath that more drop down, you do have lots of other ways you can really customize what it is that you're looking for in your document and you can get very, very granular. So let's just close that down for a moment. I'm going to make sure that I'm clicked at the top of my document. And this time I want to look at the replace option. So again, in the editing group underneath find, we have replace. And what this will allow you to do is to replace one word with another. So for example, this is called Smith properties. Maybe I want to change the name. So I might say find Smith and replace it with, let's replace it with my name, Ashby. And again, I have all of these options if I want to select them. Now I'm happy just to do a straight replace here. So I'm going to select replace all. And you can see it says all done. We've made 10 replacements. And if you look at my document behind that first line, Smith has now been replaced with Ashby. So a very quick way of replacing multiple words in a document. And let's close down that window. The final thing I want to speak to you about in this module is the go to option. And go to is going to allow you to do different things in your document. So again, let's go to find and we're going to say go to. So what this will allow you to do is navigate around your document. So I can navigate by page number and you can see here if I enter page two, for example, and say go to, 
it's going to jump me down to page two. I can navigate by section. Now we only have one section at the moment. I haven't split my document up. In later modules, I'm going to show you how to divide up into sections and then you could navigate to whichever section you wanted to. I can navigate by line, so I could go to a specific line number. I can navigate by bookmark. Now again, bookmarks are something we're going to cover later. They're a way of you kind of putting a little bookmark in a specific location on a page. So I can jump very quickly to the bookmark. I can navigate by any comments that I have in the document, footnotes. We also have end notes in there, fields, tables. So so lots of different things and it really will depend on what you have in your document at the time as to which one of these you want to use. But just be aware that you do have those go to options in there as well. Now I'm just going to click on close and I'm going to jump back up to the top of my document using my shortcut key control home, which we learnt in the previous module. So now we've taken a look at some basics of find and replace and go to. Let's move on to talking about how you can edit a document in the next module. So I will see you over there. Hello again and welcome back to Word 2019. This is Deb and I'm going to take you through how you can do some basic edits in a document. And these are just really some basic editing functions which it's useful for you to know before we move on to the next section. So we've already edited this document in a couple of ways. We've done some finding and some replacing. And now I just want to show you a couple of things when it comes to uh, deleting, backspacing and also undoing and redoing things in your document. So sometimes we might want to type some text in the middle of other text. So for example, it's got Ashby Properties was founded as a new company. So I might want to add in here as a new property company. Now when it comes to deleting, the delete key on your keyboard will always delete everything to the right of it. So if I start to press my delete key, you can see that it's going to delete out the word company. Now backspace on the other hand will delete everything to the left of it. So if I start to do backspace, you can see it's going to delete out that word property. So just remember that they work slightly differently. Another thing I want to show to you is the very important undo and redo button. I know so many people who can't live without their undo button. Now, these two buttons will always be available by default on the quick access toolbar to make them super easy for you to access. So if we look up here, you can see we have the undo button. And what this will allow you to do is to essentially undo what you've just done. So, for example, I've just backspaced that word property. So if I start clicking undo, it's going to give me the P back, the R, the O, so on and so forth. So I can carry on undoing to reverse my last action. The same thing with redo. If I then decide, actually, I don't want that word there, I could redo and it will go back and redo that deletion. What it's also worth noting is that underneath or next to your undo icon, you have a little drop down and this will allow you to go back and basically select how far back you want to undo to. So it'll allow you to do multiple undos all in one go. So just be aware that that's there as well. Now there is a shortcut key for these also. So undo, the shortcut key is control Z. So if you do something, then quickly think, oops, I want to backtrack out of that. A quick control Z is your best friend and redo control Y. So it's good to get those in your brain and make those part of your shortcut repertoire. Now I'm going to add my word back in, just going to say company. And I'm pretty happy with how this looks. So I'm going to do a save by clicking the save button on the quick access toolbar. And there we go. So now I think you have a good knowledge on how to get started with Word. We've gone through all of those basics that will provide you with a great springboard, a really good foundation for moving into some of the more intermediate options, which we're going to start to cover in the next section. But first, I have a practice exercise for you to do. So I will see you over there. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. We're now on to the section two practice exercise. And what I'd like you to do for me in this exercise is open the file called practice module two. 
And then I'd like you to change the address block to your own name and address. In the salutation line, I want you to replace name with your first name. And then I'd like you to go through the document and change all instances of Burke to Holden Properties. I'd then like you to change the name Heather Lapierre at the bottom to your name. And finally, I'd like you to save the file as My Practice Module 2. You can then close the file. And that is it. Once you've done that, you are ready to move on to the next section. So I'll see you over there. Hello again, this is Deb and welcome back to our Word 2019 course. We're all the way down to the module that relates to the autocorrect options. And autocorrect is a feature again that you'll find across all of the Microsoft applications that allows you to change the way words are spelt or the way words are displayed in your document. And there are already a number of autocorrect options set for you. So let me show you what I mean by that. So on the screen, I have a blank document. Again, it's just called document one because I haven't saved it. Now I'm going to zoom in very slightly using my zoom control so you can see this a bit better. Now, for example, if I wanted to spell out the word uh, the or the, but I spelt it slightly wrong. So if I type in H-T-E, when I press the space bar, you'll see that it automatically corrects to the word the. The same if I was to type in the word can incorrectly. So if I type in A-C-N and press space, Word recognizes that I'm probably trying to spell the word can, I've just spelt it wrong, and it automatically changes it for me. That is an autocorrect feature. So it will notice or recognize commonly used words that have been misspelt and correct them for you, which is an extremely useful feature. It will also help with other things. So for example, things like fractions. So if I was typing half, so if I type one, and I use the slash and then two, as soon as I press the space bar, it converts it to that fraction. And the same if I was typing a quarter, hit space bar, and there I get my fraction. So again, those are using the autocorrect feature in Word. Another example would be ordinals. So you might come across ordinals in things like dates. So if I was saying the 1st of August, for example, if I type in 1 ST and hit the space bar, it makes that ST superscript. So it puts it into the correct format for a particular date. The same with 2nd, and I could carry on going through those ordinals. Another example would be something like hyperlinks. So if I was to type in a, a website address, so let's just say www.microsoft.com and hit enter, it's going to pick up that website and it's going to underline it. So this is now a hyperlink. And as I hover over it, you can see that if I hold down my control key and click my mouse, it's going to take me to that website. So again, that's utilizing the autocorrect options. Now I'm going to delete everything that I've put in here. So I'm going to use control A to select all. We used that in an earlier module. And I'm going to hit my delete key just to take me back to a blank document. I want to show you a couple of other features of autocorrect as well. And this is quite a, a cute little one if you've never come across this before. If I type in three dashes, so if I say dash, 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 and hit the enter key, it gives me a continuous solid line. And what's cool about this is that I can go up and I can type on the line if I want to. So it's a bit like being back at school, having those ruled lines running across your page. So that's quite nice as well. So remember three dashes and enter and you'll get yourself a solid line. I'm gonna do control A again to select all and delete. Now, if I do that again, but this time when I'm doing my dashes, hold down my shift key, so I'm going to do three dashes and hit enter. I get a solid bold line. So I just incorporated the shift in order to get that. Again, there's a few of these. If I do shift and three asterisks and press enter, I get a dotted line. And if I do shift and three pound symbols and press enter, 
I get a different style line again. So there's lots of those lurking around in autocorrect and you may not be aware of them. I wasn't for a very long time. And sometimes they can be quite useful if you're looking to do something really quickly. And they are really good examples of how that autocorrect is built into Word and how it works. Now again, I'm gonna select all, Control A, and I'm gonna hit my delete key just to get rid of everything. Now, if you want to go in and take a look at how autocorrect is set up and you can see uh, what autocorrect options you have set, you can find those underneath the file tab, so in the backstage area. And if you jump all the way down to options at the bottom and go into the proofing section, you'll see at the top here you have autocorrect options. So it says change how Word corrects and formats text as you type. So I'm going to select autocorrect options. And this is where we have all of those autocorrect options stored. And there are some different choices that we can make at the top. By default, they're all selected. So I'm currently showing autocorrect options button. Um, I can correct two initial capitals. I can capitalize the first letter of sentences, uh, first letter of table cells, the names of the days, so on and so forth. So these are all set, which means that yes, I want Word to do that. So if I'm typing the word Monday, I want it to correct. If I haven't typed a capital, I want it to correct it to a capital. So these are some of the basic options and I like to have all of those set. You can also see in the table below some other autocorrect options that you have. So, so for example, if you want the copyright symbol in your document, this is the top one here, if you type parentheses C parentheses, it will autocorrect it to the copyright symbol. The same thing for the euro sign. You can see that you just need to type in an E in parentheses and it will give you a euro. Trademark, that's always a good one. So again, if you put TM in brackets, it will give you that trademark symbol or it will autocorrect to the trademark symbol. And there are so many of these in here that you can use. So you can really go to town. And as you would expect, you can add your own in here. So if you have something that you want to add, you can just type in how you want to type it and then what it's supposed to look like in here. So for example, I might want to say, when I type DA, I want it to be replaced with my full name. And I'm gonna add that into my autocorrect options, like so. And there it is at the bottom of the table. So let's see that in action. I'm going to click on OK and OK again. And now if I type my initials DA and press the space bar, it replaces it with my full name. So again, taking the time to add in words or phrases that you use often into autocorrect can really help improve your efficiency. One final thing I want to highlight in there. Let's jump back in. So let's go to File, Options and down to Proofing and jump back into autocorrect. There is an auto format as you type. So again, this is what controls how your text is replaced as you type it. So for example, here it says replace as you type straight quotes with smart quotes. So there's a very slight difference between those two. But if I type in just a pair of quotes, then it's going to change those to smart quotes. You can see I have things in here which we saw earlier, so ordinals first with superscript, we tried that one earlier, hyphens with a dash, fractions, so on and so forth. So you really can go in and customise how you want your autocorrect to be set up. And I would suggest you do that because it does save you a lot of time when you're working in your Word documents. I'm going to click OK and come out of here. And that is pretty much it for this module. In the next section, we're going to talk about selecting text in more detail. So please join me for that. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. In this module, we're going to talk a little bit more about selecting text, which might sound like something fairly basic, um, but it's so important that we understand the different ways that we can select text. Again, it will help us with our efficiency if we've got those basics down first. Now, as a general rule, text that is highlighted, and when I say highlighted, I mean if you drag your mouse across it, that means that it's selected. 
And essentially, if you want to affect it, you have gotta select it. So if I wanted to change the color or the size or the font or basically anything related to this text, I need to make sure that I've got it selected before I do it or Word isn't gonna know which text to apply the changes to. So in this module, really what I want to do is just to address the most common ways of selecting text and making different selections in your document. So as I said, the most common way is click and drag. So I'm going to click and drag across. And what you'll see when you click and drag, let me just do that again because I clicked off, is when you click and drag, you will get this mini toolbar pop up. And you can see it there just off to the right hand side. And this is just a quick sort of uh, toolbar that pops up with some formatting options on it. So you've got your bold, your italics, your font color, font size, so on and so forth. And it's really just a quick way. Words kind of assumed that you're probably gonna want to do something related to the formatting of this text. So instead of having to move all the way up to the ribbon in order to do that, it's just popped up this little mini toolbar so you don't have to go too far in order to make your text bold or italic or whatever you want to do with it. So just be aware that that is going to pop up. If you find that a little bit annoying, then you can turn that off in the backstage area, which I will show you how to do later. Now to deselect text, all we need to do is to click away. So click anywhere else on the screen and that text is now no longer selected. If you want to select one word, so if I wanted to select the word properties, I can double click on that word and it will select just that word. And if I wanted to select the entire sentence, if I hold down my control key and click anywhere in that sentence, it's going to select the text or highlight just that sentence up until that first full stop. If I want to select the entire line, regardless of if it's a sentence or not, if I hover my mouse over in this white space here and click, it's going to select that whole line. And obviously if I stay clicked in the margin with that arrow and drag down, I can select all of the sentences or all of the lines, I should say. Another way of selecting is if you wanted to select from one point to another. For example, if I click my mouse just before it says thank you, hold down my shift key and click after the word one and it will just select that section. And if I want to add to this section, so maybe I think to myself I want to include something else, if I hold down my shift key again and use my arrow keys, I can make some additions to that selection just by working with my arrow key with the shift held down. If I want to select multiple areas which aren't next to each other, so I've got this first uh, sentence selected, what if I wanted to also select the first sentence of the second paragraph? Well, if I hold down my control key, I can then drag and also select that sentence. And I could car carry on doing that if I wanted to, like so. So just remember to hold down the control to make multiple uh, selections. Now I'm gonna click away to deselect. The final one, as we've mentioned a couple times before, is to select everything in your document, control A. That will select everything and you can make whatever changes you need from your formatting options on the toolbar. Another thing that you also have is let's not leave out the ribbons here. We've worked mainly with uh, the keyboard and mouse, but if we go up to the home ribbon, again, all the way over on the right hand side, we do have a select option. So again, this will allow me to select all. So that's similar to doing control A. Or I also have in here a select objects option. Now, this is useful if you have things like shapes on your screen and you want to select all of them. It will allow you to uh, draw kind of like a marquee around them and it will select all of those objects. And we will utilize that a little bit later on in this course. So don't forget that you do have those options up there on the home ribbon as well. So that pretty much wraps it up for different ways that you can select text in your document. In the next section, we're going to move on to taking a look at the good old copy and paste. So please join me for that. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Word 2019.
In this module, we're going to start to explore cut, copy and paste, the backbone of the Microsoft applications. Now, these are probably commands that you've used many times before. As I said, they are the same across all of the Microsoft applications. So whether you're working in Word or Excel or PowerPoint, you'll find that the functionality for all three of these is exactly the same, including the keyboard shortcuts. So what I want to do in this module is really just to make sure that you have a good understanding of what cut, copy and paste can do. And if you are familiar with them, you might pick up a couple of other little tips about alternative ways that you can use them. So let's start with discussing cut. Now, the first thing you need to do, there are really four steps to each of these. And the first step is making a selection. So, for example, I might want to select this first sentence just here and I might choose to cut it. Now, it's important to know what the difference is between cut and copy. When you cut something in your document, you're essentially uh, deleting it or removing it and then pasting it elsewhere. So it's kind of like doing a move in many ways. So if I was to cut this sentence and then paste it elsewhere, it's going to move it. Whereas with copy, I would highlight the same sentence, but if I was to choose copy and then paste it elsewhere in the document, it's gonna make an exact copy. So it won't move it, it will copy it essentially. So that's the difference between cut and copy. So let's start by cutting this line of text out. Now, as with always in Microsoft, there are a few different methods that you can use. You could right click on your selection and you'll see from the right click menu, you have a cut option. Alternatively, you could go up to the home ribbon and in that first group, the clipboard group, you have a cut option in there. Or a third way that you could do it would be to use the keyboard shortcut. And the keyboard shortcut for cut is Control X. And you can see that as I hover my mouse over the cut icon on the home ribbon. So I'm going to click cut. I'm going to scroll down. I'm just going to put a couple of returns in at the bottom. And I'm now going to paste that sentence that I've cut. So again, I could do it a few ways. I could right click my mouse and choose one of these paste options. Alternatively, I could jump up to the home ribbon and I could click on the paste button up here, or I could use the keyboard shortcut control V. Now I'm somebody who likes to use keyboard shortcuts a lot, but those are a little bit difficult for you guys to see on the screen. So in this instance, I'm going to use the paste button. Now, what you'll see with this paste button is it is divided into two sections. We have the top half, which is currently highlighted in gray. And then if I was to click the lower half, it gives me a few different ways that I could paste that sentence. So I could choose to paste and keep the source formatting. So what that's gonna do is wherever I've cut it from, it's gonna bring that same formatting across. I could choose to merge the formatting as I paste. So if I was pasting this sentence into another document, which had completely different fonts in it, then I could choose to take on the font style or color of the document I'm pasting into by merging the formatting. I could choose to paste it as a picture, which means it will no longer be text, it will be a, a picture object. Or I could choose to keep text only. So that's really if you want to just keep it just as plain text without any formatting. So you do have a few different options there. There are even more options underneath paste special, but again, we'll explore those in a little bit more detail later on. So I just want to do a straight paste. So I'm gonna click the top half of this paste button and that will paste my cutout sentence. And you can see that it's now missing from there. Now I'm just gonna undo a couple of times and put that sentence back. So I'm just gonna click my undo button on the quick access toolbar. And there we go. I'm gonna leave it highlighted, but this time I'm going to do a copy. So remember the keyboard shortcut is control C. I'm gonna use my button on the home ribbon and I'm gonna click it. I'm gonna click in the same place again, so right at the bottom. And I'm gonna paste again by clicking my paste button. Now this time you'll see it's done a copy as opposed to a move. 
And again, what you'll find when you do paste something, you will get this little pop-up appear. And if you click it, it just gives you those paste options that we looked at previously in a little quick drop-down menu in case you want to utilize them. Now, something else I want you to be aware of is the clipboard. Now, it's not particularly obvious how you bring up the clipboard, but if you go up to the home ribbon, in this first group where we have clipboard written at the bottom, if you click on the little drop down arrow, you'll see you get this little pane open up at the side that says clipboard. And you can see there, it's got on there the last item that I copied. So this thank you for your inquiry piece of text just here. And what happens is every time you cut something or every time you copy something, it actually kind of temporarily saves it to this clipboard. So let me copy a few other things. Let's copy another sentence. And this time I'm going to do the keyboard shortcut control C to copy it. And you'll see now that's been stored on the clipboard. I'm going to do another one and control C to copy. And I'm just building up a list of all of these on my clipboard. Now, you might think, why is that useful? Well, it's useful if you want to go through and do lots of cutting and lots of copying and then paste them in different orders. So I might go through and think, yep, I want to copy all of those. And then I might want to paste them in the bottom of this document, but not necessarily in the order that I copied them. So I can now go back to my clipboard and I can say, okay, I want to paste this piece of text. So I'm gonna click the drop down and select paste, and it pastes that into the document. Now this clipboard will hold up to 24 items, so you really can copy quite a few things and then paste them into the document however you would like. If you want to clear your clipboard, just click on clear all, and that will get rid of everything on that clipboard. And of course, click the cross to close your clipboard down. So just be aware that that is lurking in the background if you want to utilize it. Just a couple of other ways that you can move things around in your document. If I highlight this whole first paragraph, I could utilize my keyboard and mouse in order to do a cut essentially or a move. If I hold down my control key and then click my mouse and drag, I can drop it wherever I like and you can see I can move it in that way. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a better understanding of the cut copy and paste commands, and also how you can move things around using your mouse and keyboard, and also how you can store things on the clipboard and paste them wherever you like into your document. In the next section, we're gonna be building on that and we're gonna to start to get into character formatting options. So please join me for that. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. In this module, we're moving on to take a deeper look at character formatting options. So what I have open on the screen here is a flyer. And at the moment, looking at this flyer, nothing really stands out. All the text is fairly consistent. It's all the same size. It's all the same font. There's no real headings in there. Nothing stands out. So we want to apply some formatting to this just to really make certain things emphasized and to make it a little bit more interesting and easier to read. And you'll find that when you do create a new document in Word, when you start typing, everything's going to be the same. So whichever font you've selected, whichever font size you've selected, until you change that, it's going to look exactly the same. And it's always going to be in black again, unless you go in and change that font color. And whenever you do start changing the characteristics of text, it's called formatting. So let's start to apply some formatting to this document to make it a little bit more interesting than it currently is. Now, the most obvious thing to start with would be the title up here. So where it says, Make Smith Properties Your Realtor, I'm going to highlight my title. And the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm going to change the font to make it different from the rest of the document. So up on the home ribbon, in the font group, I have my current font set to Times New Roman. If I click that drop down, I have a whole host of fonts that I can choose to apply to my selected text. 
Now, it's worth noting that in the later versions of Word, the default font is Calibri, which is this one just here. And that is a really nice font to use. But in this case, I want to make it really stand out and different from the rest. So I'm going to choose uh, something else. So let's choose, uh, let's go down. I'm going to choose that one there, Britannic Bold. And there we go. I'm also then going to make this title a little bit bigger than the rest of the text. So again, moving up to that same font group, you'll see next to the font style, we have the font size. And as I hover over each of these, you can see in a live preview what that's going to look like. So I want to make mine quite dramatic. So I'm going to pick 36. And it's also worth noting, if you look at these font sizes, they do go up in increments. So if I wanted, say, font size 15, I don't have it in that list, but I could just go into this box up here and just manually type it in to get that font size. So don't feel like you can't modify it in that little box. Now, I want mine a little bit bigger. I'm going to set it to 36. Next to my font size, I then have two buttons. One is increase font size and the other is decrease font size. And these are actually quite useful if you want to just kind of change the size of your font in increments without having to go into this drop down. So I could, if I wanted to increase the font size by one each time, I could go in and do that, or I could choose to decrease it back down. The button we have next to that is to change the case. So again, if I wanted to put my title all into uppercase, I could select that. And there we go. Or I have sentence case, lowercase, I can capitalize each word, or I can toggle the case as well. Now I want this as capitalize each word. And then next in this little group, we have a clear or formatting. So if you decide that you no longer want to have all of the formatting that you've applied, you can just very quickly clear all of it by clicking on that clear or formatting button. The bottom row in this little group, we have bold, which will make your text bold. We have uh, italics, which again will make your text italic if you prefer. And we also have an underline option as well. Now you'll notice the underline has a little drop down and it allows you to choose the underline style. So we have things in there like solid line, double line, uh, dash line, so on and so forth. So you do have some additional options underneath there. Now I don't want underline turned on. I'm just going to turn that back off. You also have a strike through option. So if you're someone who maybe deals with a lot of contracts, then you might find this option very useful. It will just allow you to put a strike through through the piece of selected text. And then you have options for subscript and superscript as well. So for words like H2O, things like that, you could think about using these. Next to that, we then have some text effects. So this is really sort of changing the color and the look and feel of the piece of selected text. And there's quite a few options that you have in here. Some of them a lot nicer than others, but some of these can actually look really effective depending on the type of document that you have. I will say when it comes to applying effects and colors and things like that to your documents, always bear in mind who your audience is. You don't want to make something too uh, jokey looking or too comical or too unprofessional if it's for work purposes. So just bear that in mind. Obviously, if you're doing something like a flyer or a newsletter or something like that, then that will be totally fine. But just bear in mind who your audience is going to be. So I could, if I wanted to select this fill just here, and I have more options in there for adjusting things like the outline color. I can apply a shadow if I want to, reflection or a glow. So some options for you to play around with in there. The next button along is a highlight color. So this is probably better further down in this document. If I wanted to go through and maybe highlight something, I could highlight a piece of text. And I could choose to highlight it like so. So this is very similar to having a highlighter pen and just kind of striking through on a piece of paper. And then finally, we have the font color option. So if I wanted to change the color of the font, just select it and then you can select from the color palette. So lots of different options in that font group. And don't forget, if you click that little drop down, 
you'll find that you have a few more options underneath here as well. So a lot of these are repeated. So you've got things like font, font style, size, uh, font color, underline style. We've got all of those on the ribbon. We don't have underline color on the ribbon. So if you do select an underline style, you can from here select a color from the color palette for that underline. You have strike through, double strike through, superscript, subscript, small caps, all caps. So a few different things in there which you don't have on the ribbon. You then have an advanced tab as well. So this will allow you to adjust things like the character spacing. So with that, we're talking about the amount of space you have between each letter. So if you want to kind of widen it out, then you can definitely do that. So lots of different options here also under this advanced area. So that's the basics of applying character formatting to selected text. In the next module, we're going to utilize the Format Painter, which is a really efficient way of taking formatting from one piece of text and pasting it across onto something else. So please join me for that. Hello again, this is Deb and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. In this module, we're going to take a look at utilizing the Format Painter tool in order to copy formatting from one piece of text to another. So in the previous module, we were looking at this flyer here, so Smith Flyer, and we'd been through and we'd looked at some of the formatting options that you can apply to the text in your document. Now you can see very obviously the title here has some formatting applied to it. And what I want to do is I want to take this formatting and I want to apply it to this who we are heading, which is further down in the document. Now, obviously, I could do that by utilizing the same methods I did in the previous module. So I could highlight where it says who we are. I could go into my font group and I could apply those different attributes. So I could select the text effects. I could change the font size, font color, so on and so forth. But that's not a particularly efficient way of doing things. A much better way of doing it is to essentially copy the formatting from the title and paste it over the top of the subtitle. And we do that using the Format Painter. So let's take a look at how we would do that. The first thing you need to do is to make your selection. So we want to select the piece of text which has the formatting that we want to copy. I'm then going to go up to the Home ribbon and in this first group, the Clipboard group, we have an option for Format Painter. I'm going to click it once and as I hover my mouse back over my text, you can see that my cursor has changed to a small little paintbrush. So that tells me that my format painter is now activated. All I need to do now is essentially wipe it over the text where I want to paste that formatting. So I'm just going to click and drag over. And there we go. It's applied that exact same formatting. Now, what about if I wanted to do that for the next heading down, so the one that says buying a home? You can see that once I've copied it once, the Format Painter gets deactivated, so my cursor is back to just a regular looking cursor. If I want to do lots of Format Painting in a document, the secret here is to double click on the Format Painter. So I'm going to select my text, and this time I'm going to double click on Format Painter, I'm going to swipe it over buying a home. And if you look now, you can see the Format Painter is still activated because we double clicked and I can carry on swiping throughout my document. So let's just do these final ones. And there we go. And then to come out to Format Painter, you can either press the Escape key on your keyboard or just click on Format Painter again to take you back to a regular cursor. So that's a much more efficient way of copying formatting across as opposed to manually applying those individual font attributes. So now we have a better understanding of how to apply character formatting, we can move on to the next section, which is working with numbers. So please join me for that. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. This is Deb and we're about to jump into our next module which is working with numbers. 
Now, occasionally in a Word document, you might have some kind of list that you want to apply numbering to. And when I say numbering, that might be one, two, three, or it might be A, B, C, or maybe Roman numerals or something along those lines. You can also number paragraphs as well. So this is what we're going to explore in this module. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a list. So I just have a new blank document open on the screen and I'm going to create a very basic list of four names. So I'm going to start with my name. We're then going to have Adam, we're going to have Jenny, and we're going to have Chris. And I want to number each of these names. Now, as with most things in Word, the first step is to select what we want to number. So I'm going to use my mouse and I'm just going to highlight all of those names. I'm then going to jump up to that home ribbon. And in this paragraph group, this is where you'll find your numbering drop down. And as I hover over, you can see the tooltip there says create a numbered list and then click the arrow for more numbering formats. So if I click the arrow, you can see currently we have none selected because it has the gray box around the outside and it gives me a number of choices that I can select for my list. So it really depends if you want it numbered one, two, three, or maybe Roman numerals, if you want A, B, C. And you can see we have uppercase and lowercase and various different variants on those. Now I'm gonna start out just with a very basic list. So I just want this one here, the one, two, three. And there we can see we have our list numbered. Now, the good thing about using numbering in this way is that if you add a name to the bottom of the list, so if I hit enter, it automatically puts in the next number. So I might want to add in another name. If I hit enter again, if I decide at this point that I don't want that number there, I can just hit my backspace key. Or alternatively, let me just undo that step. I could just choose to turn off numbering. So just click that numbering button again and it will take me back to the margin and I can carry on typing paragraph or whatever it is that I want to type into this document. If I decided that I wanted to change the way this was numbered, so maybe I wanted it to say A, B, C instead. Again, it's a simple case of highlighting, going back up to your numbering options and selecting the option that you want like so. So I'm gonna select my list once more. I'm going to go back up to that numbering drop down and you can see that the formats that I've recently used will be listed at the top. So that makes it a lot easier for me to access. If we move down to some of these options that we have at the bottom, this change list level, we're actually going to look at that when we look at outline numbering. I just want to draw your attention to this here, define new number format. So this allows you to go in and really customize how your numbering looks. So currently I have my number style set to ABC, but I could go in and change that to something else if I wanted to. And I can also change the font of my numbering. So again, if I wanted it to look slightly different, so maybe Arial, I'm going to say bold and let's do 12. And I'm going to say I want my numbers to be red. And you can see in the preview at the bottom what that's going to look like. So it's now in Arial font, it's bold, it's slightly bigger, and it's also red. And click on OK, and OK again. And there we go. Let's jump back into there, so define new number format. And you can also choose your alignment. So currently I have mine set to left alignment, but I could choose to center it, or put it over on the right. So that makes some minor adjustments as to the placement of that numbering as well. Now I'm gonna say okay, just here. I'm gonna jump back up. And this time we're going to look at this set numbering value. Now this is useful if you want to create another list underneath. So if I was to start another list, so if I just press enter, I'm just gonna backspace that out. And let's do some more names. I'm going to say Rob, James, Brooke. I'm going to highlight them and I'm going to apply some numbering. You can see the numbering carries on from the numbering above. So it's gone straight down to F, G and H. Now it might be that because this is a separate list that I actually want to restart this back at A. And that is where I would define that new number. So I'm going to go back up into numbering. I'm going to go to set numbering value 
and I'm going to say set value and then we're going to go to A. Click on OK. And there we go. I now have my separate list. So if you don't define that, then it's going to continue on from the list before. So just be aware of that when you're working with your numbering. Now, I just quickly want to switch across to the Smith flyer that we were working on earlier. So I'm going to go up to view. I'm going to go to switch windows and I'm going to go back to my Smith flyer document. And in here I have some paragraphs. And what I want to do is I want to show you how numbering works when it comes to paragraphs. So I'm going to click at the start of the first paragraph and I'm just going to click on the numbering button. And you can see there it's numbered the entire paragraph. Let's do it for the second one and you can see it continues through. Click at the front of the third one. Now when I click at the front of the third one and apply the numbering, you'll see something different happens. Just the first line is numbered. Let's do it for the others. Now the reason why that's happening is because these three have a line break in there. So we've hit enter and we've gone onto the second line. So as far as word is concerned, those are completely new paragraphs essentially. Whereas the first two here are kind of continuous sentences that just run on. So these are considered to be paragraphs. So just be aware of that. I just really wanted to show you that numbering doesn't just apply to lists that you create, but you can also apply it to paragraphs. I'm going to jump very briefly back to our other document. So let's go to switch windows and back to our document one. It is worth noting that you don't have to have a list already created in order to apply numbering. So let me jump back to the home ribbon and just remove the numbering and hit enter. Now, if I wanted to, before I even started to create my list, I could turn on my numbering just by clicking on the numbering button. And remember, it's always going to continue on from the previous list unless you tell it to restart. So I'm going to click my drop down and you can see there I have a useful restart numbering button and I can then go and create my next list. So I might say Matt, Heather, Claire. OK, so that is how you work with basic numbering in a document. And that's with regards to lists and also with regards to numbering paragraphs. In the next module, we're going to move on to taking a look at an alternative way of making lists stand out. And that is by using bullets. So please join me for that. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. We've just got through working with numbered lists in a document and now I want to talk to you a little bit about working with bullets, which is slightly different to numbering, but along the same lines. So what we're looking at here is our document and I just have a, a basic list again, just those names that we were looking at previously and they're numbered one to seven currently. And I want to change these instead of numbers. I want to have bullets. And if you're not sure what a bullet is, it's just really like a symbol and there's various different symbols that you can use as your bullets. Most of the time in documents, probably what you'll see is just the round, solid black bullet, but you can utilize lots and lots of different things as your bullets, as you'll see as we go through this module. So the first thing I'm going to do is make my selection. So I'm going to highlight my list of names. I'm going to jump up to the paragraph group again. And next to numbering, we have a little button that says bullets. And you can see there the tooltip says create a bulleted list. Click the arrow to change the look of the bullet. So let's click the arrow and see what we have in there. Now you're presented with a bullet library and it's given you sort of some of the most common bullets that people might use and also a couple of ones that I've used in the past as well. And I will say probably the one that I use most of the time is this first one here, just that round black bullet. But I could select any of these as I hover over them. You can see what those look like. The tick is quite good for things like to do lists, so on and so forth. So you can really kind of choose what kind of bullet will suit the document that you're creating. So I could select any one of these. Alternatively, what I could do is go down to the define new bullet option. And this is where you can really go to town and really choose a symbol that's going to suit your document. 
You can see here we have bullet character and we have a choice of symbol, picture or font. So let's look at symbol first of all. So this will open up your symbol dialog box and symbols essentially are just fonts and they're divided down into fonts. So there's lots and lots of different symbols in here. I will say, because there are so many, it would take you a long time to go through them all looking for something appropriate. But a lot of the time, some of the best ones that you'll use or some of the most popular you'll find under web dings. So we have lots of interesting things which we could add into our document. So you can see at the bottom here, I have some symbols that I've recently used. So we have a plane and we have some other little symbols. Now I'm actually going to use one of these. I'm going to use this star just here. Alternatively, I could scroll through all of this list of symbols looking for something that I quite like. But for ease of use, I'm going to select the star and I'm going to click on OK. And you can see there I get a little preview of what that's going to look like in my document and click on OK again. And my numbering has now been changed to that particular symbol. Now, if I want to get a little bit more complex, I could choose a picture, either one that I have stored off or one that I can find on the web. So let's change these bullets from symbols into a picture. I'm going to keep my list highlighted. I'm going to jump back up to that bullets drop down and back down into define new bullet. And you can probably guess where I'm about to head. We are now jumping to this picture option in the middle. And you can see here I get a few different options. I can choose a picture from a file. So that would be if you have one saved off to your desktop or my documents or a local drive, you could pick it up from there. I can choose to search the internet for an image. Or I can choose one that I have saved into OneDrive cloud storage. Now, in this case, I'm going to search for a Bing image. So I'm going to say, let's just keep this simple. I'm going to say dog. And then you can see it's gone away. It's done a search for the word dog on Bing and it's presented me with a number of images. And again, remember always to check the copyright on images. If you're just downloading something off the Internet, you want to make sure that it has a Creative Commons license in order for you to be able to use it in your document. So I'm currently filtering for images which only have a Creative Commons license. So I know that any of these are good to use. So I can go through and I'm going to choose this one just here and I'm going to select insert and click on OK. And there we go. We have a cute little image of a dog, which adds a little bit more interest into your document. Now, another way that you might want to use bullets or images or symbols even is if I was to type underneath here, uh, my telephone number is, and then I'm just going to put in like that. What I could do is I could add the telephone symbol into my sentence. So maybe I want to put it in here in between telephone and number. I can insert my cursor where I want it to go. I can go to the insert ribbon and I'm going to go all the way across to the last group on the right hand side where it says symbols and I'm going to click on symbol. And again, it's going to give me a list of all of the ones that I've used recently, but I'm going to go to uh, more symbols and I'm going to select the telephone icon just here or the telephone symbol, which is under the Wingdings font and click on insert and close. And you can see that I've now utilized those symbols, not only in my bullets, but also just within a line of text. So that's something else cool that you can do with symbols in your documents. And it's worth remembering that with these symbols, they are treated as fonts. So you can do things such as change the color of them just by highlighting and utilizing your font options. So I can change it to red just by changing the font color because they are essentially fonts, not pictures, they're symbols. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how you can apply basic bullets and also some more advanced bullets using symbols and pictures that you have saved off into your documents. In the next module, we're going to take a look at how you can create an outline from scratch. So please join me for that. Hello again, this is Deb and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. 
In the previous module, we were taking a look at bulleted lists and also numbered lists as well. And I'd like to finish up this section by just talking a little bit about creating an outline. Now I'm starting with my numbered list again, and I'm going to click my mouse after the first name and hit the enter key. Now, as we've seen before, when we do that, it will just continue the numbering on. But what about if I want to make this a second level number? Well, very simply, I can press the tab key on my keyboard and that will give me a second level of numbering. So it's very important for you to know these terms. So using your tab key will demote a level and using shift tab will promote. OK, so as I've done shift tab, it's taken it back to that first level numbering tab we'll put it down to second level numbering. So I'm now going to type something about Deborah. I'm going to say she was voted the top employee in 2017. And when I hit enter, you'll see that it continues on with that level of numbering. So I could then type in voted the top employee in 2018 and hit enter. Now, if I wanted to come out of there again, I could just do shift tab and that will take me back to there. Alternatively, I could backspace if I wanted to remove it altogether. So now I'm going to jump back across to our Smith flyer and we can take a look at how we can apply outline level numbering to paragraphs. So from the view tab, I'm going to click on switch windows and go back to my Smith flyer. And I'm going to highlight all the way down from who we are to we're growing. So let's make that selection. And this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my home ribbon and I'm going to go to this button just here, the multi level list. So let's click the drop down and see what we have in there. I have a few different choices that I could make. So again, it really depends on how you want your outline level numbering to look. Now I want mine to look like this. So I want my first level to have a number one, my second level, a small a, my third level, Roman numerals, so on and so forth. So let's select that one. So let's take a look at what it's done here. So you can see it's got number one at the top here, then two, number three, and it follows through. But what it hasn't done is recognize that this should be on the second level. So all I need to do is click in front of where it says the brokers and associates and hit the tab key to demote that to the second level. And you can then see everything then follows through. And I could do the same for these ones down here. So hit tab, 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 and I could carry on going through to get that looking exactly how I want. So quite simple to create an outline. And if I wanted to, I could create a third level as well. So if we go down here to buying a home and click in front of uh, visit open houses, if I press my tab key again, that's going to make that a third level like so. OK, so you can go through and you can make those little minor adjustments as well. Now, what if I wanted to change the whole of the outline again? Well, let's make our selection once more go up to our outline level numbering and I could go to define new multi-level list. And what this will allow me to do is really get granular and really customize how my multi-level list looks. So you can see here I have nine levels and you can see those listed out there. So the first level is going to be a number one. We then have A, I and then so on and so forth. And I can go in and I can select a level and I can make some really granular changes to the formatting. So if I wanted to, for my level ones, I could change the font by going into here, making it something completely different by making my selections. I could even change the color if I wanted to. And that's how it will look. I can go to level two and I could change the number star for this level if I wanted to and change it to Roman numerals instead. I could change the number alignment, the text indent, loads of different ways that I can format how my multi-level list looks. So it's definitely worth going in there and really customizing so you can just very quickly apply your newly customized multi-level numbering to your document. So just know that you can go into here and define that new multi-level list. 
I'm going to click cancel because I'm fairly happy with how mine looks. So that's the way you can define your outline numbering for an entire document. So if you already have a document sort of laid out, you can go in there, highlight it all, select your multi-level list and then promote and demote as necessary, or even get a bit granular and change each level of your list. That pretty much finishes up this section. In the next module, we're going to do a practice exercise. So I will see you over there. Hello everyone and welcome back again to our course on Word 2019. We're now down at the section three practice exercise where we're going to practice the skills we've learned in relation to character formatting in Word. So the first thing I'd like you to do for me is to create a new blank document. I'd then like you to just make a list of 10 things that you want to accomplish this week and I want you to number the list. Then under each level one item, I'd like you to add a second level item, which talks a little bit about the first level. Then in the autocorrect options, I want you to add an entry to the list so that you can type your initials into any document and it will produce your name. I'd then like you to close the file and you don't need to save. What I would then like you to do is to open the file called Practice Presentation 3. I'd like you to have a little bit of a, a practice just selecting text and you can refer to the attached document, Selection Techniques, if you need a refresher. Then, using Cut and Paste, switch this text in the first paragraph and you can see the text listed below. And I'd like you to switch that text in the dark blue box with the text in the last paragraph. I'd then like you to replace Heather Lapierre at the bottom of the document with your name. And I want you to use your initials that you set up in the autocorrect options. Finally, I'd like you to save and close this file and name the file My Practice Presentation 3. Wow, quite a lot to get to in that practice exercise. I hope you survived. You're doing a great job. I will see you in the next section. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. We're all the way down to alignment options. Now, in the previous module, we were looking at uh, character options, so how you can change the formatting of certain characters. And now we're going to move on to taking a look at formatting entire paragraphs. So the first thing that you'll notice is that we're back in our flyer here, our Smith flyer. And you'll also notice that there's currently no formatting applied to this document. So everything is left aligned. Now, one thing you will notice with left aligned documents or the text within left aligned documents is that the text will actually wrap around. So you'll never get a broken word at the end of the line. It will just put it straight down onto the next line. You also won't see anything like hyphenations in there as well. So just be aware of that. Now, the most obvious piece of formatting that we might want to do here would be to take this title and center it on the page. So I'm going to select my title by hovering my mouse over in that margin and just clicking once. And then I'm going to jump up to my paragraph group on the home ribbon. And you'll see that you have your alignment options just here. So currently we have left align applied. We also have center and right align. There's also another one here called justify. Now what that will do is it will center everything evenly on the page. So it will make sure that the margins on the left and the margins on the right, the text goes up to the end of each of them. So you kind of see this in newspaper print as well. So if that means that Word has to space out a word a little bit more, then it will do that in order to make your text aligned on both edges. So that's what justify is. So just be aware of that. So I'm going to actually center this title. So I'm going to click on the center align button and you can see there, there's also a keyboard shortcut of control E. And there we go, centered in the middle of the page. And of course, if I wanted to just realign that back to the left, I can choose the left align button. I'm actually just going to pop that back in the center. So let's have a look at what happens if we write a line. So for this, I'm going to select all of the text in the document. So I'm going to do the control A, 
shortcut to select everything. And then we're going to click right align. And you can now see that everything is lined up on the right hand side, but not on the left. Let's select all of our text again. So control A. And let's take a look at that justify that I was just talking about earlier. So if I click justify, you can see now if you look at these sentences, particularly these first two paragraphs where the, the text wraps around, they're aligned both on the right hand side and also on the left hand side. So words gone and put in some extra spacing just to get that to work out correctly. So that's what justify does. So with regards to aligning paragraphs, that's really all you need to know. There's just those four buttons in that paragraph group on the home ribbon. Let's now move on to taking a look at how line spacing works. So I will see you in the next module. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. We're now down to module 4.2 on line spacing. Now, when we talk about line spacing, it's fairly obvious we mean the amount of space that we have between each line of text. And if I give you a quick example here, so I just have a blank document. I'm just going to type in the word draft and hit enter. Now you'll see that when I hit enter, the cursor doesn't appear directly under the word draft. It appears a little way down. So there is a small gap in there. And that was developed mainly because a lot of the time people didn't want to type directly under the text above. If you imagine a title, you normally want a little bit of space in there. So what you'll find, the default in Word nowadays is to have a little bit of a gap in there. And of course, you can adjust it, which is what we're going to look at in this module. Now, how can you tell what line spacing you currently have applied? Well, if you jump up to that paragraph group again, you'll see that there is a button right in the middle there called line and paragraph spacing. And there's a drop down arrow. So let's click it and see what we have in there. And you can see here currently, it's not showing me any line spacing. Now, if I click next to draft where we have that and go back to the same button, click the drop down and you can see that I have my line spacing here set to 1.15. And I can tell that because it's got the tick next to it. So I could change it to whatever I wanted to if I wasn't particularly happy with that amount of line spacing. You can also see at the bottom, because we have this option here, remove space after paragraph, that's also another indicator that there is some line spacing in there. Now, let me illustrate this a little bit better by using our Smith Flyer document. So I'm going to jump back to it using switch windows. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start by highlighting the entire document. So control A again. I'm going to go up to my paragraphs and I can choose any of these. And as I hover over them, you'll see how that line spacing changes. So it gets wider as we go down. Now, in general, 1.15 is a little bit easier for people to read than something like one, which is a bit too close together. So if this is quite a long document and people are going to be reading it, then 1.15 is actually a really nice line spacing. But you could increase that if you wanted to. It's entirely up to you. Now, I had my whole document selected there, which is why everything is changing. But if I was just interested in changing the line spacing on a specific paragraph, Again, just make the correct selection before you go in and change that line spacing. Now, one more thing I want to show you in here, and I'm just going to click my mouse at the end of the title. I'm going to go back up into that line spacing drop down, and this time we're going to go to line spacing options. And you'll see I get this little dialog box pop up. And the third little group here is the spacing group. And this is where you can really get quite granular as to how much space you actually want before or after the text. So currently mine's set to zero. My line spacing is set to multiple. And you can see there is that 1.15 that I set it to. But I could go in and change it to single line spacing. I could change it to 1.5 lines. And you can see in the preview at the bottom what that's going to look like. So double line spacing is a bit wider. I could say at least and then I can adjust how much space I want in there. So you really can set this to however you want it to look. Now, one handy little button in here, if you've come into here and you've set up all your settings, set your spacing, how you want it to be for all of your documents, you can choose to set it as a default. And it will then ask you if you just want to set it as the default spacing for this document only 
are all documents based on the normal .dotm template. So that's entirely up to you. I'm just going to cancel out to there. So just remember that if you do set it for all documents, every time you create a new document, you'll get whatever line spacing you've set in this area below. So that's really all there is to line spacing. So it's definitely worth having a little play around with. And as I said, again, if you want to use the same line spacing in every single document, come into here, set it, and then set it as default. In the next module, we're going to talk a little bit about working with indent. So I'll see you over there. Hi everyone and welcome back to Word 2019. This is Deb and I'm back with you to talk about working with indents in your document. Now in the previous modules we've been talking a lot about options for formatting paragraphs and it might be that when you have a document such as this one that you might want to indent the left side of a paragraph. Now you could use the tab key for things like this, but it will only indent the first line. What I'm talking about is indenting the entire paragraph. And for that, we can use these little indent markers that we have up here on the ruler. So now that I've tabbed that first line, if you look at this little indent marker just here, you can see it's moved it along half an inch. Now, maybe I don't want it to be half an inch, or maybe I want to indent the whole paragraph. How might I do that? Because I can't use the tab key to do that. Well, I can utilize these little buttons or icons, whatever you want to call them, on the ruler at the top here, and work with those to set my paragraphs or my indent spacing just as I want it to be set. Let me just backspace out of there. So let's take a look at what these little buttons do. Now, if you hover over them, and I'm going to hover over this top one here, the downward facing triangle, you'll see that it says first line indent. And what that means is that this little button controls just the first line of your paragraph. Now, in fact, a step that I've just forgotten to do is I'm going to highlight the paragraphs that I want this to affect first of all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight this first paragraph just here. I'm going to go up to my ruler, I'm going to grab my first line indent, and I'm going to click, and I'm going to drag it. I'm going to drag it to three quarters of an inch and let go. And you can see because it's the first line indent, it's only moved that first line. So it works similar to the tab that we did before, but this time I'm able to define how large that indent is. Remember, tab will automatically only allow you to tab half an inch. So I'm just going to undo that by clicking my undo button. And let's now look at the one below that on the ruler. So we've looked at the first line indent. The one below the little uh, upwards pointing triangle is a hanging indent. So let's drag that across and see what that does. As you can see, it moves basically everything except that first line. So it's almost like a reverse of the first line indent. Now, can you think of any examples of a hanging indent? How about numbers? We looked at numbers in a previous module. And let me just show you what I mean by that. I'm just going to switch to a blank document. If you remember in one of the previous modules, we had a list of four or so names. So let me just type those in again. So there was Adam. There was Deborah, there was Mish, and we'll say Rob. And I'm going to apply some numbering to these names. So I'm going to go to my home ribbon, and I'm going to select just the basic numbering. Now look at my ruler. You can see what it's done here. The first line indent has moved out, and so has the hanging indent as well. So again, I could use these to adjust the way my numbered list is displayed. So maybe I've decided that these four names are a bit too close to the numbers. I could grab the hangy indent and I could drag it out and move those further away. The same thing for the numbers. Those are set to the first line indent. I could drag that and I could drag them in or out to adjust those. OK, so that's an example of indents in use in your document. And Word does that automatically when you apply numbering. Let's switch back to our flyer that we're working on. 
Now, the other thing that we have here is this little box on the bottom. So where we have that upward pointing triangle or the hanging indent, underneath there's something called a left indent. And it's the little square or rectangle, whatever that is. And if I drag that, it's going to drag the whole lot. So if I just undo a couple of times so you can see this a little bit better and just grab the left indent, it moves the entire paragraph across. OK, now you also have a corresponding one of those on the right hand side of the document as well. So I have a right indent. So again, I can grab it and I can drag in. And remember, these changes are only affecting the paragraph that you have selected. So if you wanted to do it for the entire document, you just press Control A and then drag your indents in and out. So that's a very quick overview of how to use those indents on your ruler. The next thing I want to talk to you about is working with tabs. So I'll see you in the next module. Hi everyone and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. We're now down in section four and we're going to start talking a little bit more about the use of tabs in your documents. And this is a really good feature in Microsoft Word. And what a tab actually is, it means that when you hit the tab key, it will essentially allow you to override the default tab spacing of half an inch. As we've seen previously, if I just click my mouse on the top of this document, if I press my tab key, it's going to tab me across half an inch each time. So with tabs, you can set them to whatever distance you want. And you can also change the kind of tab that you're using in your document as well. So if you just look at this example that I have here, I just have a blank document open and I have a little what looks like a table. All of my information is nicely in columns and everything looks nice and lined up. Now, you might think that this is, in fact, a table. It's actually not. I created this purely using tabs. And if you turn on your show hide paragraph markers, which we looked at in a previous module, you can see all of the tabs in there. So wherever we have a little arrow, that's where we have tabs. Now I'm going to turn that back off and let's start looking at how you can set tabs in a document. Now you might be wondering, where are my tabs? Well, they're actually quite hard to see if you don't know where they are. If you look up at the ruler and cast your eyes off to the left hand side, you'll see this very small little sort of back to front L just here. It's just below the quick access toolbar. And if you hover your out mouse over, you'll see it says right tab. If I click on it, it moves to the next tab, which is a decimal tab. So let me explain what these are. The first two are left and right tabs, so they will allow you to align your text to the left or to the right. The decimal tab allows you to line up via the decimal point. So if you have numbers in a document, you can set that tab so that all of those decimal points are in line. You then have a bar tab, which you will sometimes see used in CVs or resumes. So if you've ever seen a resume that has kind of a line running down the middle and there's information on both sides, that's normally created using a bar tab. And we then have indents again. So our first line indent, that's exactly the same as the one which we were looking at on the ruler. And if I click once more, we have our hanging indent as well. And then if I click again, we're back to left tab. So they essentially cycle round. So you can just click on them to move through and then pick the tab that you want to use in your document. So let me just show you very briefly how these work. So with my left tab selected, I'm going to go over to the ruler and I'm just going to click where I want to drop that tab. So let's say I want to drop it at one and a half inches. I'm going to click and there you can see that little L. So now when I press my tab key, it's going to jump me straight across directly underneath where I've set that tab and I can then type my text. Same thing if I go to the next line by hitting enter, press tab, and I'll be directly underneath the line above. So nice and simple. Now, if you want to remove a tab, it's a simple case of just dragging it off of the ruler. So I'm going to click. I'm just going to drag it off the ruler and I'm going to delete out this text that I've already put in here. 
So let's now cycle through some of the other tabs and explore what they do. So I'm going to go back to my little tab indicator. I'm going to click once and I've now changed it to a decimal tab. So now I have that selected, I'm going to go onto my ruler. I'm just going to drop this at one and a half inches as well by clicking on the ruler. I'm going to tab across and I'm going to type a number this time that has a decimal point. And you'll see that the decimal point is directly underneath where we have that decimal tab. So everything's going to line up if it's got a decimal point in it. So if I was to do uh, 65.978, you can see whilst these numbers aren't in line, those decimal points are. Let's delete that out and get rid of our tab by dragging it off the ruler. Let's go back and cycle to the next one, which is the bar tab. Now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to put that bar tab at two and a half inches like so. And you can see it gives me a little line in there so I can type some text. I can press tab and I can go the other side. As I said, you might see this in things like resumes where you have your personal details on one side and then maybe your education, previous employment on the other. So a bar tab is useful for that kind of thing. Let's delete out and cycle to our next tab. Now these two, we've already looked at these. These are the indents and we looked at those in the previous module. So I'm going to skip over those indents for the time being. And this time we're going to cycle to the center tab. So again, let's just put this at 2.5. Click on the ruler. I'm going to type my name again. And you can see that it's perfectly centered underneath that tab. Let's drag that tab off and delete. And the final one that we're going to look at is the right align tab. Now with this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this all the way at the end of the ruler. So sort of by where we've got number six on the ruler and click. And now when I press tab, you'll see my cursor jumps all the way over to that right hand side. And as I start typing, my characters print to the left so that everything is lined up nicely on the right hand side. So those are the different tabs that you can use in your document and which ones you use really depend on what you're trying to line up. Now again, let me just delete that out and just drag that tab off the ruler. So in this table that I already have created, if I click within it, you can see the tabs that I have set up for these columns down here. So if you look at the ruler, you can see that I have a left tab set up there and all of the addresses are aligned to the left. For the amount column, I have a decimal tab set up. So everything is in line with the decimal points. And then finally, in the last column here, I have a right tab set up. So everything's in line on the right hand side. So that's how I've constructed this little table down here or this columns of information. So now what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to recreate this little table that we have below in the top half of this document. So I'm going to set up my tabs first of all. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the left tab. So I'm going to cycle through and I'm going to drop that tab roughly there. I'm then going to pick up my decimal tab and I'm going to drop that just about there. And then finally, I'm going to pick up my right tab. And I'm going to drop that right at the end of the document. So I have my tab set up on my ruler. Now I'm just going to recreate the information that we have below. So I'm going to type in name. I'm going to press my tab key and it moves across to that first tab. Press my tab key again. I'm going to hit enter and then I'm going to type in Adam Lacey 123 Elm Street and we're going to say $25 Oops. and telephone 555-8967 
and hit enter. And I'm just going to do a few of these. So we've got four, five, six Oak Lane. We have 1450 tab and then the phone number 645-9867. Let's just do two. So hopefully you can see from that how I created that table below. And of course, if you're not happy where the tabs currently are or the way the document's looking, you can just drag and drop these tabs to move them either left or right. Now, the final thing I want to discuss here is something called tab leaders. And that may not be a term that you've ever heard of before, but if you think of it in this way, if you've ever looked at a table of contents in a book or in a document or a manual, quite often you'll have the page number and then you'll have dot, 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 and then maybe the, um, the title of the chapter or the title of the topic or something like that. And that's basically what a tab leader is, those dots. I'm going to show you how you can add those on when you set up your tabs. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight all of the text where I want tab leaders. So I'm going to leave out the column headings. And there are a couple of different ways you can get to tabs. You can either double click on any tab stop that you have on the ruler. So I could double click here and it will take me into my tab box. Or if I just click cancel there in the paragraph group, if you click this little drop down arrow, you have a tabs button at the bottom of this box and that will take you to exactly the same place. Now what you'll see in here are all the tabs that you currently have set up for the selected area. So you can see here I have tabs at 2 inches, 4.25 and 6.13. And currently I don't have any leader set. So you can see at the bottom here we have leader and currently it's set to none. So I'm going to set a leader. Now what you need to do is you need to select your first tab stop. So mine is the one at 2 inches. And I can choose a style of leader. So I can have dots, I can have dashes, or I can have a solid horizontal line. Now I'm going to use dots. So I'm going to click on number two. And you have to click on set. Very important and very easy to forget. <laughs> Let's click on set. And you have to do the same thing for each of the tabs that you have. So I'm going to go to 4.25. I'm going to select the dots and click set. And then finally 6.13 and set and click on OK. And there you go. You'll see I get my leaders in between my columns. So that's lovely if you're doing something like a table of contents. It just adds a really professional edge. So hopefully that's given you more of an idea as to how you can set up different types of tab stops on your ruler and also how you can add those leaders in there as well. We've made it all the way to the end of section four now. So all that's left for you to do is a quick practice exercise before we move on to managing and sorting lists in section five. So I will see you over there. Hello everyone and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. We're now down to section four practice exercise. And this is where I want you to practice some of the skills that we've learnt in relation to paragraph formatting. So the first thing I'd like you to do for me is to open the file called Module Practice 4. I'd then like you to go in and change the line spacing for the entire document to 1.0 and no space after the Enter key. I'd then like you to center the title on the page and then indent the first paragraph at 0.75 inches on the left and 5.25 inches on the right. I'd then like you to place a right align tab at six inches and move the date over to that tab. Once you've done all that, you can save and close the file. Great job, everyone. It looks like you are ready for the next section. So I will see you over there. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our course on Word 2019. We're now down into section five, where we're going to start talking about how you can sort lists in Word. And the functionality here is very similar to Excel, if you've used the sorting options in Excel previously. And what I mean by that is that you have the ability to take a list 
and sort it and format it in the way that you like. So what I've done first is I've created a new blank document and I've just typed in a list of names and these names are in no particular order. But what if I want to take my list of names and I want to sort them by last name? Well, the first thing you need to do here is you need to make sure it's properly set up and formatted before you do your sort. And what I mean by that is that you need to tell Word how these names are separated. So if I turn on my show hide markers, you can see here that I have a dot in between each, which means that I have a space in there. So essentially my words are separated by a space. So I need to tell Word that it's looking for a space character. It might be in some scenarios that you have a tab in there or maybe something else, and that's perfectly fine. You'll see when we go into the options, you do get a choice of how your words are separated. But for me, it's going to be a space character. So let me just turn off those non-printing characters. And it's also worth noting that this list could be a bulleted list as well, or it could be a numbers list. You can still sort it, even if you have bullets or numbering applied. Now the first step here is we need to select our list. So I'm just going to drag my mouse to highlight. And then we're gonna go up to the home ribbon and look in that paragraph group again. And you'll see here we have a sort button. It's that little A to Z with the downward facing arrow. And I'm gonna click it. And this takes me to my sort text options. And you'll see that I have three things that I can sort by. So it really depends what you're doing with your sort. Now, the first thing I need to do, as I said before, is I need to tell Word that my names, the first name and last name, are separated by a space character. So I'm going to jump straight into this options button at the bottom. And you can see here it says separate fields at and then tabs is always highlighted by default. If you don't have tabs, which I don't, you can select other and just remove whatever's in that box by pressing the delete key and replace it with whatever is separating your fields or your name. So in my case, it's a space. So I'm just gonna do a space like so. And click on OK. I can then perform my sort. So up in this first box here, it says sort by. Currently it says paragraphs. We've got headings as well, but then I have word one or word two. Now, in this case, I want to sort by the last name, which is gonna be word Two. I then get to stipulate the type of text, so I could have text or it might be a number that I'm sorting or maybe even a date, but I'm going to keep this on text. And I can choose how I want to sort either ascending or descending order, and I'm going to say ascending. Now, you might be wondering why we have two more boxes down here. This would be if you then wanted to do another sort after the first sort has been performed. So imagine in this example, I don't have it, but if I did have maybe two people with the same last name, I might want to say, okay, once you've sorted by last name, I then want you to sort by first name so that I get that in the true order. Now, in this case, I don't have any duplicate names, so I'm just happy to keep it as it is, and I'm gonna click on OK. And there we go, it's sorted my list into alphabetical order ascending. So quite nice and easy. Just remember to tell Word how your names are separated before you do the sort. Let me just show you another quick example of this. I'm just gonna jump across to another document that I have open, which is Smith Flyer Edit. Now, at the bottom of this document, what I've done is I've just grabbed all of the headings and I've just put them in a list here and maybe I want to sort these headings. So again, I'm going to highlight them. I'm gonna go up to my sort button and again, straight away, I'm going to tell Word how my words are separated. And again, they're separated by a space. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna do space, click on okay. And this time when I click the drop down, I can sort by word one, word two, or word three. So I'm going to sort by word one. It's text, so that's fine. And I want to do it in ascending order. And I'm going to select OK. And there you go. It's reordered my list for me. So quite simple to perform a sort on lists of names or lists of headings or anything along those lines. So there we go. Fairly straightforward to perform a sort in a list. 
So that's it on sorting. Not quite as many options in Word as there are in something like Excel, but you do still have that basic functionality there. If you're not a subscriber, click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. To get the course exercise files and follow along with this video, click over there. And click over there to watch more videos on YouTube from Simon Says It.